very important uh, bank in this city. And um, the uh, regional government and the um, local government have uh, merged together in order to transform this place into, some, into somewhere where science and technology are going to be advanced. And that's one of the, this is one of the, this is the first time I've been in here since uh, that started. And it's quite a pleasure that it is for things that I am interested in. Um, and you all know that we're here on an international workshop on quantum computation in superconducting circuits. Um, this is organized by the University of the Basque Country. It's part of the Open SuperQ uh, process. And it's also sponsored by the uh, regional and uh, local uh, governments and the university, as I said. Uh, the first speaker is, as you all know, uh, Frank Wilhelm, Frank Wilhelm Mao. <laughs> I have to get it right. And I really cannot say the full length of his career because he has been hopping countries, he has been hopping, hopping uh, Lenda, um, uh, but um, he, he, he has been working on superconducting stuff. Uh, even with very basic things like uh, proper boundary conditions for Green's functions, <laughs> and has been in Waterloo, has been since the inception of quantum computing, and is, I think, uh, one of the first, of the best people to give a talk in, in this topic. So without much uh, further ado, Frank. Great, thank you. Uh, so thanks for coming in this morning, thanks for having me. It's a good change to, instead of projects and what we could and will and can do, talk about science for a change. And um, once I've realized that our friendly organizers gave me a whole hour, but I will make sure that this whole hour will include plenty of time of discussion, I made my title slightly more general than I submitted. I'm talking about two shortcuts to NISC algorithms, and the one you have in the program is the first one, which will be about two-thirds of the talk. It has been, uh, it's one about uh, the QAOA, the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, and then I have a little bit about the simulation of the Hubbard model. Uh, it's been done, you know, with the following cast of characters that you see here. Um, some of the work is based on the PhD thesis of Pierre-Luc Dallaire de Mers, who has uh, since then moved on. The others are in or very close to uh, my group. Uh, Dima Bagretz, uh, who has been leading a lot of this, is actually in this city. He sent me an email. He's not feeling well, so he's not here right now. He's in his hotel. Uh, let's hope he can show up at uh, some point today. And this is the canteen of where I work. So um, I don't know everybody's background, but maybe the introduction is kind of boring for two-thirds of the room, but it will um, still inform, you know, the other third, and plus we should never underestimate how much people enjoy hearing something that they kind of mostly already know. Uh, so I'll try to motivate why we care about NISC algorithms, uh, what it is, what we have to look for, and then I will look at an algorithm that we have presented that is called mean field AOA. There's no Q in this. It's a classically efficient algorithm that is quantum inspired. And it turns out that um, it's actually a very good and controlled approximation to the full QAOA algorithm, uh, which means that whenever it works, uh, full QAOA is pointless. And then I talk about simulating strongly correlated electrons on a quantum computer and I'll show how um, you can rather efficiently, even on a small processor, simulate a large Hubbard lattice. So what is NISC and why do we care? Well, there is kind of a Sputnik moment of quantum computing, which was the Google Quantum Supremacy Experiment. And you know, you can discuss, would there have been a classical shortcut? Is it really quantum supremacy or is it useful? But Remember Sputnik, or, well, I don't remember this in person, but from history we know that Sputnik uh, circled the Earth and beeped. That is not an application, and probably other things could have also circled the Earth and beeped, but it still was accelerating uh, spaceflight. Um, this was based on um, having preparing large quantum states, which essentially exceed the memory of quantum computers, run something that has no shortcuts, this random algorithm, um, and verify even in the presence of a lot of noise that it's still quantum. And it's of course, it was a test, a synthetic benchmark meant to make the quantum computer look good, and this is all completely legitimate, you know. 
it's, uh, it's not the end of the story, it's a stepping stone. Uh, if we look really at hardware, the issue of building machines, you know, based on our beloved Josephson junctions put into our fancy looking cryostats. The challenge, however, is really fidelity and error rate. So uh, to get to real world applications, the uh, error rate has to go down and algorithms have to be less hungry for small errors. So we have to do, learn to live with error rate. And for example, when people took the exact same chip in 2020 and ran quantum chemistry benchmarks about it, they used 10, maybe 12 qubits, and then uh, it was all drowned by noise. And you could even argue, you know, people made chips with thousands of Josephson junctions, thousands of the main ingredients of our chips, uh, of our quantum processors in the 90s. They were just so horribly noisy that, you know, you couldn't, you, they wouldn't be quantum computers. I mean, the terminology quantum computer existed, but it even didn't make it to our community yet. So making a large ship is not the point, making it low noise. So um, I, I need to, um, the remote has an amazing range, but I need to point in the right direction. So where we are now, I would argue, is we have now reached a stage where the biggest quantum computers we know are research and development infrastructure. You know, they are a bit like a small synchrotron. Why do I say this? Well. Uh, the Google results tells us that we can now not simulate them anymore. So if there is something where we do not have a mathematical proof, and uh, where we need to try something out, going to the quantum computer is the only way. But there are still R&D tools and not uh, tools for economy, because, you know, for tools that disrupt the economy and computing, we would need a million clean qubits. So the goal in the NISC era is to make quantum computers better and larger, and to make applications less greedy. And you know, I am also speaking, you know, on the bottom right, you see the logo of my employer. Um, the Forschungszentrum's main mission is actually to provide research and development infrastructure and to develop it. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is why this all uh, makes a bit of sense. And of course, the way, one way to do NISC is to use variational algorithms. So this is a picture, actually, why I'm using these specific symbols on the right. It will actually be clear at the end of the talk, but in variation algorithms, the idea is that we write down a quantum algorithm that is parameterized. So we have the gates, so here are usual quantum algorithm picture, um, time runs from left to right, and gates that depend on some parameter. In QAOA, we have kind of one parameter per layer, and we uh, run the circuit, we measure something, and then we use a classical optimizer uh, to uh, find better parameters. One example for this is the QAOA algorithm, which I'll explain a bit more uh, in a minute. But the idea is that this is relatively shallow, so there's only very few layers. And then while the classical computer is running, we are resetting the quantum computer, and resetting is the operation with the lowest error in a quantum computer. Letting the system go to a thermal equilibrium, we can do pretty reliably or measure and feed forward, um, because we go into classical states, we're going to the states where decoherence is ending. So resetting we can do best, and this means that we, by this off, uh, frequent restarts, we uh, get, um, um, uh, uh, this is a good route to become more NISC friendly. So now let's look at optimization on quantum computers at QAOA. So combinatorical optimization um, is actually very ubiquitous in classic computer science. Uh, there are NP-hard problems, so those are the hardest reasonable problems for classical computer. Uh, NP, most of you will know this, is the class of problems whose solution can be efficiently tested, and NP-hard means that they are as hard as the hardest problems in that class. And if this can be solved efficiently or not, it's actually one of the holy grails of computer science. And uh, in many cases, we can put them um, with binary variables, with spin-like variables, into the problem of finding the ground state of an icing model. So here is at the right, there's a graph theoretical problem where each of the circles corresponds to a spin. The green and blue corresponds to different values of the local field hj. And the interactions are, uh, the jijs are at the connections of the graphs. Um, and there's actually kind of a whole tutorial paper that's now almost 10 years old that tells you how to put many of these problems, such as the number partitioning problem, neural networks, and things like this on problems like this. So number partitioning, for example, means you have a list of numbers, and you want to put them into two bins, and the sums should be as close to each other as possible. 
And that sounds completely artificial, but if you, for example, need to distribute the load of certain computations over two processor cores, this problem is very real. If you know how long they take and you want to make sure that um, the slower processor is a, you know, the, the, the processor that takes longer takes the shortest time possible. That's an example where this can actually be used. So how do we solve those on quantum computers? Well, the way that has been pioneered first is by quantum annealing. Um, there you can go, you know, up to 5,000 qubits. They are not very coherent in the sense of temporal coherence. So instead of running something over a long time, you're running something over a long distance in Hilbert space. What do I mean by this um, is that you have your problem Hamiltonian, so that is the Hamiltonian here, whose ground state you want to find, and you have a, a dimensionless time parameter S, and you have a driver Hamiltonian that has two properties. A, it does maximally not commute with the problem Hamiltonian. It's completely off diagonal on the computational basis, and the other thing, it, all, it has a unique and easy to find ground state. Easy to find means that uh, it, it has a unique ground state, as you can see, it's all, all pluses. And um, if there is no like local minima or anything like this, local in the sense of bit flips, so our metric in which we're walking through qubits uh, is the Hamming metric, so you're doing bit flips. And uh, you are uh, running the quantum computer not by gates, but by over the dimensionless time s, which goes from zero to one, switching off the driver and, the pro uh, and on the problem Hamiltonian. And how this uh, is supposed to work is that initially you have an energy landscape on the left, uh, the, uh, the one on the left, and the end you have the one on the right. And by adiabatically going from the left on the right, the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics tells you that you're staying in the ground state if you do it slowly enough. And you need quantum physics because the notion of slowly enough is related to the inverse of the minimum energy gap between the ground and the first excited state. And it's an interesting tidbit of physics history that from going from slowly enough to extremely quantitative was actually really only formulated out when adiabatic quantum computing was invented. The original version of the adiabatic theorem by Bonn and by Fock is remarkably unquantitative. But in any case, uh, for this you need a non-commuting Hamiltonian, for this you need avoided level crossing like on the right. And one way how you can imagine getting quantum speed up is by this protection of the ground state. Or another way to look at this is that if you are in a local minimum and you need to get out, you can tunnel. Whereas classically, all you can do is to heat the distribution, which also gets you a lot of a local uh, minimum, but it also deteriorates your resolution. Whereas when you're tunneling, through a barrier, you can escape without the solution being deteriorated. But uh, there's a couple of problems for this, uh, because first of all, predicting this gap is actually NP-hard in itself. So uh, finding the right speed has to be done somewhat experimentally. Um, also, um, all the programming and the compilation here is actually done in hardware. So if you're embedding a problem, into this big qubit lattice, you're burning through qubits like there's no tomorrow. Um, if you want to have interactions that are not physically present. I've uh, shown you this chimera architecture that you have connected clusters, and then the clusters are fully connected, and between the clusters there's a weak connection. And um, programming these and occasionally missing a qubit for taking a qubit, kind of short-circuiting a qubit for embedding the problem, uh, makes, uh, you know, is the price to pay. But then on the other hand, you can make a lot of qubits because they're simpler to make. So this is kind of solving by physics, but then the alternative is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm by Fari, Goldstone, and Gutmann. Uh, and that is, by the way, the Jeff, Jeff Goldstone of the Goldstone bosons. And the idea here is as follows. We um, actually, let me go to the next slide or, uh, already, is that we trotter the adiabatic algorithm so we uh, separate it into discrete time steps of the non-commuting terms of driver and problem alternatingly. And um, this here shows you the trotter steps, this uh, equation on top. Uh, uh, the, the pointer is fairly weak, so yeah. Um, so, and all of them have a parameter how long you apply them. You start from the equal superposition state, and uh, by this you approximate quant adiabatic quantum computing and um, you 
have, the, however, the second tool that now you can also adjust those parameters by a classical search algorithm, which allows you, for example, to fish around when you don't know the gap to make these angles optimal. So it gives you an alternative to doing your anneal in the best possible way. It also, I have to switch back and forth a little bit, it allows you, for example, to embed the problem efficiently. Because now I need to make a unitary transformation that follows the problem Hamiltonian. So instead of burning qubits, I can use combination tricks like this one to just use control Z gates and then make the right thing by having, um, uh, having more gates. So there, if you want to, you know, if you want to make a 50 qubit problem, you need 50 qubits. In um, adiabatic quantum computing, you need 500 qubits, but the good news is you have 5,000. So um, this is an alternative. It's very popular in the NISC world. Um, and it was actually claimed in the original paper that for a certain version of the max cut problem, problem from graph theory, that uh, there is a real provable speed up. And then Matthew Hastings came along, came with a quantum inspired classical algorithm that has the same time efficiency. So now the question is really open what is the potential for speed up here? And um, let's reflect a little bit about boundary conditions of this question. The first boundary condition is taking the most general NP complete or NP hard combinatorical optimization problem and uh, having exponential speed up always is extremely unlikely because there's a string of corollaries related to the optimality of the Grover algorithm that you would violate. And people believe into these corollaries that they're, they're not strictly proven. This is why I'm saying extremely unlikely, not impossible. There's a lot of heuristics and empiricism. And um, you know, we actually want to get a good solution in the end with high probability. If we have a two to the 50 dimensional Hibbert space, it's really two things. We want to make sure that one value we get almost all of the time, so the final state is at least very concentrated in the best solution and in some state, and then that this very state is actually the best solution. And I will show you how we are treating this as two separate questions. Um, also, and this is particular if you look at Shaw or Grover's algorithm, there's always a step of uncomputing. There's always a step in the end where we get rid of the superposition to guarantee that we only get one or very few outputs. And you know, in, in this thing, where's the uncomputing? Somehow the algorithm has to do this, um, but we have to find out how it can do this. So um, what we say is that in many cases where QAOA works, and gives you a solution with high probability, it's also classically simulable. And uh, here's the idea, here's the sketch of the argument, and then I will give you a bit more of the real argument. So what are we doing here? Is, uh, this is kind of just looking at the algorithm again. If we look at the basis of computational states, so S runs over all binary numbers. We start with a complete superposition, the driver you know, keeps it, and then the problem Hamiltonian gives every of those states a phase factor. And then we switch on the driver, so we make the system jump between basis states. And then we have a new shuffle of basis states. We again give every basis states um, um, a, uh, a phase and so on. So really, and this is you know, how I first learned about Trotter kind of in uh, university, the spirit of thinking about this as a discretized path integral um, is quite of natural. We start, you know, we go from one of the initial states, we want to go to a final states. Now the kinetic energy makes us jump from the initial state to an intermediate state. So the kinetic energy corresponds to the driver. And then the potential energy in path integrals, which here would be the problem Hamiltonian, gives every basis state a phase and so on. Right? So this is how path integrals work. And uh, we like now to think about the QA algorithm in the uh, same terms, which means we're also mostly interested in the large depth limit. You know, if something as difficult as hard depth doesn't give you speed up, chances are low depth is probably not, e not more promising. So um, now the question is, uh, can we, and we are summing over all phase factors. So what we sometimes say in popular talks that quantum computers look at all solutions at the real time, is kind of manifest in this representation. 
And of course, you know, when we say they look at all solutions at the, rain I mean, mean, uh, at the same time, we need about five footnotes, what that means. But um, in any case, so I want to motivate that thinking about this in a style of a path integral could make sense. And that now we want to look at what path integrals are good for and what have we have in computational techniques. And the one that we have is semi-classics. So semi-classics is a way how from the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, get back the least action principle of classical mechanics. It's also the way how you go from wave optics to geometric optics. And it basically goes as follows. If we take the sum over all paths, from the last slide, um, um, you know, we sum over all paths, which here means we sum over all intermediate states, and we write this as a path integral. Uh, so we're putting a lot of oscillating functions on top of each other. And in some cases, if it oscillates really quickly, the solution where this phase factor is stationary will dominate. Everything else will interfere out. And it's the same thing in optics. We are summing over all possible phase configurations, and then in classical optics, the stationary phase solutions, the solution where the phase S is stationary comes out, and it gives us rise, for example, to the Fermat principle. Classical mechanics, we know that the action is stationary. It gives us Lagrange equations. And if we want to see is the classical limit obeyed in quantum physics, what we can do is we can work out the stationary solution, and then we can work out uh, the second derivative around it. This delta is a variational derivative, or it's a variation, and check is it small or not, or does it have any signs of instability. And that's what we do. So uh, for QAOA, I will show you with a bit more detail. The slides have a bit of repeats, because Dima sent me some last night, and I put them in a bit in a rush, um, that we do some type of real-time real time in the sense of we have time as a real parameter, not just in the sense of temperature, mean field theory. So the classical solution, the classical limit of this is that instead of taking our problem Hamiltonian, we are taking a Hamiltonian that only has single spins in it, uh, but every spin sees an effective age, an effective magnetic field, that contains the influence of all other spins. And instead of i smaller than j, here we do j unequal to i and divide it by two. So we have a self-consistent field showing the other spins to you, uh, uh, taking out in account the interaction with other spins at the problem Hamiltonian, the interaction of the problem Hamiltonian. But uh, what we are then solving is fundamentally a single spin problem. We are keeping the full state, the full block sphere for the single qubits, but everything else we throw away. And you know, in equilibrium thermodynamics, this is known to work well in high dimensional graphs with long range interaction. And there are some chances that we have similar arguments here. So practically, you know, you can say that we are making an algorithm that has now, instead of state vectors, that has classical Poisson brackets for spin type variables. And the mean field resolution corresponds to Poisson brackets. And we can, for example, take a set of parameters, beta and gamma, that simulate adiabatic quantum computing. But we could also take others. And then the Bloch vectors evolve according to this expression, which again has the product of alternating problem, VP, and driver, VD. But now these are not Hamiltonians. These are clusters of three by three matrices. And um, the dimension is now not 2 to the n, it's 3 times n. So this is not exponentially growing in Hilbert space. This is polynomially growing. And now you count the num uh, number of multiplications, goes at n squared. So this is classically efficiently simulable. And what you see is how it does the trick is it is throwing away entanglement completely but it is keeping interaction on a semi-classical mean, f or the classical mean field level. Now we're trying this for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. Um, There's a spin glass model that has been very well studied that gives us an excellent reference point. Uh, we are taking uh, identically distributed independent Gaussian couplings of size one over n to keep it all kind of properly dimensionless. It doesn't have local bias. And uh, Nobel laureate Giorgio Parisi got his Nobel Prize, uh, among other things, for deriving that in the limit of large systems, the mean energy averaged over J configurations goes to this universal Parisi constant of minus uh, uh, 0 0.763166. 
And what is interesting is that um, if uh, QAOA does uh, need extremely high depth and doesn't actually really reach uh, the Parisi value, rather you can show that it ends up at minus 2 over pi, which is larger than the Parisi value. So how does our method do? Well, it does get to the Parisi value. Um, it, um, we, I mean, we have to go to a large depth, but, you know, we can. Uh, it does go to the Parisi value, and if you are comparing it to the best known classical algorithm, uh, the approach to the Parisi value goes with an exponent here. Uh, so this is the distance to the Parisi value averaged over everything at finite size. It should go to zero. In the best classical algorithm, the exponent here is uh, minus two-thirds we get minus 0 0.61. So without doing anything, we see how that QAOA actually has a good idea, because without big optimization, we get very close to the classically best algorithm. If we look at the fluctuations relative to the mean value, they have a characteristic distribution called the Gumbel distribution. You can work it out exactly for small instances. And mean field AOA has kind of a few gaps here but it also reproduces this distribution fairly well. So it's actually quite an effective algorithm. Another thing we can look at is the tail distribution. So how many data points are, you know, we see that most data points are very close to the mean. There's a big peak here. And then how many data points are away from the peak. And uh, we, can, uh, we can verify that uh, with this probability, which is dropping exponentially, we are also really concentrated at this peak, so we are even pretty good in dealing with outliers of spin glass systems. So that means that mean field AOA on the Sherrington Kirkpatrick with spin glass model works really well. So are there, what are the chances that it doesn't work well? Because that basically tells us that a lot of instances are easy for mean field and um, can we identify cases where it's not easy for mean field? Well, we can do paper. This should be a gamma. That was a font transition problem. So if we essentially uh, look at the structure of the states here as a function of the size of the driver Hamiltonian, uh, we see from the Hopfield model, which is close enough for our purposes, that initially we have an ergodic phase. The system spans the whole phase space. Nothing gets stuck. This is when you don't have a problem Hamiltonian, when you only have tunneling. But then as you get lower, there are various, um, there can be various uh, cases of different sizes of small energy gaps that correspond here, for example, to ruling out the outliers and that are going on into a many-body localized phase where transitions between many-body states are hard and where you now the goal is to find a low energy many-body states. And this is all based on the energy gap. Now, the question we can ask is, do we get similar indicators in our method? Um, and we do, but it's a different quantity. And one of the things we are working on is to find out whether it really means the same thing. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we identify that the mean field AOA is actually, um, I want to go back one. Let's see. Yes, is actually, now we can again play out path integrals. If we write out a path integral for a spin system, it looks like this. It has a Berry term, it has a Hamiltonian term. And if we do the mean field, if we do the stationary phase uh, trajectory, um, you know, bit of a style of an instanton, uh, we get mean field AOA. And now we can investigate the Gaussian fluctuations around it. We can, ex we can assume that the noise is small, see how far it takes us away, and if, it, if the landscape of the noises around this is steep, mean field will be good. If it's flat, we cannot keep the noise small, then a the mean field breaks down, okay? And um, that can be done. Um, we can look at transition amplitudes. It turns out what you need to solve um, is, uh, well, essentially, you first of all, you have spins, but you want to flatten them out. Uh, you use some stereographic projection. Uh, this is all great fun, also, in a number of the methods. You can kind of, uh, <laughs> you can kind of invest in one paper, right? Um, but you essentially realize that the correction to the mean field is given by this quadratic action. And if you want to do a quadratic action, we need to diagonalize the term in the middle. And this looks like a scattering problem of the Dirac equation. And it's n by n. It's still 
polynomial in N, and we can solve it, and the transform matrix, the scattering matrix, gets us Lyapunov exponents. So exponents that tell us, do the fluctuations escape exponentially, or are they contained exponentially? And um, if we work them out, so this is another way of looking at this. Uh, if you're not so familiar with path integrals, the idea is, you know, your stationary reaction path is your path here. And if everything is fluctuating wildly, um, it's, it's uh, bouncing you randomly uh, back and forth and you're ending on a stationary path. If uh, the landscape around you is flat, um, then you can easily stray away. So uh, again, we solve this uh, eigenmode problem of the Dirac type equations. These fluctuations for the friends of magnetism, they are paramagnons. So they are magnons because they are fluctuating around a, around a, a solution. And they are para because the solution is paramagnetic. It's not ferromagnetic. It's not ordered. It's a solution of a random spin glass. So this is why they are paramagnons. Um, and what we see nicely is that the, at situations when we get a small gap, for example, a hard instance on the right where the lowest energy level really dives down um, very close to where we get a tiny gap where adiabatic quantum computing should fail because the gap gets so small that you need to get uh, very small. In our case, the Lyapunov exponent explodes. It goes uh, uh, very close to one. So we expect that our solution is unstable. And so we get a type of ergodic to a many body localized transition. We get multiple peaks. We have to make the map one to one, but what we clearly see is that uh, hardness compared to the much more difficult solution of finding the energy levels versus hardness in our easy method is, seems to be the same kind of hardness. So um, we have now an efficient tool to actually study whether mean f we to do mean field AOA and to study whether it should work. And only if we find out that it shouldn't work, it's actually worth to go to QAOA. So these are the main results of this part. Um, um, the algorithm that we have uh, shown, we've also checked this on the number partitioning problem. It's polynomial time algorithm. We can apply to any easing type problem. We can use this uh, spin path integral technique. We can judge whether it's good. We can do this efficiently. And what we are kind of proud of is that when we think about quantum algorithms, about when they're easy to simulate classically, we think about, for example, are they Clifford circuits or how close are they to Clifford circuits? This is a hardness result that has nothing to do with Clifford. This is a physics motivated hardness result. So given that I was afforded a whole hour, let me show you a shorter chapter on something else, namely strongly correlated electrons. So we all know and we like to show flashy pictures to our sponsors that quantum computing could be an excellent tool to study many body systems. And what you see here in the molecule may not strike you as a fancy many body systems, but the Fe2S2 complex um, is strongly correlated. Density functional theory does not work. Um, it breaks the memory barrier of the world's largest supercomputers. And it's extremely important to understand photosynthesis. So when we want to talk to our sponsors, we're telling them, oh, if we can simulate this, we can hopefully make fertilizer with low energy because plants can do it at low energy, whereas we need energy consuming reactors like the one on the right, okay? So um, that's uh, quantum computer chemistry. It's a field that is so well studied that we feel as a research group at, uh, at a resource center, we cannot really contribute to this. You know, there's companies and um, uh, all the detail works for quantum computer chemistry, they can do well. But uh, it's interesting to see what you study. You do a variational algorithm that actually does not contain the problem Hamiltonian. You prepare a state, you measure the energy eigenvalues, and then, for example, for binding problem, you have a curve like on the right. This is for lithium hydride. And this is the energy for different separations and the energy is negative, so this thing will be stable. And uh, the minimum gives you the bond length. Now, I'm showing this to you because if we now go to the Hubbard model, I want to argue that we have to really reformulate the problem. And, you know, most, half of the room knows that, of course. Because, A, the absolute energy in the Hubbard model is a useless quantity. 
You know, if I know the absolute energy of the ground state, what does it tell me? I want to know, does it superconduct? I don't to know, want to know, does it get antiferromagnetic? I want to know, by generalizations of the Hubbard model, which, how does the superconducting state look like? Um, so I want to derive observables. Also, um, putting the whole Hubbard model onto the quantum computer doesn't make any sense because, um, oh, this is actually motivating this. Uh, this is, is, this is the uh, uh, phase diagram of the Hubbard model. Um, it, for example, describes uh, uh, high temperature superconductors. But we don't, yeah, the ground state energy is useless. As I said, we want to know does it superconduct. We also want to study large lattices of a size of the order of the Avogadro number. And even though the encoding of uh, um, a quantum state in qubits is way more efficient than in classical bits, uh, Still, if we need an Avogadro number of qubits, we are screwed. But Phil Anderson told us that more is different, and that we should really not study a solid as if it was a large molecule. We need to ask the question differently. And what we want, and this is a bit of old work, but in the end you will see a new innovation, we want to rather compute the Green's function. It's a very pragmatic approach. In fact, if you grew up with studying many body physics and optical lattices, that may seem slightly too pragmatic. Because what does the Green's function tell you? It's the average over the many body systems. These are the angular brackets. And then you do a thought experiment where you do the psi dagger. You're throwing in a particle at time r prime t prime. You try to pull it out at space r ti uh, time t. And you look what happens in between. So the many body system is in taking the average and in the time propagation. And it's useful as long as you want to compute single particle quantities. But you know, electrical resistance is a single particle quantity. Magnetization is a single particle quantity. So it's a single particle quantity in a many body system. And in superconductivity, for example, you turn these things into two component spinners. They have an off diagonal component. So there's a pair annihilation amplitude and amplitude to actually annihilate a Cooper pair. So, uh, and the good thing is that there is a wealth of diagrammatic methods. You know, many body physics since the 1950s is based on this. Um, and in a way, uh, what you have in, for example, the Dyson equation is the so-called self-energy, which tells you what is the correction to the energy of my system from the surrounding particles. And because the Dyson energy uh, because the self-energy can depend on momentum and frequency, it also it's not just a different energy, it really shows you kind of uh, different, uh, uh, different dynamics. So we want to compute this. And um, fortunately, there is a method called the variational cluster method on classical computers that is really quantum compatible uh, that helps you to do this. What you do is you take your, so left is the Hubbard Hamiltonian, you take your lattice, you chop it up into little clusters. The clusters you're solving exactly, you compute the Green's function exactly. And then you use perturbation theory, so some uncorrelated hopping between the clusters to go from this to a whole lattice. And um, Potov and Seneschal, the pioneers of this method, have shown that actually if there is a settle point equation, for the self-energy of the whole cluster, so you need to slightly, for the whole system, so you slightly need to change the parameters of your cluster, and then you have a settle point equation that gives you a really good approximation to the full system. And uh, this is what you do, so you do a variation. Omega is the grand canonical potential, sigma is the self-energy, and uh, this is just illustrating a settle point principle. Don't worry about the details so much. But essentially, you now need a variational eigensolver for the self-energy, if you want to put this on a quantum computer. And if you're looking back at uh, the phase diagram, so I need to go back to the phase diagram, you wonder, what is the approximation? Well, the approximation is, if these lines in the phase diagram, you know, the horizontal axis is doping, the vertical axis is temperature, are phase transitions. At phase transition, correlations become infinite get an infinite length. If you're making clusters, that will at some point not be captured correctly. So what you do with the variational cluster method is you study the whole lattice, but the size of the cluster that you can study tells you how much resolution do I have at the phase boundaries. 
But that is kind of a cool scaling challenge to make it good enough so you can resolve phase boundaries. But finite size effects you don't have because you're always studying the whole lattice. So we came up with a few older papers uh, with Pierre-Luc Dallaire de Mers on how to uh, do this because now you need to actually work out the Green's function on a quantum computer that involves phase estimation. Phase estimation is unpopular but probably inevitable. Um, and um, now um, we have one interesting twist which is also physics based. You know the theme of this is quantum algorithms meet statistical physics tricks. And if we're looking at what do we have to do to compute this Green's function on a quantum computer, we have to average over the equilibrium state that we want to study, which means we have to be able to prepare it. And there's kind of no way around it, but we can use a variational Hamiltonian ansatz, for example, to do that. Then we have to put in a non-Hermitian operator, time evolve, put in another non-Hermitian operator, and take an expectation value. Oh boy. So we could at least leave one uh, shortcut that gives us in small systems a factor of three and in general a polynomial improvement, which is to open another page of statistical physics book, namely the Green's function appears in a very different problem, the linear response problem. What is linear response? Linear response is you have your system that you prepare an equilibrium state described by Hamiltonian H0 now you're putting in a driving force lambda of t coupling to another operator v, and you measure how does operator A react on this. And the answer is the Kubo formula from the 1950s, that it's the average, the expectation value of A in the equilibrium state, and then it's the time integral of the commutator. But this is very similar to what you need in the Green's function. Uh, the Green's function has this time ordering element, and you can express all of this by the Green's function. So now what we do is, we say, okay, instead of running an algorithm that does the thing on the top, do an algorithm that does the thing on the bottom. Namely, imitate a linear response experiment on your quantum computer. This is the circuit. So we prepare an interacting ground state. From the non-interacting ground state with propulsion and hopping, we have to do the variational Hamiltonian ansatz, so we have to do the variational calculation. And then we throw in a perturbation. This is a piece of circuit for the per perturbation that's essentially a Majorana operator, which means the real part of a field operator. Then we evolve it with uh, the thing on the left, and then we measure, and it's, this is how the evolution operator looks at. This is, in this case, broken down into Mölner-Sörensen gate. And this is for a two, uh, for a subcluster with just two spins. And um, if we do this for two, for two sides, not for two spins, so it's two sides with multiple particles, uh, we need uh, ten, for 10 total stuff, we need 66 uh, two qubit gates, which is still a lot. If we have a gate error like this, uh, we still get a large error in the end. But it's, you know, it's a lot better than before. And if we simulate this, with the performance that we do on quantum hardware, um, where uh, here we take uh, IBM quantum computer simulated. So fake Mumbai is not the imitation of a fantastic city in South Asia. It's the Mumbai quantum computer of IBM simulated on classical hardware. And we can see that the energies as a function of parameters that we get, they're a little bit away from what we want. But if we put it all together, the um, analytic result versus the simulated result, they still capture the main features. And then we do the variational calculation that we split up the lattice into sublattices and links. And um, it looks like, uh, but this is the thing that we'll hopefully see on the archive soon, that with current hardware, we barely get to the point where with this method we can see a mod transition, where we have to tell apart as low from a large eigenvalue. It works based on heavy post-processing, so we have to run this whole variational cluster, but uh, you know, it helps us to deal with small clusters and it's an encouraging result, and it's yet another statistical physics-based shortcut to a NISC algorithm. So uh, with this, I can tell you that um, 
this very goal-oriented Green's functions measurement. You know, with this method, I cannot give you any lofty statements about the weight of entanglement on the ground state. I can we go directly to the phase diagram. We can probably have a shortcut. Um, talk was probably slightly chaotic, but I hope you still enjoyed it. And now we have at least 10 minutes for discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, one of the bad things about talks is that it, um, I, go, uh, I go away with a much longer reading list than I should have. <laughs> but, um, uh, okay, I do have uh, so many questions that it's best if you start. Oh, boy. Uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for your talk. Um, in the end, on the last slide that you show the results of the green function mm -hmm. that you evaluated, uh, I didn't understand how do you observe the different phases on, on that? Um, so in the end, you can use, if you have the green's function for the whole lattice, you can, for example, compute the magnetization, or you can compute um, the expectation value of, so uh, you know, magnetization at uh, low field gives you magnetic order, or if you go to this slide, not to Phil Anderson, uh, we get the pair Green's function, and if you compute that the expectation value of F is non-zero, you have superconductivity. And also, if you compute it close to the phase transition, um, you can show how it goes up. Okay, thank you. Um, in the last part, if I understood correctly, you said that this algorithm is barely on the limit and it's thanks to some heavy pulse engineering, if yeah. I understood correctly. Could you explain a no, bit? So that we do error mitigation and zero noise extrapolation but we're also looking at, you know, the publicly available systems. Um, the hope is that, of course, what you really want to do is you want to, in the end, study clusters that are too large for classical computers and that allow you to, um, uh, to get more precision on the phase diagram than you could get classically. That would be the beyond classical result. But here we did uh, error mitigation such as zero noise extrapolation, not heavy pulse engineering. Uh, we really wanted to see is this method good enough that if we do something generic, uh, we, we can already see something and uh, we have reason for optimism. And you know, and the, the Kubo is basically saying that to compute the Green's function, we take a different algorithm, uh, the, the, the Kubo formula. But in the end, the Kubo part uh, is not pulse engineering, you know, this uh, block on the right is an algorithm that encodes this thought experiment that we take uh, the real part of psi as a perturbation and we measure the imaginary part of psi. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, in the first part, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, you uh, interpret the, the QAOE in terms of the, the uh, integral pass. Yes. So I wonder your opinion uh, because you derived the, the Lagrangian uh, intensity. Mm -hmm. So somehow I wonder whether you can apply the, the optimization uh, with respect to the different noise to optimize uh, further in terms of the Lagrangian intensity um, to get so a further shortcut. Yes. So we have looked at this essentially that for example, for annealing schedules or shortcuts to adiaboticity, you always have this nasty thing that you should be able to actually solve your problems somehow. And this is the next thing. In situations when we cannot study the system in full anymore, we are looking at how close does this method get us to a good annealing schedule, for example. This is precisely what my postdoc, Tim Bode, is currently working on, yes. Um, and one question is, for example, can we find schedules that are somehow quenching the fluctuations?
Hi, so I have two questions. Um, one of them is you said that uh, with your method, uh, the result is void of finite size effects, which is quite cool. Uh, yeah. Or, and, but uh, you said that you're looking at the phase boundary with a certain resolution. Yes. So what, what does that mean? Like, what do you so actually the finite, see? So you're always studying an infinite Hubbard model. So you don't have finite size effects in the sense of suddenly having a surface. But what you do have is that if you want to look at, you know, a critical fluctuation of large length, that would at some point break down. And because the critical fluctuations diverge close to the phase boundary, that means that close to the phase boundary, our method becomes imprecise. You know, that's the price to pay for having a small processor. There must be a price to pay. But it's not that, uh, it's not the size of the Hubbard model, it is the, your method to capture long range order. Okay, but when you calculate an order, you, you do not calculate order parameters. So with all, you know, you, 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 if you compute f, you can get the order parameter. Yeah. Um, but for example, when, you know, when I want to, you know, the phase boundary is where the fluctuations diverge. Yes. And if I cannot capture the divergence properly, I will have a bit of uncertainty in the phase boundary. Okay, okay. So and this is soon, or you are smoothened out into a crossover instead of a Yes, phase yes, boundary. yes, yeah, yes, okay. yes. So in this sense, this is still a finite size effect, but it's for the correlations, not for the system. So there's no kind of, uh, yeah, no kind of geometric finite size effect. And this is well known. I mean, this method was not invented to us. This method is, so there's the two big drivers, uh, David Seneschal from uh, Sherbrooke and uh, Michael Potthoff from Hamburg. It's a popular, but not the most popular method on classical computers for the Hubbard model, but we found it to be kind of very quantum compatible. Okay, and the second question is, can you use this to simulate non-equilibrium systems, like for example, disordered systems where you do not have equilibrium phase, transi phase transitions? Um, that is, mm, that uh, is not clear. Okay. The settle point principle assumes that you're on a stable state. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Frank, for the, for the talk. I was wondering uh, how uh, your mean field uh, AOA uh, method, how this fits with uh, Hastings uh, uh, method, classical, the, the classical method? So it's a uh, Hastings method is a very different uh, quantum inspired classical algorithm. But can, can this uh, be used to, uh, to uh, so uh, can this solve or can, th uh, can, be, can, can this help to uh, uh, find examples uh, in which uh, QAOA can be better? Yes, I mean, examples where QAOA can be better are those where the Lyapunov exponents get really big. And, you know, uh, so far we did a good sampling of existing models. We didn't reverse engineer the question yet. Reverse engineering would be set up Hamiltonians where we can expect the Lyapunov exponents to explode. Yeah. Um. So I have a question yeah. about the mean field method. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about some self-consistency equations. Yes. Uh, how limited is the method on that? Or uh, can you comment further? No, it, it is crucial to have the self-consistency. I mean, the self-consistency is kind of cheap because after one layer of driver, the 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 classical spins remain constant. So after the layer, while you apply the problem Hamiltonian. So after the layer of driver, you compute all the spin expectation values, you do get the mean field, and then this gives you, um, this gives you the phases for the next problem Hamiltonian layer. So there is no self-consistency loop. There is just a mean field, and this is because we have trotted. This is because we have split up the, the two non-commuting terms in the Hamiltonian. A, a full self-consistency we would only have to do if we had them at the same time. So a so self-consistent field in this sense is a bit imprecise. It's really the mean field in the kind of most antiquated sense of the work. We do have time for... Oh, oh. <coughs> uh, thank you. I have a question about the uh, NP hard problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, you know, um, we cannot expect like uh, exponential speed up yeah. by, by using quantum computer. 
but you know, um, according to my understanding, um, MP hard problem is the uh, um, uh, basically uh, can be encoded into the easing model. And yes, easing model is uh, can be uh, you know uh, treated by quantum adiabatic mm -hmm. algorithm, and which is uh, uh, nicely handled by quantum yeah. annealer. So that that seems uh, you know we can handle that. We can handle that. yes, yeah. but the statement was we cannot expect exponential speed up. So because to, pr to have exponential speed up, we would need have to have a gap that shrinks polynomially. Oh, okay. Because then we can run the algorithm in polynomial time where otherwise it would take exponential time. Yeah. And that is not known, but it's unlikely. The sketch of the series of corollaries is that you can, in principle, also use Grover's algorithm to solve combinatorial optimization problems when you're saying, that if there is a solution that gives me zero, I want to find it, and you get a square root speed up. So it goes from exponential to exponential with half the exponent. And um, given the optimality, people believe that this is something adiabatic quantum computers cannot beat. It's outside my range of expertise to comment on all the corollaries. Um, I think uh, a Correct and well done discussion of this is typically found on Scott Aronson's blog. But uh, so you know, but uh, you know, it's, I think it's not excluded. There is one route with its corollaries, which could allow for this, but it's not likely. Okay. Um, but and, and again, getting square root speed up for combinatorial optimization, yes, but exponential, yeah. unlikely. Yeah. And of course, the whole game is also not all versions of a combinatorial optimization problems are hard. Only certain instances are. And this is also what our work does. It's looking at there were these tales of still hard instances of the SK model, for example. Um, there's time for one more question. Uh, yeah, maybe a general question related to the way. Do, do you think it has a future? Hmm? The way yes. you read the company it has a future because, like, like I have the company is like twenty years old. Yes. And at the moment, I haven't seen like results that had you know meaningf meaningful results from the company. Like, it's really difficult for quantum leader to solve NP hard problem. Like, like you said, you say, no, there is no quantum advantage, and I think it's not going to be. But I don't know what do you think. I think there were good benchmarks on also certain classes of spin glass transitions um, done in parts together with Daniel Lidar. I think uh, we all understand that the, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a great system. It's probably not as great as we have been originally promised. Um, but one thing which is very encouraging, there is this unknown role of or only partially known role of temporal coherence in adiabatic quantum computing. And I think the line of products that has been announced, I don't know whether they are out, where they are getting smaller, which in their case means 500, but they're using qubits that have a reasonable T1 and T2, will probably show this. But there is a whole program which I have stopped following, unfortunately, around Daniel Lidar and Ernst Inc. Uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, wants to benchmark this a lot better. I cannot say really more. Um, where I typically go to to learn about this is the INCA seminar series. I don't know whether you know this, INQA, the International Network of Quantum Annealing, which has people who really believe in quantum annealing but are uh, skeptical of D-Wave. Um, and also, as a comment on conferences, is that you know, I grew up in condensed matter theory, and my uh, main practical supervisor was educated in the Soviet Union. So I grew up in a, um, a culture with um, good and lively discussions, to say the least. <laughs> in gate-based quantum computing, we, we often have presentations where theory, proposal, experimental demonstration, not a lot of debate. And the AQC conference, uh, for me, is always the golden mean. Right? They are optimistic, they want to build something, but they're also very critical. They, they have a very good culture in criticizing their results, and uh, if they survive, they really mean something. So this is where I would go, but I cannot make any more detailed assessment. Yeah. Okay, and another question? Or, yeah, uh, related to the 
first part of the presentation, you mentioned this quantum inspired uh, array, no? And you compared against, you mentioned the best classical solution. Yes. Thing. What do you mean by that? So there is the, 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 the spin glass, the Schrodinger and Kirkpatrick spin glass has been studied for a very long time on classical computers. And the best known algorithm for classical computers is a little bit better than ours. But this is people spending two decades on optimizing the, optimizing the algorithm, and we spent half a year. And we wanted to show something different. That indicates, not that we are geniuses, we are not, it indicates that the basic idea to use, and this is probably also a good summary, to use Hemming weight one tunneling, so tunneling where we only flip one bit, is a pretty good idea, and then using entanglement doesn't add so much more because we still, with the driver Hamiltonian, because we are still treating the single bits like uh, needles on a block sphere, uh, we still use some tunneling, but only strictly local. Okay, um, uh, if you want to have Frank, I think it will have to be over coffee. Yes. Um, uh, let's thank Frank again. Thank you. I can see the next, the next speaker getting things ready. Um, uh, it's going. I'm going to, um, um, to be very biased uh, in presenting her because she has this huge TV that cannot be mended, and I don't think she will ever live up to it. Uh, which is that, unfortunately for her, I was one of her co-supervisors, <laughs> so um, I am biased. Um, Laura did the study here in the University of the Basque Country, uh, both her undergrad, uh, the master's, and her PhD, and is currently based in uh, Chalmers in, in Sweden. Um, and I have to say, I was very lucky. I was always learning from her, so I am sure I will be learning from her today if she manages to get her um, micro on. So here you have the title of the talk, and Laura, whatever. Yes, I'm getting there. I think it works. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the biased introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you also for the organizers for kindly inviting me and giving me one hour time slot to present results. I'll try to fill it. <laughs> um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about, again, the quantum approximate optimization algorithm and what its performance with very low entanglement and large circuit depth. So there is a kind of overlap with the previous talk, but we'll see how it uh, relates. I think both results um, support each other, but from different perspectives. So uh, this is a work that is now on archive. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, discussions with referees at the moment. It takes some time. And now it doesn't, uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to give uh, some background about um, who am I uh, and uh, where I'm at. So Chalmers is in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, and I'm funded by the Ballenberg Center of Quantum Technology, which is a huge uh, center uh, involving several universities. Chalmers is the one who's building the superconducting quantum computer. And I'm in the theory part. So when I arrived there as a postdoc, I didn't work in quantum algorithms. I work in quantum computation in continuous variables. So part of my uh, results are on that area. And it's just now when I'm starting to work on quantum algorithms for NISC devices. So I work in continuous variables with Julia Ferrini, and now in quantum algorithms for NISC devices, like the one they are building with uh, Joran Johansson. I'm interested studying this. There is a quantum computer, so we are asked to propose algorithms that can be run, and that's very important to see how they work, how noise affects them. But also I want to understand them from the more rigorous uh, perspective, so trying to derive 
guarantee bounds, complexity separations, and uh, maybe getting those intuitions reformulate the algorithms. So um, this is an overview of previous works on continuous variables. Um, this inspired me to attack, let's say, the quantum algorithm part from a resource theory perspective because the work that I did before was very much into rigorously analyze the resources of a quantum of a continuous variable architecture. So uh, I explore theorems in continuous and discrete variables. I uh, studied bosonic codes, and the, the works that we had there was about Wigner negativity, magic measures, and these kind of resources that are considered valuable for a quantum computer to be to have some advantage. Um, also, I did some more uh, applied work, uh, implementing the quantum approximate optimization algorithm with cut qubits, with biased noise. So it was a mixed and a good start to then jump into the gate-based uh, algorithms. So there is a delay with this. I, OK. If you have to take some message from this work, is the following. Um, a classical quantum-inspired algorithm based on low entangled approximations of QAOA provides good solutions to max cut and exact cover three problems with up to 60 qubit instances and low von dimension like D equal to 10. It's really low for those uh, sizes and height depth P equal to 30. This is what we studied numerically. These are the co-authors. You see all of them except one who left for industry and doesn't even have a photo in his LinkedIn. Uh, I have personal uh, photos of him, but I didn't want to put it. Like, he just has no digital uh, presence, I guess. The main uh, um, author of this paper, uh, the first author is Risi. He was a master's student, and he was learning how to um, program uh, matrix broad states. So we thought ah, it can be interesting to apply them to maybe the quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithm because there are several works that use them to benchmark the Google experiment and so on and, and link the bond dimension that you, can, uh, that you need with the fidelity of those algorithms. So we thought this can be a good example you can try it on this, and then it led to these uh, results later because we were su surprised how, we, how well they worked. So this is uh, the outline of the content. So I will again re-explain what is QAOA, what are uh, variational quantum algorithms, even if it is a bit of overlap, I think like repeating can be good. Um, I'll explain the approximation, so how we build this classical algorithm. There are several layers of approximations there. It's not only this low entanglement and a low bond dimension. Uh, we also just take one sample at the end of the algorithm and basically use very suboptimal parameters. I will explain all those three ingredients that go into this uh, algorithm, classical algorithm. And then is when I will go to uh, describe the performances of this algorithm for the cases we saw. It's not the serrington kirkpatrick model, but it's also for MaxCat with uh, random graphs. It's just not weighted graphs. But I think still like both results support each other. Um, we also consider how an MPS simulation can help training the uh, algorithm because the optimization loop is usually a bottleneck. So we thought, okay, if we can simulate with MPS, uh, like with good fidelity for small sizes, can we get a good initial guess of the parameters? And we also have some results on that. And finally, I will uh, give some context of the results because they seem contradicting with some literature, and I think yet. That's just a matter of um, um, misleading information, but there is no contradiction, so hopefully I can address it in the context and conclusions. 
if I have time, I will stop after this, take questions. If I have time, I might explain a bit more of resource theory of magic with bosonic codes, only if I have uh, time. So let's see, variational quantum algorithms are really popular and the reason is because um, they are very adaptable to any problem. So any uh, classical problem of combinatorial optimization, you can reformulate it into a cubo Hamiltonian and you can apply it. It doesn't mean that it gives you any good solution. These are heuristics, so you don't know if they will give you a good solution or not. In the beginning, as Frank said, there was a um, guarantee that it would perform better than the non-classical algorithm at that time, but that was only for a short amount of time until the computer scientists came with a better algorithm for MaxCAD. So it's unclear. Um, but people uh, use them because first you can implement them, and second, you cannot simulate them classically. It's very hard. So you might think, ah, maybe I have some advantage here. At least I cannot simulate what they do classically. So let's try it. Um, these kind of algorithms usually uh, are composed by some initialization of parameters. Okay, you don't see the pointer or do you? Some, some layer in which you initialize um, your state. For many problems, you can do it in the superposition of all bit strings, like I, I saw here. And then you apply um, sequential layers of a cost Hamiltonian that encodes your solution and a mixer Hamiltonian. This can change depending on the problem. There are different works that make use of symmetries of the problem to change the mixer Hamiltonian that initialize in a different state, especially if are, they are constrained uh, optimization problems. And the idea is that you would do it several times. This comes from the idea of trotterization, uh, an adiabatic uh, algorithm, but it's not really completely a trotterization because you don't necessarily take the adiabatic uh, evolution. You can change these parameters. So let's say your scheduling function can be very different if you do the trotter translation, let's say. After one run, you will measure some quantity, usually is the average of the Hamiltonian, the energy that is linked to your cost, and you will optimize that for those parameters that you have in your circuit, and do that several times until you reach an approximation ratio, for instance, for max cut, or, or your desired uh, energy. So in this uh, case, we studied two problems. The first is MaxCAT. So it can be formulated with the adjacency matrix, AIJ, of a graph. And the idea is that you want to find the maximum uh, cut of that. Here I uh, draw, uh, not so nicely, a bipartite graph that is easy to solve classically. But the idea is like you want to find the maximum cut over the edges separate the vertices in two partitions and find that cut. Um, as you see, this has an um, easy formulation that can be an ingredient of this cost layer. We also studied exact cover three. It's a version of exact cover. And the idea of this problem is a decision problem instead. So you are not finding, is this cut good enough? You are finding, do I have a exact an exact cover or do I not? There is a yes or no solution. And uh, imagine you are given a set of uh, M elements, A1 to AM, and a, a set of subsets of A, your elements from which you pick to cover the first elements. So the question is like, do I have an exact cover of A? If I pick like, uh, different uh, subsets of B, different elements of B, sorry, can I uh, um, link them such that I have a, an exact cover? And by exact, I mean that there is no um, intersection between the elements B1, uh, BK, BK and uh, another element of the, of the cover. 
um, in this case of exact cover three, um, the only thing is that each element AI can only be in three of the subsets. And that can be um, posed as a satisfiability problem with, um, let's, uh, let's see, three variables, like x1, x2, x3 equal to one, for instance, and so on, depending on, um, yeah, which uh, subsets you, you get. So it is a heuristic. So the fundamental question that we ask is, how can these algorithms facilitate solving optimization problems? It's not clear. The fact that you, can simulate, you cannot simulate them classically doesn't uh, tell you anything, right? What quantum properties may constitute a resource for practical advantage? So this on the one hand, on the second hand, they are hard to simulate. So we need advanced numerical methods and MPS is a, an advanced method that has shown really good results for certain spin models in 1D and depending on how your entanglement uh, is distributed. So that led us to just use MPS for simulating this algorithm. Both studying the, the fundamental properties, in this case entanglement, because the MPS representation um, is linked to how you restrict the entanglement that you allow to express, and also because they are very powerful tools, right? So here, um, I won't enter in detail on, on uh, what is an MPS and that. Maybe this is very uh, basic, I don't know. But basically, you, have, uh, you can represent a state by this uh, MPS formulation where you have uh, between this A, S, A, um, S, K, let's say, you have different uh, bonds. And how you restrict the entanglement is by restricting this dimension of these links. So if you think about the Smith decomposition in which you uh, take a bipartite system and you want to have this decomposition, to have the Smith coefficients and that is linked to entanglement, um, to entanglement entropy, in this case is a general Smith decomposition between every bipartition of, the, of this chain in this case. So the, the highest bond dimension will be always in the middle and will be uh, two to the n over two, uh, more or less. So this, as you see, grow exponentially when you have a large system. In principle, if you have low entanglement, many of these uh, uh, ranks will be lower than the maximum bond dimension, but we don't know in QAOA, right? So in principle, you need uh, an exponential bond dimension. How do we do the operations with this? Um, a single qubit operation, uh, G, you just multiply them, collapse them in that way. A two qubit gate operation um, is depicted, if you follow the lines, you don't see my cursor, but if you follow the lines, uh, you apply this two qubit operation into the uh, matrix plot state, then you will do a, a singular value decomposition again to reduce the bond dimension, and then you will have the state after doing the two qubit gate. So as you see here, you have, uh, it's easy if you have interactions between nearest neighbor uh, qubits. If you think of it, of the qubits being spins on a line. So the th first thing we do to do this simulation is to take the uh, QAOA algorithm for max cut and exact cover and compile it um, with an efficient uh, routing technique called the swap network. So that in the end, we will have nearest neighbor two qubit gates. So the, the rule on how to uh, contract them is very easy. You just follow from the left to the right. But we needed to do this before. Um, it's not complicated. And then we do the, the, simula the simulation. I said that uh, this approximation included more things than reducing the bond dimension in the matrix product state. Beyond that, you can think, how do we sample from our final matrix product state? So what we do is like, we don't care about realistic sampling from a probability distribution. 
this is a classical algorithm. So what we will do is a sequential deterministic sampling. So let's see if maybe I go up here. We will measure the first qubit and see what is the probability of the state of being measured in, in zero or in one. If it is bigger, the probability of measuring it in zero, we collapse it in that state. So uh, we compute the reduced density matrix, see what, is the, what probability is higher, and then collapse it in that state. And then we do that sequentially. So we are guaranteed that we get one single bit string in the end with a probability that is larger or equal than one over two to the n. And that bit, bit string doesn't need to be the most probable. Actually, we saw in an appendix that it, in, it's very easy to think of a counterexample. But this is the single bit string that we will use. Now, the parameter choice, because this is usually the bottleneck, right? What do we choose as parameters? We took, for MaxCAD and for exact cover, a set of 10, 12 node random graphs for MaxCAD and 10, 12 qubit instances. So it's really small instances. Uh, what we did then is a global optimization for p equal to one, which you can do. You can uh, uh, draw the grid and see what is the optimal angle and then a layer-wise extrapolation. So there are several approximations here, but these are the angles that we are going to use. So we do that. We do that for the 10 instances, and then we average the parameters over those, and we use these generated parameters from these 12 node instances for all sizes of the problem. So let's think about it. We use, uh, is p equal to 100? We use 200 parameters generated for this sim from these simple instances for all cases. This is a huge approximation. Why uh, it worked in the end <laughs> is because uh, there are works that show that the optimal parameters concentrate for certain problems. Um, meaning that the parameters that give you the best approximation ratio are very close to each other. But this is ongoing research. So the bounds were not very tight, but still here we use this very simple and uh, very brute approximation and it worked. So I believe that's the reason. So now I just explained the classical algorithm, what is there. We have matrix spread states. We will use very low bond dimensions. We have this deterministic sampling that gives us only one sample following this um, um, partial uh, density matrices and just collapsing depending on what is the highest uh, probability if measuring zero or one. And then we have a really, really approximated parameter choice. We thought about even taking the adiabatic one, but why not extrapolate from a very, very small instance. And now let's see the performances. So the way we will measure how it performs for MaxCAD is quite clear, is the approximation ratio. So what we use here, S, is only one sample. So is the product state associated with that sample. And uh, a thing that one needs to be careful here, we define the, the cost Hamiltonian with the global uh, phase as well. If you only use the two-body term, you are subtracting some um, constant, and then you need to be mindful when you do this approximation ratio. So the, if I do it as a minimization problem, the maximum uh, C that you can have is zero, not cutting any edges. If you use here something where you remove the global uh, term, it, it can be different. Just saying, because in some papers it's a bit unclear, this is just the classical translated cost with all the terms into account. So this is the uh, well-defined approximation ratio. And then for exact cover three, as I said, is a decision problem. So you can have a yes or no, I have an exact cover. So the, we define the success rate in this way. We take several instances and we say, 
okay, if it found the, the exact cover, then we give it a one. If not, it's a zero. And then we have some success rate over the instances that we study. Also, uh, uh, for the approximation ratio, we will have an average of the approximation ratio. So these are the two metrics that we are going to use. And this, let me guide you through this, is the results for um, MaxCat. So um, here are uh, 40 qubits. Didn't I write it? Yeah. 100 instances of 40 qubit uh, nodes. What we see here in the, in the x-axis is the bond dimension. So the maximum bond dimension in this case is uh, 128. So we can really simulate to the highest one, to the proper simulation. And then here you find the, um, the P, the depth of the, of the circuit. And OK, in this case, actually QAOA performs quite uh, well for not so large P. So maybe it's not the most telling. But what you can see is that even with very, very, very low bond dimensions, you can jump quickly, disregarding the entanglement, to a good solution for all 100 instances. And we have even more approximations. We have the sampling and we have the parameter choice. So it seems that if you let it go, even without entanglement, it will reach that solution with this very brute approximation. Okay, now we go to 100 40 qubit instances. Here we cannot go, or we didn't uh, go to the full bond dimension. And here we see something very similar. With very low bond dimensions, if you go high in depth, like to P20 or so, you are already in a good uh, average approximation ratio for all of them. It's like 0 0.99, and this is an average over all of the instances. So it seems that even if you don't keep the entanglement, if you go farther enough, you get a good solution for these cases. This cannot be generalized so easily. I, I guess you cannot overclaim, but what we saw numerically, we were very surprised, and you find the, the solution. And finally, 60 qubit instances. We only simulated 10 because it takes <laughs> more time. And you see that um, for very low uh, depth, you don't get the solution in, in, in any case of these bond dimensions. But if you go farther, again, you do get the solution. Uh, you need, though, a tiny bit of entanglement or going very, very far. But like bond dimension 10 is not unreasonable for a classical simulation. So this kind of shows that maybe entanglement is not so important. It's a huge claim. I don't want to claim that. But in these cases, like it seems that it, it is the case. And this is for exact cover, where I remind you we have success rates instead of approximation ratios. So again, we have 100, 110, 40, uh, sorry, 14, 40, and 60 qubit instances. And you see something very similar, right? Like even in this case, where you have the whole um, bond dimension, you need to go farther with QAOA. But if you do the same, not keeping the entanglement, you still get the solution. So it seems like you just need to go deeper in the circuit. Um, yeah, uh, for 100 and, and uh, for 40 and 60, you need to go even farther here. But this is easy classically. The bond dimension here is really far away, the, the exact one. But here it seems that if you go beyond 30, and this is the number I gave you before, you get a good approximation, um, in this case, success rate, right? So these are promising results. We were uh, very surprised by this. And um, yeah, it suggests that maybe entanglement is not uh, so important. How is um, the fidelities then? Because we thought maybe is that the QAOA doesn't create entanglement 
in, in this case. So uh, actually, for the 14 qubit instance, we could do this analysis because we go to the full bond dimension. And it's true, it, it does not create uh, so much uh, entanglement, but we had good solutions even when the fidelity was low here if you went high enough. So even when it does not represent exactly what um, QAOA would be doing, it uh, reads our solution. Uh, yeah, and these are for the, the average fidelities for the 114 qubit instances, as I said. Then, this is regarding the performances with respect to the classical optimization uh, problem. Now, can we use this MPS simulation uh, for the optimization loop? Here we don't talk about the sampling anymore. We will be computing the average uh, value of the Hamiltonian. So what you see here is the landscape. We, we can plot it only for p equal to one, right? So we see the landscape with, uh, for a 12 qubit instance, so this is the maximum bond dimension, how it changes when you go farther to d equal to two. And um, even if you see that it attenuates um, the minimum, in this case it's a minimization problem, it's still in the same position kind of. So you could use it in principle to train um, QAOA. A subtlety, because um, as I, I will mention later, this is uh, also some uh, work that Rigetti did. They also use MPS to train uh, their QAOA. And uh, a thing that we needed to do is to not normalize the MPS. If you normalize the MPS in the simulation, you get this kind of noise, uh, high frequency noise. So it was a, we, we saw it just numerically. We saw why we can optimize if we don't normalize and not if we normalize, which is the correct, let's say. And uh, it's because of this kind of high frequency noise. So yeah, in principle, you can train. And how the, this is for 12 qubit instances, how the parameters change. So here you see the exact uh, parameter, well, exact up to, we use um, GPIOPT, some kind of Bayesian optimization. It's not guaranteed you have the global uh, minimum, but let's, let's see, let's uh, assume it is. Uh, this is what exact QAOA will give you. And then as you reduce the bond dimension, you see the difference, different parameters for P equal to four, how they change. And they break at D equal four, something like that. So in principle, you can use this MPS um, approximation also to train the optimization loop if you uh, are not very, very in the limit of no entanglement. And uh, similarly, uh, there is a work by um, uh, So uh, et al. that shows that uh, the interpolation can be used in some cases. That's why our parameters work also. We use this interpolation method. We optimize locally, interpolate, optimize locally. It's not a global optimization for devising our uh, parameters. So we see here that indeed if you go to take the whole uh, bond dimension, you see this kind of patterns in the parameters in the cases that we analyzed. And it starts breaking when you go down in bond dimension, but in between 24 and 64, I didn't plot it here, but it keeps, be, uh, you, ca you could still see the patterns. And they disappear completely in the equal uh, to two. But we saw also that the parameters were very far away, so. Now, the context. How, why people can react strongly uh, to this, right? So there are different uh, works in which people try to prove bounds for QAOA, meaning how much depth do I need to find the solution? How much uh, depth do I need to have this final uh, distribution of my state that is linked to a solution and so on? 
all these papers, QAOA needs to see the whole graph, et cetera, are based on the following reasoning. So you will have some distribution, some Hemingway distribution for an unqubed state. And in principle, you can uh, derive uh, concentration bounds for this kind of uh, distribution for, for the Hamming weight. And the reasoning goes as follows to prove limitations. So you consider the algorithm A, that in this case would be QAOA for this problem max cut, and you need to show that the output distribution of A must be concentrated. So what they do is they take QAOA with a depth that is lower than logarithmic, and they say, uh, the output that I get is concentrated in the Hamming weight. So this is what I get. And to prove the limitation is like if they need to assume that the good solutions of the problem are not concentrated. The way they do it, there are different ways. They use the overlap property in some problems. And in, uh, in MaxCut, they use symmetry. They say, if I encode my problem, the solution the optimal ground state will be a superposition between certain bit string and its opposite. Because I can label, if I was coloring in the graph red and, and blue, the vertices, I can just color them the other way around and it would still be a solution. So it's this symmetry, set to symmetry that you have in the system. Um, so therefore, their conclusion, if they are able to prove this concentration, is that the algorithm cannot perform well, or at least that you need this depth. Well, uh, true, but we are not creating this uh, ground state. We are sampling. <laughs> so um, yeah, it seems like it's difficult to, to see whether we need uh, this depth or not for, for our case. It seems that we need it, but it's not, I would say it's difficult to, to yet uh, these limitations with our case, because we are sampling and we are not sampling from the good distribution. We are doing some deterministic sampling that picks another bit string. So it's very difficult to contextualize our work with regard to these uh, works. Uh, as I said also, if someone claims, no, your results cannot be right. Well, we actually go far away from logarithmic anyway. With low entanglement, sure, but we go. So, yeah. Is the solution anti-concentrated for our case? Do we need to get this superposition or with one of them we are happy? If we measure one of the, of the states that encodes the solution, we are happy also. So we might not need this concentration anyway. Then, there are, um, these are the Rigetti uh, works that I mentioned. So they calibrate uh, the classical hardness of the QAOA. So they do simulations of uh, MPS simulations of QAOA with similar training results. So they have a very similar uh, figure, as I showed you, where you saw that the landscape gets attenuated with lower bond dimension. However, their aim is to benchmark QAOA. They want to run it in a quantum computer and they want to simulate it with the highest fidelity possible, the same as the works that try to simulate the Google experiment and so on. So they studied up to p equal 4. So compared to our p equal to 100, is just a different regime for different sizes of max cut. I think they go up to 20. And they really get the whole bond dimensions and so on. And what they see is that they need an exponential bond dimension to get similar cost values. So they eventually they measure the average of the energy. And they saw that actually QAO is creating entanglement if you go for P equal to P equal 4. Um, but in our case, if we look at P equal 4, uh, you remember the scale went to 0 to 100. The success probability was very low when we had low entanglement. So there is no contradiction. And this we realize when we talk to them. There's no contradiction because it's just... Uh, in this small regime, right? Um, so yeah, as I said, <laughs> we find the same results if we zoom in in this p equal to 4. They also have another work 
in which they um, give an entanglement perspective on the QAOA, and they actually compute the entanglement entropy, I believe, between the largest deep partitions. And when they see, they in, uh, infer a, a kind of volume law of en entanglement. So they see that you would need the entanglement grows in the middle layers of QAOA and possibly eventually drops. But if you have very low P, the entanglement is growing exponentially. So what I believe this, our MPS simulation does, it's a hypothesis, is as we go here in very, very, very low entanglement up to here where you don't need it anymore without tunneling somehow the, the entanglement barrier. Because, or at least I can claim that for the instances that we compute, of course, like it needs to be generalized, but for 60 qubit instances, it seems it's the case. Um, so, yeah, the algorithm is hard to simulate if you want to simulate it exactly, but um, it seems that our entanglement uh, our classical algorithm tunnels that entanglement barrier. And we don't care about simulating QAOA exactly. We care about the performance with respect to the classical problem. So it seems that's what's happening. So let's uh, get some <laughs> thoughts here. One thing is the analysis of the quantum algorithm itself. So we cannot say QAOA doesn't need entanglement because what we are doing is not QAOA. It's a classical algorithm inspired from QAOA. And we put many approximations there. What we are doing, though, is analysis of the performance of this algorithm with respect to the classical problem. How well does it solve the MaxCAD problem? The entanglement barrier according to their work, uh, seems to matter only for exact simulations if you care about the middle layers. If you go far enough, maybe it's not so important. It's difficult to prove limitations because this is what we are trying to do, but these are numerical results. But in principle, maybe uh, MaxCAD is not the best uh, problem, or at least the random instances that we analyze, because MaxCAD, you can do it in several, several instances. So I, I don't want to generalize. And a next idea, if we really take seriously this algorithm, this uh, approximation, as a classical algorithm, what we did is not enough, and we would need to really benchmark it to state-of-the-art classical algorithms. So take really, really big graphs and see how it performs, and compare it to Weyman's Williamson, or the state-of-the-art classical algorithms. So this is maybe something that we would like to do in future work. A seamless advertisement of a, <laughs> a conference that we are organizing at Chalmers this, uh, at the end of the summer. Well, there is not summer anymore, but yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a co-organizer with Werner Dubrotz from the chemistry department. Uh, and Alexandru Giorgio from the Computer Science Department and Simon Olson from the Computer Science Department. So uh, there will be two pillars, one more on complexity theory, one more on implementations. All of it is theory. So you are welcome to scan the QR code. We are a bit delayed with the registration, but you can uh, anyway see if you would like to, to attend. Uh, we have a, an impressive list of uh, invited speakers, so I'm really proud of it. Um, and then maybe some, I don't know how much time do I have in you? Five minutes, good, perfect. So this is uh, very much like future work I would like to do and we are doing, it's very preliminary, but I want to also give you some other ideas on what are the paths that we are taking at Salmers to try to analyze and at the same time implement these algorithms. Um, so there is one algorithm that is very promising, at least in our simulations with uh, noise, that is called recursive QAOA. 
So what it does, it has QAOA as a subroutine. You, obtain, you run QAOA, but instead of um, measuring, uh, you run it, you optimize the parameters. And at the end, when you have the parameters optimized, you won't measure the energy, but you will measure the correlations. Once you will measure the correlations between the all edges, you would like to identify the largest one in uh, absolute uh, value. And you will say, OK, these uh, nodes are highly correlated. I'm going to uh, com uh, compress them. And the way you compress them is following this sign. If they are anti-correlated, they will be in opposite spin uh, states. If they are correlated, in the same. And you keep track of all those rules. So you, uh, it's a rounding technique, basically. It's nothing fancy, but you repeat that until you have a graph small enough that your classical computer can deal with it, and then you solve it. Um, and here we saw, OK, a classical computer can deal with all of it without doing this thing, right? But we did, we said, OK, at 4, at node 4, we stop. We say that our classical computer can do it. And we apply uh, RQAOA versus QAOA with only p equal to 1 for a different kind of graphs. So this is a work, um, I, I didn't write the authors, but by Bradji et al. proposing this RQAOA. And the paper, I think, it's entitled Obstacles to uh, QAOA from Symmetry. Um, yeah. And they have proofs on how RQAOA will work for the cycle graph, so the ring of disagrees, and, the, um, and then there are later works, not by them, but that prove the same for uh, complete graphs. The reason why you can prove anything in that case is because when you compress, uh, the graph uh, looks the same. So you contract any edges in a cycle, it will be a cycle. You contract any edges in a complete graph, it will still be complete. And therefore, you can prove things. For any other kind of graphs, we tried to think about it. It's not so easy because you change how the graph structure is. Um, but anyway, we tried for more uh, uh, problems. And we saw that RQAOA, that is the one that is not, um, that doesn't have this white line, performs very well. And performs very well with noise. This noise is the uh, parameters that we got from the experimentalists at Chalmers. So we include the polarizing noise, amplitude damping. We put really a full um, realistic noise model. And it seems to be uh, promising. So an idea is like, how would this perform fully classically with an MPS, <laughs> our MPS uh, simulator? We will need to change it a bit because we will need to measure correlations, but is this a possible idea? Maybe. Um, yeah. And then uh, we were surprised how well the parameters work. We were really surprised. We thought, like, this is really a very brute approximation. So since we were so surprised, we decided to review the literature that saw some concentration uh, properties for the parameters. And there is uh, one master's student that is finishing right now his thesis, and maybe this will be a paper with more work later. That's so, it's not for random graphs though, but for the irregular graphs. Uh, the irregular graphs are those in which each node is connected with the other nodes exactly. Uh, you can transfer the optimal parameters be between those uh, graphs. And you can transfer, there were some previous results we built upon, um, that said that you can transfer between uh, regularities of the same parity, <coughs> but not between odd and even, for instance. But what we saw is a modest result is that you can indeed like transfer parameters between odd and even regularities if you keep in mind some rules on how to shift the parameters. So in which um, are not really quadrants they are, kind of, in which region they are. Um, it's, um, as I said, a modest work because the results were here and there in the literature. We just put them together and devised these rules of transferring. But we think this can be an interesting path 
because the optimization loop, in numerical simulations at least, is usually the bottleneck for us. So if you can't think of strategies where you know where your optimal parameters are, either you get them from adiabatic quantum computation or from other uh, places, that would be great. And we plan to continue on this kind of concentration bounds. And I think with that, I won't talk more about continuous variables because I managed to use my whole time for this. I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Um, so it's time for questions. It's time for a few. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Laura. Uh, so when you said that, okay, entanglement is not uh, a really powerful tool for having any kind of advantage, have you wondered if combination of different flavors of quantumness can give some kind of advantage? Because for example, in some uh, quantum sensing setups, you need not only entanglement, you need also some other uh, sources of quantum of quantumness like uh, squeezing, for example. Mm. So, have you thought about this? Mm. So, it's a hard question because I, I again will like not overclaim. Uh, I don't know how important is entanglement for QAOA. It seems that our algorithm is performing well for these instances, right? But what you said is like, what is the the quantum resource? that it matters. This is a challenge in all cases, in all fields. Uh, you know, you need entanglement because otherwise uh, you could, for quantum advantage I'm, I'm talking about now, because otherwise you could simulate it with uh, matrix prod state and tensor network techniques, but it is not a, um, a sufficient resource. It's necessary, but if you look from the perspective of um, Dignar negativity or stabilizer, um, stabilizer theory, you know that you can have stabilizer states that are highly entangled. So maybe it's a multi-resource <laughs> uh, combination is, a, is the question, right? Like what is the, the resource? I don't know. Also, I would say that in these variational algorithms, the question is also, is it enough that we cannot simulate them classically? Is, is, is enough of a reason to, for them to work in my classical problem? It's a heuristic. I don't think it's enough of a reason. It's enough of a reason for try it as a heuristic. There are many classical heuristics that work nicely, neural networks, machine learning. I'm not saying we shouldn't try heuristics. It's just, just because we cannot simulate them quantumly doesn't mean that anything for their performance in the classical, uh, for the classical problem, I think, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question is related uh, to the entangling again. So uh, is this um, property of using uh, low uh, bound dimensions related to the fact that the simultaneous uh, ground state of the adiabatic evolution of, the, of your uh, process of your dynamics has low entanglement. I mean, if you had an adiabatic evolution that instantaneously has a large entanglement, then you could not use this kind of techniques or, I mean. So, I so let me think. QAOA, you can think it as a trotterization of uh, an adiabatic uh, calculation, if you want, for certain parameters, like your gammas and betas would be related to your scheduling function in the quantum annealing. So I think it's difficult to say how it would be in quantum annealing because here the results are for QAOA. So QAOA does not necessarily take the adiabatic path with these parameters. And what they showed in the Getty is that QAOA creates entanglement. I think one would need to look at Frank's uh, results maybe, or do it for quantum annealing to see whether the ground state subspace remains like in low, low entangled. 
this is what, uh, my spontaneous answer. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, do these approximations, um, also maybe you have tried them, in problems where the energy levels are maybe um, they have more difference because we, uh, when um, when you don't have um, a weighted graph for max cut, uh, you can have like uh, imagine you have uh, the, the optimal solution is uh, you cut uh, eight connections. Uh, the next best is seven. So mm. the difference between eight and seven is not a big difference. But mm. if you have like one connection that has um, a weight of 100 and then the next has a weight of three, the difference is between 100 and three and then the next one is three. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, in, in my experience, uh, cubo kinds of Hamiltonians and uh, with QAOA or with annealing, uh, they struggle to, um, uh, to find solution when you have these huge gaps between uh, some solutions and the other because they only see like the huge 100 uh, qubit and the smaller weighted um, variables are like easily ignored by the problem. Have you tried uh, these methods with that kind of uh, cubo Hamiltonians? No, the, let's see, the graphs that we tried, I think that uh, we didn't put it here, we tried regular graphs, but also were unweighted. And these uh, erdos rangy kind of graphs, where you uh, create an edge between two nodes with certain probability, also unweighted. Um, I think that in your case, it would be the Sterrington Kirkpatrick model, but you now are saying that you want a height variance. So I don't know if there are works that uh, include that. I would look into that to answer your question. In our work, we didn't touch that. Um, yeah, I also don't know because from industry partners of BACT, we get some problems that are relevant for their industry, like flight scheduling and so on for uh, Boeing. That is one of the partners. And I don't see so different uh, weights, let's say. Um, once of them, you actually is a hyperparameter. If you have constraints, you want to have the constraint with the smallest weight possible such that it gets discarded. So you actively try to avoid these kind of things because your landscape will be horrible, will be very non-convex and very difficult to optimize. So, yeah, I, I, maybe you have, uh, we can talk later, we have a motivation from classical problems to have these kind of separations. No, it's, it's basically uh, with those kind of restrictions that sometimes you have to crank up the, 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 pe the penalty to okay. for so the system to yeah, actually I take see. it into account. But so then yeah, in that, in that case, you, the, the <laughs> optimal thing to do is to see what is, that uh, if you can reduce the, um, um, the parameter in that penalty as much as possible such that your solution is still feasible. That's what we are doing also. Thanks a lot. And since my namesake Inigo already asked, uh, I don't have to ask. Uh, so uh, we are going to coffee, but please first thank uh, Laura again. Mm. Thank And it is right next door.
Um, okay, so some people coming in yet. All right, if I can. Yeah, so. So for me, it is actually a pleasure to um, still keep going because um, I have to say I'm reminded of um, a book that was circulating sometime around, which was uh, it was it, it was created quite a long time ago, and um, it had in mind many developments in in science, and it was about why is it that we have never seen aliens. Right, and um, actually the first answer, and, it's, and it gave 100 qu answers to that question. Why haven't we seen aliens? I don't know where it should be translated, why haven't we seen a, com quantum com a proper quantum computer? But that's <laughs> setting, setting that aside. So the, the first, first answer to why haven't we seen aliens was, well, they are actually here and they're Hungarian. <laughs> because <laughs> it was at the time of obviously Edward Teller, of, of course, John von Neumann, Janos Neumann, and uh, Wigner, <laughs> obviously. And um, since I know Zoltan because he was a postdoc here <laughs> after Wigner and then went to UCL and, and to Germany and then uh, back to, to the Wigner Center, um, and he's a genius. Uh, I am reminded of, of that story. Um, so, uh, without you being a, a, an alien, um, please uh, go ahead, Sultan. Thanks a lot. And this alien story, this was really a legend, then I add something to it. It was that they could blend in perfectly into mankind, but they choose to be, uh, 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 call themselves Hungarian because there is one thing they couldn't get rid of, a thick English accent. So and since Hungarians have that, and me too, so <laughs> sorry for that. So actually, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, right, I'm going to talk about uh, actually how not to use a method that was invented by Wigner, the Jordan Wigner transformation. I can also tell some gossips about how this was invented later on if somebody is interested in a coffee break or during lunchtime. And uh, instead doing some other type of fermion to qubit mappings. And uh, I think our method is, uh, the main merit of our method is it's a very generic method and it also contains all the known and used uh, fermion to qubit mappings that, has, that is around in the, in the quantum simulation business. And, um, <coughs> And uh, actually, uh, this work was done for me being in Wigner and also in, in the algorithmic. It's a Finnish company, and it was done by Aaron Miller, myself, Stefan Necht, Sabrina Maniscalco, and Guillermo Garcia Perez. So let's start with the main idea. So, of course, I mean, one of the obvious uh, things that quantum computing is um, offering us, or at least there is a hope that it will offer us, would be to understand better the quantum world, that we can get out some numbers of the quantum world. And one of these things are like maybe to, to uh, do quantum chemical calculations better than what can be done with classical computers. Uh, and of course, in this case, in a typical, we have like a molecule here, uh, how we model it is basically looking at the Hamiltonian uh, acting on a fermionic, in the fermionic Fox space, and you will have two types of terms in that, like uh, the so-called one-body terms that are of the form AI dagger AJ, and the two-body terms that have two creation and two annihilation operators. And of course, uh, we all know the famous uh, anti-commutation relations that they obey the fermionic uh, commutation and anti-commutation relations. But usually, in quantum system, we are dealing with qubits, so not fermionic uh, quantum systems, although there is also some uh, ideas how to do directly fermionic quantum simulation with fermions, but I'm gonna now talk about mostly about, let's say, superconducting qubit 
experiments uh, you will see later on. And in that case, we have to map those N fermionic modes that describes, let's say, the relevant degrees of freedom in the molecule to N qubits. And, uh, in, and, and of course, we want then to find the ground state and then, uh, and then let's say, take the ground state energy, we maybe we want to uh, estimate that or some other physical quantity or an excited state and so on. And how would the mapping look like? Well, okay, how does, everybody knows how the, the Fock space looks like, and of course, a very good basis in the Fock space is that we take the Fock basis, uh, 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 sorry, the Fock vacuum, this will be the Fock basis, and then act with uh, a couple of uh, creation operators on it. So we can choose whether we act, we fill the first or the zeroth mode, so if we fill it, then we act with the A0 dagger, so here N0 would be one, and then whether we fill the, uh, the first mode, second mode, and so on. And in this case, uh, we get the so-called Fock basis, and we usually denote it by the occupation number. This is called the occupation number notation, like uh, of the Fock basis, whether we fill the, the zeros, the first, the second, and the N minus one mode. And obviously, this reminds me of what we are doing in quantum computing. We have an array of n qubits, and then uh, the computational basis there is 0, 1 of the first uh, uh, qubit, 0, 1 of the second qubit. So it, it looks very similar, and exactly that, what we could do is that we could simply map this type of occupation ba uh, number basis to a computational basis of the qubits, and then we could also transform this mapping on the operators. And this is exactly what is called the Jordan-Wigner transformation. That's another way of introducing the Jordan-Wigner transformation. This is not the usual way they introduce it. The usual way is that they directly introduce it on the operator levels, but this unitary would, Im uh, would actually induce exactly that transformation. Namely, uh, the ith, uh, on the ith mode, the, um, the annihilation operator is mapped to a, a, a string of Zs, this is the so-called infamous Jordan Wigner string, like uh, until the kth ith qubit, so like z0, z1 z times z2 until i minus one, and then the sigma i minus operators, which is, of course, you know, the lowering operator, and si uh, sim uh, similarly, the creation operator is, is the adjoint of that. And um, that's a really, it, it's, a, it's a very canonical mapping in some sense because of this property. However, and, and it has been used, of course, to solve systems exactly, let's say the uh, most usual, like the, the most paradigmatic model is the transfer field Ising model or the XY chain can be used uh, to like map a qubit model to a fermionic model which is free and then you can solve it. Um, but for quantum chemistry, as I will discuss, it's not so good because actually you will not get rid of these long Z strings and you have to, when you measure, you have to do a lot of uh, change of the measurement base and you will have a huge measurement overhead. So people don't like it. And what pe pe people have been then trying to come up with other schemes. Maybe one, the most famous scheme after the Jordan Wigner mapping is the bravi kitaev mapping. I mean, anyone, I have tried to understand the bravi kitaev mapping for a long time, and then I finally understood that, it, but it's, it's so complicated to understand. And I claim you that after this lecture, if you look into your paper, it will be super easy. That's how I understand it, actually, in our language, the best way. And actually, it gives you a much more favorable um, <coughs> average Z string length instead of N for a quantum chemistry problem, it will be log N. And uh, similarly, uh, the Google uh, quantum AI people have also come up with uh, such mappings with, with such, such a scaling in the Z strings. Right, so now I'm gonna introduce our mapping. First, for that, I want to say that the very uh, important tool here would be the Majorana operators. Using quantum chemistry, they don't 
really introduced these Magellan operators, but they are very useful tools. Of course, in condensed matter, yes, where you, do, you, don't, you don't have particle number conservation because models with intrinsically with Magellan operators usually don't have particle number conservation, but it's a very useful tool. And it's a very simple uh, uh, thing. So for each mode, let's say the jth mode, you assign two Magellan operators, let's say the M2J and the M2J plus one. In this way, they are like, uh, they are like uh, self-adjoint operators and they satisfy this very nice uh, uh, anti-commutation relation. So for each ij, mi and mj, anti-commutes, uh, or gives the identity if i, and equal, I is equal to j. Uh, sorry, like this, okay? So how, what, what, do, what should we do with, uh, how should we do a fermion to qubit mapping? The easiest uh, thing to do is to think of Pauli strings. So simple, uh, on, the, on the qubit level, simple strings of Paulis, like identities x, y, or z, so, uh, and tensor together. And one such, one such string should, should uh, be connected to one Majorana operator. So one Majorana operator should be, uh, <coughs> should be mapped to that. Uh, okay, however, then these different Pauli strings, if, if, the, I, uh, if the J is Majorana is mapped to SJ, then they should, uh, should uh, satisfy these anti-commutation relation. And such a mapping will be really a valid fermion to two qubit mapping if these SISJ operators, or, or all of these sets, these two N Pauli strings, uh, will be, um, <coughs> they will be uh, algebraically, linearly and algebraically independent. Right, and uh, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, I have to do this. And, and we are gonna introduce now a method that gives you this, and this is based on ternary trees, so now you maybe understand why I wrote bonsai, but I will come back to the word bonsai a little bit more, uh, more exactly later on. So basically what I, I want to do here is that, I hope you see it, is that I have a number of qubits in my system. Let's say I have 10 qubits here, and these zero, one, four, and those, they label the qubits. I, I somehow label a qubit, qubits with, with these numbers zero to 10, okay, so it's 11 uh, qubits then. And, uh, and then I want to create strings of my Majorana operators and wa I want to then uh, make them algebraically independent. So one way of doing it is to do a ternary tree, to, uh, to draw a ternary tree. Ternary tree means that there are, there is, uh, in, in our case, there is one ingoing leg or perhaps zero for the root and three outgoing legs, so in total four legs. And uh, that's why it's ternary. Okay, and then, uh, and then one of the outgoing legs is labeled with X, the other Y, and the third one Z. And then I get this tree, and, and then here is the tree, and then it has some leaves here, okay? And one of the leaves, it, ha it will have, uh, if I have 10 qubits, or, or N qubits, it will have 2N plus 1 leaves, which is not good because we want 2N operators, but there is always one leaf which goes along the z direction, which uh, we will discard. So then we will have 2n, 2n uh, <coughs> number of uh, um, strings, which I'm going to tell you how the strings will look like. It will look like that if I go, I go to this leaf, then this leaf will uh, denote uh, one of the strings. I call it now S8. I will tell you later how these numberings are are done, but these, uh, you can just think of them as arbitrary numbering now. This S8 string will be, you act with X operator on, on qubit zero, then you act with X operator again on qubit one, and X operator on qubit four. If you take S9, this one, then you act on, with X operator on qubit zero, X on qubit one, and then here it's the Y, uh, y leaf, uh, Y3 uh, branch, Y on, on four, or I can go to, let's say, for example, to this one, this S4, you act with Y on, on zero, because you label this as with Y, 
then x on 2, and then z to get this one. And everywhere else you act like identity for this S word. And now we could prove for such uh, trees the following uh, things that, uh, of course, uh, we have 2n plus 1 leaves, but now 1 is left out, so 2n leaves. And uh, uh, somehow I cannot reach my computer. OK, I don't know. Uh, uh, okay, so, so we can prove that, like, going here, okay, that actually they will all anti-commute and actually they will be algebraically independent. Even more, what we could prove is the following. So if we look at exactly this case that I showed, S4 was uh, Y0 times X2 times Z6. This is what I showed. And let's say S1 was... S1 is here, this one. That would be Y0, uh, uh, Z2, Z8, and Z10. So you will see. And all of these strings will be, if you take two strings, uh, they will anti-commute only in one position exactly. So either the Paulis are, uh, are not on the same position, or if they are on the same position, they are the same Paulis, so they... they uh, they uh, commute uh, with each other. So only in one position do they anti-commute. And what we could also uh, show that if you get uh, strings like this, you will always get uh, algebraically independent two n strings. So this produces a good mapping. OK, there are certain questions you can ask. For example, actually we asked uh, these questions, are all fermion to qubit mappings, which are of the form that I map a Majoran operator to a string like this? And then it turns out no, but in some sense, these will be the most, um, the easiest type of fermion to qubit mapping because, because uh, other fermions to qubit mappings, you would have to have, let's say, three anti commuting uh, Paulis such to produce an effective anti commutation between the strings. But we, we gave examples of such mappings as well. And the other question is okay, so how generic are these mappings? And, uh, and um, uh, and, and I, I go uh, quickly here be before. Actually, these mappings are pretty generic because the jordan Wigner mapping could be actually understood as this ternary tree. The parity mapping could be understood as this ternary tree. The Bravikitai mapping that I never understood by myself after that I understood <laughs> is this ternary tree and this uh, mapping by the uh, Google people, the JKM and, uh, mapping can be understood like that ternary tree. Like, uh, and, 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 uh, <coughs> and now I, there was one point I didn't mention. I, I, of course, gave you the strings. But also, <laughs> we want to uh, make the strings such that uh, we want to build up uh, uh, fermionic commutation and anti-commutation operators from them, and in a way that, uh, in, in a way that you want to match two Majoranas that will uh, produce one, uh, <coughs> one creation and one annihilation operator, and perhaps the best would be that if all uh, states that are uh, folk basis states are mapped to computational basis states, as in the journal Wigner mapping. If we want this extra uh, condition, we also have to pair the Majoranas in a good way. So then let me go back. Sorry, I have to. Yeah, uh, this is the, the, how the pairing should be done. That's why these numberings were so odd. So basically what we want to have is that uh, we, want to ha we want to create uh, strings of uh, Majoran operators that would which, which would be such that the vacuum of the of the Fock vector would re, uh, be mapped to the zero 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 state, and also that uh, that um, all the uh, all the states that are Fock basis states would be mapped to a computational basis state. And for that, for that, actually, what uh, how we should do that is that we should have the two j's and the two and the two j plus one 
string, should, so we should label them with these numbers in such a way that S2J plus I times S2J plus one actually uh, deletes the, the, the zero, zero, zero state, so the qubit vacuum. This is the condition for that. And uh, we found how to do it, actually. We can always take any ternary tree. We have to just uh, lay, uh, make the labels in a nice way. And basically, the labels uh, we should do like in, in the following way. Namely, if we would take, mm, let me uh, look at, let's say, S, S10 and S11. I can, can, I can uh, give th those. Basically, we should follow like, uh, like I take S10, and, and who should I pair this uh, Majorana with? So I should follow, here is the link, the X up to I have X here, and then whenever I don't have X, so after qubit one, I have a Y. Actually, after that, uh, if thi this was X, then this has to be Y after that. Um, and and uh, so after, uh, so th for each qubit, we have to follow down after they go out from the X-link. Uh, we, we follow down uh, the X-link and then repeat the same step but with the Y-link. And for the, for the Zs, we actually we, we map the Zs uh, to themselves. It's a little bit complicated procedure. Maybe I should actually skip it because I would just um, uh, be... Uh, confused. I'm trying to reach my computer. <laughs> okay, perfect. perfect. Uh, no, this was. Actually, let me go down. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I go down here. Okay. Okay. So we were here that that you could see that all uh, paradigmatic mappings as ternary trees has been uh, done uh, can be uh, formulated in terms of these ternary trees. So now comes an important point the jordan wigner strings. Now they are not anymore jordan wigner strings, but what is the, for, for, for one Majorana operators, what is the average uh, number of uh, Paulis that you represent, uh, yeah, Paulis in the Pauli monomial that you represent uh, uh, one Majorana with, what is the Pauli weight? And actually, this will be nothing else than the typical length of the, of, of the, of, of the, of the, the leaves, like, like basically the depth of the tree. So if you want to have uh, mappings which are such that uh, you will have uh, a small Pauli weight, you have to cut them all the trees, like a bonsai, that's why we call it like that, and they have to branch all the time, and we, you cut it, cut it, and you don't, you don't want like a long and tall tree, like for the Jordan Wigner, but like short trees, bonsai trees, that's what you want for quantum chemistry at least. Okay, and uh, I mean, we can go a little bit more deeper into this. Um, so, so you could ask, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, how, how, how many, on, on if you look at, let's say, the occupation number operator, uh, then how, on how many qubits is it distributed, and, and you can easily see that um, if, if, with the procedure where we were, we were um, pairing the uh, pairing the majoranas. They are on different, let's say, uh, leaves. Then the length of the first leaf plus the length of the second leaf plus one, where, from which they branch. That will be the length of this operator. Before they branch, of course, they are cancelled. And if 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 you are in the same uh, branch, then basically, it's occupation. It's the length. It's the length of that leaf. So now we can the average delocalization of the occupation number uh, can be obtained by following the z path, basically. And uh, so if we have this average occupation number, then what we can still play with is uh, is the is is how heterogeneous we want to the uh, these. Uh, Pauli weights to be for each Majoranas. For example, if you have a system, a chemi chemical Hamiltonian, where certain Majoranas or certain occupation numbers or certain uh, creation operators are, are dominant in the Hamiltonian, perhaps you want to have them a, a shorter length, while others should have a, a, a longer length. 
and also we can uh, uh, look how we can, this can also be combined with the architecture of our, of our uh, quantum computer because obviously uh, we have usually not all to all connectivity, so it, it's better if you have strings that are sort of like connected in the, in the uh, also with respect to the topology of the, the quantum computer. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm gonna discuss now. So, for example, typical superconducting qubit architecture, actually favored by uh, IPM, is the heavy hexagon topology. You can see it here. And uh, if you want to uh, have uh, the, with the Jordan-Wigner mapping, if you take two, a two mode operator, let's say, the zero and the 36, which is, you can say, okay, I'm, it's, it's too very far away, but you can also take zero and, and 16, and you will have a little bit similar uh, effects. So a two mode Hamiltonian or two mode operation, if you want to act with a unitary, would have actually strings that would be all over the, this architecture. And for a four mode operator, the same. So can we choose it in a better way with, with our mappings? And uh, right, yes. So first of all, what we should do is to take a, a, a spanning tree or a qubit spanning tree on this topology, which I show here. And actually the spanning tree should be our ternary trees. In this case, it's perfect because actually this can map perfectly the spanning tree to a ternary tree. And use this architecture and if we use this, then, um, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, yes, then uh, you will see how much better, uh, yeah, how much better the bonsai generated strings are. They don't go along uh, the full uh, computer architecture. Actually, we take now the worst one here from 0 to 36 or 0 to 34 would be much better, but the worst one for the bonsai is this. It's not all over the architecture. It's actually a connected line. And even a four-mode operation, it's not so bad as for the, for the, <coughs> for the Jordan Wigner. And if you look at bigger uh, quantum computers and bigger uh, fermionic systems, our method would be way favored compared to the Jordan Wigner. Uh, operation. Uh, I have to go very close to my computer. Yes, so uh, I, I want to a little bit discuss our results. So first of all, uh, I think our framework is good because you get a intuitive understanding of fermion to qubit mappings that are there in the literature. So for me, the bravi kitaev mapping made sense after I saw it in the bonsai picture. I didn't expect this, by the way. Uh, but, but in this standard tree picture, then I, I, I understood it better. So I think even if you don't work with exactly our framework, to write it down in our framework could give you an understanding of uh, how things work out. And, uh, and besides doing the Majorana mappings, of course, if you want to have uh, that each uh, folk basis state is mapped to um, a separable state, so, uh, so a computational basis state, uh, uh, we, we have to make these pairings. This is my second point. But these pairings can be made for arbitrary uh, ternary tree. So that's a good point. And, uh, and in this way, the Pauli weight and the occupation distribution in qubit space can be controlled. Um, you, can, um, <coughs> you can play around which are the important uh, uh, modes, and you can make them. Uh, uh, lower Pauli weight, the non-important, uh, uh, um, have a bigger Pauli weight, and 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 um, and in in this way we get uh, an algorithm that generates in a hardware Taylor mapping uh, uh, some some good mappings. And the har hardware tailored way was of course what I showed with the heavy hexagon. And, and let me give you a couple of additional comments here. So. <coughs> Uh, uh, yes, so one of the important things that we realized that these mappings are 
why did we introduce these mappings? O our original problem was that if you have those long strings and you want to measure expectation values of a lot of long strings that are overlapping, you have to use a lot of measurement uh, settings and there, there will be a huge measurement overhead. That was one of our, our original issue and why we wanted to have this. But it also turned out that it's super good also for the compilation. To do a compilation uh, with, with such a mapping, so do, let's say, a unitary copper cluster VQE and, and compile that VQE, this will be much easier with, with our, our mapping. So it, it actually you gain both, uh, both in, uh, for the compilation you gain a, a a lot of uh, space, like you, you have to have a, a much uh, smaller number of C nodes, and also in the measurement. And the second point I want to make, which is not here, is that going from one mapping to another can be always done with a Clifford operation. That's also, we realized when we were working this out. So actually, if we would have a fault tolerant com quantum computer, and for some reason, the compilation would be better in one of the mappings, while the measurement would be better in, in another mapping. For a fault tolerant quantum computer, a Clifford mapping is very cheap. We could just go over with the Clifford. So this is also an important point. So, and with that, I also close this, uh, sorry, like this, so thanks. And yeah, you can uh, read our paper, which is an archive and hopefully published soon. Thank you. That was efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have questions, but um, um, I defer to you all first. Um, I, I, since I don't see any at the moment. Uh, one question, the, uh, the Google people coding when you depicted them. Yeah. Uh, so the difference with yours is essentially the assignment of the uh, tags? No, no. So the, what the Google people did was actually one of the, let's call it this one particular uh, ternary tree, which is actually optimal. By the way, also the Bravik type is rather optimal that they have log n depth, but they never investigated uh, how to do, um, how to do, let's say, uh, more, make it hardware efficient, so tailor it to the hardware, because then actually you shouldn't do exactly this. We checked. Uh, what would happen if we would put this on the heavy hexagon, and it's less good than what, 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 uh, how we are doing with the spanning tree uh, method. So we are also, uh, and we can all, and, and the other difference is that also, uh, I mean, with this more generic method, you can also uh, make uh, the Pauli weight smaller on the important modes. So I mean, if you look here, sorry for this, in the, in, in, in this case, ah. Uh, so it's almost, in this case, because it's a small heavy hexagon, it's almost like a, well, actually it's not almost like a, a, the Google people's, because it's actually d much deeper, but it, it, it reflects more the topology uh, here. And, and we, uh, we argue here actually, the, if you look in the, in the big uh, limit, um, we, we actually say that we should have this mapping, this, turn, uh, this mapping, this um, uh, spanning tree mapping, and in th this case, the average uh, length of the strings will not be log n, but square root of n. However, in the compilation, uh, it, you will have much better with the square root of n, because even if it's log n, you will have, uh, you will have lots of uh, compilation issues because you have to do the swaps, and the swaps will, will kill you. It's much better doing the square root of n. So that's also very different from the Google's people approach. Uh, hello, thanks Hi. a lot for the call, talk. I thought that was super interesting. Uh, I would like to ask about the um, hardware uh, specific mappings. Yes. So um, is there any way in which your algorithm is uh, optimal for that task? Because uh, I imagine that in this hexagonal, uh, hexagonal case, it seems that it maps really well on the Turner trees, but maybe if you had like a square lattice or something like that, is there any way in which you can the, like the, squ the square lattice is still okay. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because the coordination number is four, and usually we can map that one of them is an ingoing and, and three of them is an outgoing. If you would have bigger coordination number, then we would have issues. But the square lattice, we have some work on that later, but, but, but it's, still, uh, it's still pretty good. And okay. I know in here in Open Super Q Plus, we want to have square lattices, so. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Uh, and is there, um, like, in what sense is it optimal then? Like, is there any uh, theory of merit? Uh, yes, so, so, so I mean, w w uh, look, or there are two uh, ways of, of saying optimality. One way is uh, on the measurement side, like uh, how many measurement settings do you need to have to, uh, th there the topology doesn't make too much, uh, there that the topology is not that a big effect, so how many measurements, settings you have to use to uh, get all the data uh, uh, yeah, all the data. I mean, of course, you can also do some POVMs and uh, IC POVMs, and then this question is less relevant, but that could be one question. And other one is the compilation question. Uh, like, and in the compilation, the topology is super important. Like, like uh, because, because if, if, if you have like a small Pauli weight, but those Paulis are far away in the coupling graph, you have to use swap, or I mean, we have also other, I mean, there is also more clever al algorithms than swaps, but still it's going to go l linearly with the uh, Manhattan distance between, in that topology between the, 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 the different, uh, let's say, uh, uh, <coughs> qubits. So, so th that's where it's, in the compilation it plays a big role. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Thank you, Falcon, for, uh, for the talk. Um, I, I have a question. Have you also considered, because there is another, another map from fermion to, uh, to uh, qubits, yeah. uh, that is the, was made by uh, Tirak and Verstraete. Uh, have you also compared with this one? Because uh, I think the advantage of this is that the, the locality of the Hamiltonian is preserved. Uh, yes, for certain Hamiltonians. I know that mapping. That's actually a very cool mapping. By the way, it's also very ternary in, in some sense. We didn't look into it, but, but that mapping is very much uh, tailored to uh, condensed matter systems. Actually, we haven't looked it deeply, but I know from my previous studies this, uh, this mapping, and I think for quantum chemistry, it will not be. It, 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 like, a like if you have a, a Fermi-Hubbard model, then it's a very good mapping, but for a quantum chemistry where you have all types of uh, creation and annihilation operators acting together, I think that it's not such a good mapping. It's more for the Fermi Hubbard. Or, I mean, we, I, maybe I remember not so well, we can discuss it, but this is what I thought. Uh, if I may, uh, actually, it's on, on, on that particular note, what about the applicability of your mappings precisely to the condensed matter, exactly so what models? Uh, okay, so. Okay, that's a great, uh, the, so the exactly solvable models, we, we obviously we asked this question and we want to perhaps, we never pursued it deeply, but that's the, that maybe because the Jordan Wigner gave you one set of exactly solvable models, the XY chain, the Ising chain, maybe these also give some, and actually there is some, by the way, there is some in the condensed matter community in this uh, exactly solvable condensed, there is some work going around about Hamiltonians that have a spectrum which is pre-fermionic, they call it like hidden free fermionic model. So maybe that could be a good, we just didn't have time. And your other, and the condensed matter model, well, for quantum simulation though, I think it's, this is not tailored really for condensed matter if I'm honest. This is more for quantum chemistry, for the quantum simulation side. But for the exactly solvable models, I agree that's a great, uh, this could be a great tool. Yeah. Starting, I mean, you could look at Pot's model by yeah. using this idea with higher dimensionality as well with cute bits. I always that that question. Uh -huh. So, what for cute bits? What would you do? And for anions, this is the questions I usually get when I give this talk. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you very much, Sultan, for giving an intuition for the Bravi Kita F transformation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, so my question is. Uh, this um, this an, an encoding for uh, fermions into qubits. Yeah. I wonder if you could use this encoding to add some redundancy and introduce some error correction yeah. or something. That's a great question. Um, 
Mm. That, that's actually a great question, whether this map, whether what happens, because uh, this mapping, this is a perfect observation, this is a non-redundant mapping. So we have n qubits, n fermions. And often for error correction, or even, let's say, error mitigational type of, or, or error checking, even error checking, it, it's more useful to do uh, more sparse mapping. Let's say that you have typically, typically, n fermions to two n qubits. That's a typical thing also. Bravi has a mapping like that. Um, it's, I mean, it's on one of my agendas, but uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna pursue this. I hope to pursue it in one way. I don't know, but it's a great question. We have thought about this, I have thought about this, and probably that's a winning strategy to make it more sparse. But, uh, yeah. Questions? If not, we're a bit ahead of time. Yeah. But uh, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, let's uh, thank uh, Zoltan again. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Xue Ban. I come from Technalia. So today I will show uh, what we have done and what we are doing in quantum computing in Technalia. So first of all, thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present our work. So I will show you these outlines. So the first three parts are related to the academia part. <coughs> which we uh, apply the quantum control in quantum computing. The first one is to uh, connect meta learning, DC uh, digitized quantum diabetic quantum optimization. And the second one, I will show you some our results on the digital quantum simulation and the circuit learning. And the third one, I will show you some something about uh, quantum machine learning and what we have achieved, uh, how to speed up the quantum perceptual, and uh, some results that we are doing now about the expressivity of quantum neural network. And the last one is, I cannot show this point. Oh, oh really? But how can I see this? Oh, okay. But, but the point, uh, okay. Okay, okay, it doesn't matter. And the last uh, part is some application for the in industry. 
Uh, in Technalia, we have some opportunity to hear the requirements from some clients in the industry. So people are quite interested in the beam packaging problem. So we would like to solve this problem uh, by using some uh, hybrid classical quantum methods. Whoops. Yeah, first of all, and I show you this picture that I like it uh, very much about the uh, NISC era. So because everybody knows that uh, because we are in the NISC era, so there are uh, some limitation to achieve quantum advantage. So a bit due to the noise, uh, we have to make some op optimization in the circuit, like to make the circuit depth shorter. So how to do this? For me, uh, originally, I come from the field of quantum control, so I would like to apply some quantum control method to improve this. So here, the, I show you the a very conventional digitized adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, so it, actually, this uh, Hamiltonian evolution, time evolution, uh, comes from the initial Hamiltonian HI to HF. So in principle, any computational problem can be encoded. And, uh, but it requires quite a long time, so it's quite uh, vulnerable to the decoherence. So how can we uh, do some improvement, just to maybe shorten the time to evaluate your system? and then uh, get the results from the adiabatic uh, process. So we use this, uh, actually we call it shortcuts to adiabaticity. Uh, actually, I, I have applied this method not in, only in, in quantum computing. I have used this to control the spin qubit and charge qubit in semiconductor quantum dots and quantum wires, something. But here I feel it's quite a, a uh, useful to use this counter diabetic driving. So uh, originally, this was the uh, put forward by Barry, Michael Barry, this transitionless quantum driving. But uh, actually, uh, this requires um, a lot of prior knowledge. Uh, we have to write down the eigenstate of the system. So how to uh, find it in a, a very to find uh, the counter diabetic driving term in a very easy way. So we use the uh, nested commutator here the, the, on the right part, this A lambda L. And then actually this is just uh, our approximate of your gauge potential. So this means you have to expand uh, your approximated uh, gauge potential into high order, then finally you can approximate your exact uh, counter-diabatic term. So in the circuit, uh, actually uh, now you can see that uh, we have to use this, uh, the, the green block HCD term in the circuit, and then uh, we use add, by adding this CD driving term, uh, we can get some advantage, that is to make your uh, circuit depths shorter, then you can achieve the results from adiabatic uh, quantum computing. So here I show you very simple results about single spin. So you can see that uh, uh, with CD driving, counter diabetic driving, you can achieve quite a high uh, fidelity for just a single spin. And for, for single spin, it's very easy. You can find the exact, uh, exact uh, results, analytical one. But for, for more complicated systems, then uh, actually we can use the, the method that I mentioned, the counter diabetic uh, uh, nested commutator counter diabetic driving. And then you will see that uh, for higher with higher order nest commutative term, you can have higher fidelity. So this is for the uh, digital counter-diabetic driving for QAOA. 
So we have the answers, answers for the uh, conventional content budget driving term, and we add another term, UCD. This is from the nested competitor. And here, this provides you some freedom to choose uh, the uh, content debugging uh, term that uh, is easily to be impl implemented. So actually, we, we would like to find some uh, new application or new uh, field about uh, this DC QAOA. So we want to uh, combine uh, the classical machine learning. This is the meta learning. Uh, why we use meta learning? So from uh, actually from from the point of view of QAOA, we find that uh, uh, it's a challenging of a local minimization. So it, it, when you train your uh, circuit, uh, it's easy to uh, uh, fall into the local minimization. So how to solve this problem? We set uh, suitable initial parameters uh, that can be uh, quite close to your global minimum. So the, this meta learning actually can help to do this. Uh, so we use the recurrent neural network as a black box optimizer to train and find a good uh, initial uh, QAOA parameters. So the, from the point of view of machine learning, this is kind of like a transfer learning. It gives you the uh, previous information, and then it can uh, make your iteration uh, shorter. So here I show the results for three regular unweighted max cut, complete uh, weighted max cut problem, and for the SK model, you can see that uh, by using meta learning. And our iteration times can be quite uh, well shortened. Um, uh, this, uh, the details, maybe you can also refer to Pranav's uh, poster in the afternoon. Another one is that uh, we also combine the algorithm uh, aware qubit mapping for DC Q, uh, QAOA. So the, this method, uh, algorithm aware qubit mapping, uh, this can tackle the challenge of qubit mapping by offering effective and efficient solutions. So actually here, I show you two examples. One is use ZY CD driving. The other one is use uh, both ZY and YZ CD drivings. So this is an uh, ongoing work. And we hope that uh, uh, finally the, the circuit depths can be shortened. Okay, this is the first part. The second part is to uh, do something in digital quantum simulation. So uh, because I come from the field of quantum control, I would like to see some advantage uh, coming from the digital quantum simulation in the circuit for quantum control. So here I show you uh, our work on the time optimal uh, quantum driving by variational circuit learning. Uh, so this is a harmonic oscillator. We want to achieve the final state by changing omega t. So we would like to see how, how short the time uh, that we can achieve the, to see the quantum speed limit. So the initial state is prepared by the quantum Fourier transformation. Um, and this, this is actually, I, I show you this uh, circuit that can uh, do like uh, the implementation of splitting, splitting operator method. And here we use three different uh, cost functions. The first one is infidelity. And the second one is Burr's uh, angles. This, this is like a, uh, to show you the distance between your target state and your final state. And finally, we use fidelity susceptibility. So this quantifies the sensitivity of the fidelity with respect to your variation of your uh, control function. 
and we get quite good result for here. And uh, from this plot, uh, the upper right one, we can clearly see that uh, uh, the phase transition and uh, the, there is a bond. You can see the black uh, upper half part and the bright uh, half part, the, the bond. Actually, this bond uh, coincides well with the uh, operation time derived from optimal bond bond control. Um, we see that uh, actually in, in th this point, this time is about uh, 3.15. And we can see from, from the uh, variation of our uh, energy, we can see this uh, a transition point quite clear. The, the other work is that we use uh, circuit learning to generate a coherent state. So this coherent state, actually, we can uh, expand the uh, operators, AA dagger, into uh, poly strings. And then uh, we can uh, just uh, digitalize it in, in the circuit. And we find that uh, from the circuit, our coherent state coincides well with the uh, uh, portion dis distribution in Fox space. And also, we, in the circuit, we use different ansatz, like uh, uh, hardware efficient ansatz and uh, uh, check for uh, board uh, ansatz. And we can find also quite good fidelity there. So this is a very simple work, but uh, this uh, inspires us quite well to do the quantum control in the digital circuit. So actually, we are now uh, trying to find uh, optimized ansatz uh, for the eigenstates of different uh, molecules and materials like graphene in, in 2D or other 2D dimension, two dimension uh, materials. So <clears throat> and you can find um, or more details also from Julian and uh, Iniak's poster. And then we also do some uh, optimization of dynamics in the, in, in the topological insulators. So we, we are now doing uh, edge state transfer in SSH model. And we really find that by using circuit learning, it's quite easy to get uh, your counter-diabatic driving term, and much easier than, than uh, do it analogly. So this is quite, I, I think it's quite a good advantage to do so. And also, we would like to digitize, uh, uh, digitally simulate a non hermitian uh, physics. Uh, then this is quite uh, also uh, feasible in, in the circuit. So uh, uh, the third part is I want to transfer a bit into quantum machine learning. Uh, also. This part comes from also from the idea of uh, shorten the time of your operation of your perceptron. So actually, this quantum perceptron is the building block of your quantum neural network. So here, uh, uh, for the uh, quantum version of neural network, actually, it's quite similar uh, to the classical one. So uh, we have the perceptron, the red dot. And this is connected to, uh, to the previous neurons. So actually, the, this perception is uh, represented by our unitary transformation, this U. And we would like to speed up this uh, response time so that uh, in your uh, physical application implementation, uh, the coherence can be avoided. So uh, actually, we tried uh, to use uh, inverse engineering to, to bound the initial and the final states. And then we find the optimal driving. No. Doesn't want me to. Okay.
Oh. No, no, no. I, I want to go back. Yeah. OK, so we need to design this neural potential. Yeah, so this neural potential actually, <coughs> uh, uh, it's like uh, the, the e it's in Hamiltonian, like uh, xj. So it described your uh, uh, interaction between your perceptual and uh, the neurons in the previous layer. However, we can also add another uh, multi-qubit interaction term, uh, which is this uh, omega m, this term. And with the presence of this term, actually, we can reduce the network depths and uh, hardware connectivity and also decrease the operation time and the, the coherence in influence. So this kind of potential actually has been already implemented uh, theoretically or experimentally in different systems. So like uh, here I show you in the superconducting qubits and also in the nonlinear optics um, uh, in, in trapped ions. Uh, it, I would like to mention this because this can be uh, implemented up to six qubits in experiments. So with the presence of this neural potential, actually we can shorten uh, the, uh, the, the, the depths of the neural network. To do, I, I show you very simple uh, examples. What happened? Yes, yes, thank you. So, so to, to search prime number from zero to seven, uh, you need to use classical neural network with, yeah, uh, with one hidden layer of one neuron and if you use the quantum neural network with two qubit interaction, so you also use one hidden layer with one neuron. Uh, but now if we add this multi-qubit uh, interaction term in the neural potential, and we find that uh, we don't need any hidden layer there. Also, for the quantum gates, we also tried uh, uh, C0 gate, Toffoli uh, gate, Friday the King gate. And we find that uh, actually we also don't need hidden layer. So this part is for the uh, multi-qubit neural potential. So th this is kind of uh, to simulate your uh, perceptual, which has a sigmoid-like uh, response. We would also like to see the uh, effects from, from entanglement. So how to do this? Uh, actually, here we ex uh, analytically derive the expressivity of the neural network, quantum neural network. And then uh, we use the model of data re-uploading quantum neural network. So the data is processed by subsequent layers there. And we also add the entanglement in each layer. And then we find that So th th this, this is the uh, very standard uh, variational quantum circuit. So actually we put our data set there uh, in the layer, uh, in each layer, and put it into the uh, unitary transformation and get uh, the output state and uh, via the measurement uh, by using different kinds of uh, observable M and then we can minimize the output, uh, the difference between the output and the target, and then get new uh, parameters there. So here I show you that uh, we, uh, we find that neural network layers rely on the numbers of applied uh, operations. For each layer, we have this kind of uh, implementation, uh, Rx rotation, Ry rotation, and then, uh, because you need entanglement there, we add the, this entangled gate, which gets maximum 
maximal uh, entanglement there. And then we can uh, very easily derive uh, uh, the, the output of the neural network from your uh, uh, unitary operator. And here I show you two very important uh, parameters. This NH actually is the number of non-vanishing expansion coefficients because we want to expand our output of the neural network into the partial Fourier series. So this NH is very important. Uh, this NH, this number, uh, represents the number of uh, non-zero expansion coefficients. And the other one, MP, is the number of tunable parameters. So this is related to your, uh, the number of your layers and number of your uh, qubits that you choose. So uh, I show you these two plots. The left one is without entanglement. The right one is with entanglement. So you can see that uh, with entanglement, the number of NH, these uh, number of non-vanishing expansion coefficients tripled. So we can see that uh, the expressivity is enhanced. And also, I, I show you that uh, uh, in different cases, different numbers of qubits and uh, layers, uh, this NH, uh, and we can see that uh, because we use entanglement, the number of NH non-zero uh, coefficients increase. And, and importantly is that we need to see the ratio between NH and NP put them into the same uh, benchmark line. And then we see that uh, this re uh, red line, uh, actually it includes four cases. Without entanglement, um, uh, it includes the qubits with two, three, four, five. So this means without entanglement, actually this ratio does not change. The expressivity does not change. However, if you uh, add entanglement there, you will see that uh, this ratio uh, change exponentially uh, when you increase the number of your qubits. So the, the upper plot shows that uh, we uh, generate a very uh, randomly uh, function there. And uh, uh, this, by using the uh, data re-uploading neural network, just only one qubit, we can approximate it quite well. However, if you increase the number of your layers, then you can approximate uh, your target function with higher uh, accuracy. And also we compare the case uh, with entanglement and with, uh, without entanglement. So the, the blue line shows that the, the results with entanglement, so we can get higher accuracy. So this is the part of uh, quantum machine learning, quantum neural network. Actually, we find that uh, uh, if we use more a uh, method from, uh, from quantum control, actually we can uh, boost uh, both uh, the development of quantum computing and quantum control. So the last part, uh, last but not least, is the industrial application. So uh, in our work, we can hear, we have the opportunity to hear the clients from industry. So they are quite, uh, uh, caring about uh, this problem, being a packing problem for them. Uh, it's like a, a, a daily task to, to, to transport your uh, products. So how to solve this problem? Uh, my colleagues have done this uh, hybrid content classical heuristic for the beam packing problem. Th this is for the 1D problem. And actually, the, the, there are two main subroutines. The first one is the, for the quantum annealing algorithm. So it, it's like to uh, execute many times to sample the feasible configuration of items in a single beam. 
And then uh, the second part is to uh, do it in a classical subroutine. So this can optimally uh, combine the previous lists of uh, feasible subsets. So this is for the 1D case. And recently, we also consider some hybrid approach to solve 3D case, which is quite challenging. Uh, so we, we consider different uh, characteristics that uh, cared by clients. So here I show you some like a package being dimensions, overweight re restrictions, affinities among different uh, item categories and the preference for time or item ordering. So we have to write down uh, different constraints. Uh, um, firstly, we need to do some uh, make some objectives to minimize the total amount of beans, to minimize the average height of the items for, for the odd beans, and uh, minimize the distance between the items and desired center of mass. And then uh, we need some, also consider some intrinsic uh, restrictions. So here I show you, we, we, we do some restrictions like uh, item orientation. So because for each bin, each item has only one uh, orientation. And then uh, also we consider some bin boundary conditions, so which are very uh, realistic uh, restrictions. And also we consider like uh, overweight restrictions, affinities among different package categories. So something cannot be packed uh, with others, so we have to uh, take care of this. And also the, for the preference for in, in relative positioning and loading balancing. So consider different kinds of constraints here. I show you different uh, resolution for, for, for different instances. Actually, we have solved uh, more than 12 instances. Um, mm, mm, and the problem has been modeled as uh, here I show you this CQM, which is uh, lib CQM provided by D-Wave. Okay. So in this talk, I show you different branches of quantum computing what, of what, what we are doing now in Technalia. So here, for the three parts, I show you the quite uh, academia things about uh, uh, optimizing QAOA and uh, what we are doing for the quantum, digital quantum simulations for materials for, for, for different uh, kinds of molecules. And then I show you the, uh, our, our work on, on quantum neural network. And finally, I show you the industrial application. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I, I admit I felt rather challenged by the overweight restrictions. But uh, anyway, um, questions? Okay, I saw in the second part something about simulating non-emission physics. Can yes. you expand a bit on that? Like, what's the goal and uh, how are you doing that, maybe? I yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are that. doing this. Uh, we are trying, firstly, to implement how to do this Hamiltonian uh, implementation in circuits. And then uh, also the density matrix, master equation there. And we want to... Uh, focus on the uh, topological insulator, and then we, we find some skin effect there, and we, we see that uh, actually if we use digitized uh, circuit learning, um, uh, you can find the exact solution in, with respect to your uh, systematic errors, your noise. So previously, without using this, 
usually what I do, what I did is to find a, a solution without uh, the, uh, the presence of your noise. So and put it in into the case with noise. However, here with circuit learning, you can find the exact uh, solution there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the for the talk. I have a question, a general question for you, uh, because uh, quantum neural networks or neural networks are very high, are highly nonlinear uh, systems, mm -hmm. uh, while quantum mechanics is extremely linear. In which sense do you expect uh, to have any advantage from quantum in the application of neural networks with respect to classical? Well, well, th this is quite a yeah, tough question. Uh, actually. I would say, from my point of view, it's not very clear to see the quantum advantage right now. But maybe because we are in the NISC era, uh, the hardware, uh, some, 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 some uh, not, not in perfection in, in quantum hardware, so maybe make some barriers for us to achieve quantum advantage. But I'm still optimistic. Maybe in the future, we, if we can produce more precisely controlled, bigger uh, scale quantum hardware processor, then we can achieve that. Um, about that, I, I remember when I read the paper by Eric and uh, and, and Juanjo on the perceptron, I was yeah. I had exactly that problem. If 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 I could go to the beam packing problem, um, where would you? Sh yes, this table. Uh, actually, yeah, um, I am amazed at the number of constraints. W w what's this like? I mean, what, what kind of? I don't have any feel for that. Can you can you give, provide us some? Yeah, yeah, it's very complicated. You have to uh, take care of different uh, constraints here. And uh, just because you, you need to, maybe here I show you, uh, yeah, uh, besides these objectives, you have to take care of the restrictions, and then you need a lot of parameters there, uh, really a lot. But uh, with the wave, this QM, you can solve this. More questions? If not, I think we are early, but um, it's a um, good time to have uh, Okay, so yes, so the so lunch is going to come forward a bit, so we can be discussing over over lunch. Uh, thank you all for all the questions, and uh, obviously the let us thank all the uh, um, speakers from this morning, and uh, we'll convene after lunch. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm Jonas Kavanis from VTT. Uh, first speaker of the session is uh, Max Deminghaus, and he will talk about uh, experimental optimal control of superconducting qubits. So, please. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Jonas. Uh, thanks also for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so, my talk is very much a bit on the lower level of the talks that we heard before, so I will be talking about how we actually control qubits and how what we can do in terms of optimal control to uh, implement the operations that we want as accurately as possible. Um, and since I've been told that most people here work more in applications, I'm, uh, I have inserted a couple of slides that kind of bridge the gaps um, to actually understand how we implement the controls and implement operations on these qubits. So uh, I typically start just by quickly reintroducing what kind of uh, we are dealing with and then also what the problems are of the, of the implementation that we are using here. So, I mean, we know that we kind of, to get to the superconducting qubits, we start typically with this uh, LC uh, resonator circuit, which creates these harmonic oscillators, which of course doesn't work as a qubit. And uh, to, to kind of turn it into a qubit, we replace the inductance here by this nonlinear inductance element, which we know as the Josephson junction. And then what happens in the la energy landscape here that is, uh, is that this square potential uh, turns into a cosinusoidal potential, which then introduces a uh, shift of the upper energy levels here, where now from the fully um, equidistant energy states here, uh, we introduce an anharmonicity where the, uh, the further higher up the transitions are, the more detuned they become, they become to the uh, initial qubit transition. Uh, and the qubit we encode here in the ground state and the first excited state of this new um, energy landscape of the circuit. Um, and here we can already see uh, kind of one of the problems of this architecture is uh, so that this anomalicity is actually not extremely large. So it's typically about 10% or so or less or 5% of the uh, target frequency that we want to encode. Um, which means that as you try and implement fast controls, you will get a wide spectral addressing and you might have spurious addressing of this transition as well. So that's one of the things that we try and solve with optimal control is also well established in the community by now. Um, for superconducting qubits, what we're typically targeting for the qubit transition frequency is something on the order of five gigahertz, which if you convert it to a, te a temperature and uh, a, a, a uh, residual population resulting from a temperature it puts you in the range of a several tens to 100 millikelvin. And that's also the reason why we put these things in dilution refrigerators to then uh, reduce the uh, residual photon level that uh, serves as an excitation process in your system. And so that we have a well-defined ground state, we need to have a cold environment here. Um, here you can see what these circuits then typically look like when they are done. So this is one of the more basic implementations where you have here these two capacitor pads uh, implement this capacitive thing. Um, and in between those, we have these junction elements, uh, which are then implementing the quantum nature here and uh, allow us to encode the qubit subspace. Putting this into the perspective of the full setup. So uh, now we host these chips, chips, as I said, in these dilution refrigerator units which then allow us to, to cool it down to 10 millikelvin so that we have a low residual excitation level in the qubits. And these are then addressed and controlled by microwave lines that we directly plug into these chips. Uh, of course, readout functions the same way. I'll not focus on that too much today. Then, of course, if you have the, the connection established, you need to generate your microwave signals. And this we do with these kind of uh, dedicated instruments here, which uh, you instruct uh, from the top level by either quantum circuits or a slightly uh, lower level where you can then uh, program your pulses to, to implement certain control operations that might not be covered in um, the, the gate set that you, are, you have typically, uh, typically available in something like Hiskit or so. And this is in the lab where we typically work at. Um, and then we kind of uh, of course, close the loop by reading out the readout signal and uh, interpret what we have seen or what we have programmed on these quantum computers. So how qubit control actually works is kind of uh, that we want to have a very well-defined amplitude and phase of the control signals such that we can deterministically control the energy that we actually uh, put onto the qubit circuit. 
And this is done uh, in, in for, so the, the, bed, the implementation that has been working for some time now is this um, IQ modulation setup where to kind of um, synchronize your drive with the qubit, you, look, you use a continuous wave local oscillator and you modulate and simultaneously gate this uh, local oscillator by an arbitrary waveform generator which implements the actual control pulses that you would want to send to the qubits. And by having this two component uh, modulation here, you can actually um, add these uh, signals such that you get uh, finally a single target frequency and you can still fully control the phase and the amplitude uh, at the resolution that the arbitrary waveform generator allows you to do. So by encoding this into an uh, in-phase and the quadrature component here, you can implement an arbitrary pulse shape with an arbitrary phase ramp or frequency that you would like to be passed to the qubits. And then, so if we then move into the frame of the qubit, so we know that the qubit, of course, rotates in uh, the lab frame at the qubit frequency, if you view it in this block sphere. And this is exactly uh, what we synchronize when using the local oscillator. So by synchronizing the, uh, the, the final drive frequency here with the qubit frame, we can make the uh, rotating state of the qubit stationary, and then we move into the so-called qubit frame with the, what you know as the rotating wave approximation. And in this frame, we can then manipulate the stationary state by using the rest of the controls that we have available. So for instance, um, by just changing the phase of this, uh, of this um, drive frequency here, we can rotate the frame here about the z-axis, which lets us implement a virtual z-gates, which can be instantaneous and uh, virtually error-free. Uh, so that covers the uh, rotation about the z-axis here, and you know this in a, in a circuit rest representation is typically known as a, a z-gate. Uh, to implement then X and Y gates, um, we actually have to um, put a pulse to the qubit. Uh, now I'm omitting the modulation frequency. We are assuming a synchronized frame here. And so if you were to now put a uh, envelope on the in-phase component only here, and uh, typically we use uh, as a first guess a Gaussian pulse here, you would uh, implement a rotation about the X axis here. And this rotation angle that you can uh, control is defined by the area under this pulse. And so now we have two components covered and we have, so we can for instance uh, calibrate the pulse so this angle here implements the square root of an X gate. Um, and if you now simply put the same pulse into the uh, phase shifted quadrature component here, you um, implement the exact same rotation but now about the Y axis. And now you have a three component control in a three dimensional system so you are able to implement any arbitrary operations that you would want um, just by having one pulse shape and phase control over your signal. So going from here, um, you can mathematically kind of uh, show that having uh, these uh, fundamental rotations uh, allows you to implement a kind of unitary in this uh, SU3, uh, SU, SU3 space, um, any arbitrary uh, translation of your qubit state by any of the three uh, parameters that you would like. So you can uh, translate any point on this block sphere to any other point by having these three components. And the kind of important part to understand here is that this is still all implemented by having one single pulse shape that implements a 90 degree rotation and arbitrary phase control. And by doing that, and you, for instance, you, I show it here, if you, if you uh, start out at the top of your block sphere in the ground state, you can, for instance, start with a 90 degree rotation, do an arbitrary phase, and then translate again to uh, any point of this block sphere. And then you can imagine that having uh, only control over this phase parameter lets you freely choose where you would want to go on this sphere. Right, so of course that goes then a bit further uh, as you, but the same concept kind of holds for two qubit gates. Now you would add an entangling operation. So for instance, the typical choices are C0 gates, I swap gates, or controlled phase gates here. Um, and then you would extend your, uh, your complete, complete single qubit gate set to a complete two qubit gate set by just adding one operation that is also reliant on a different pulse and the implementation can vastly differ in the choice of your architecture here 
but all of these kind of, uh, depending on which one your architecture allows you to do, can be decomposed into, uh, for instance, here I showed a decomposition into uh, C phase gates, um, which then means, again, no matter what, uh, what two qubit gate operation you can implement, you can translate it into all the others, but of course you take the cost of a non-favorable translation. So as you can see, for instance, the I swap or the 90 degree phase rotation, for instance, translates into two phase rotations, which is not cheap because these are typically what define your, what is the most uh, error prone source of uh, decoherence or loss of uh, fidelity in your system. So it's kind of problem dependent which one of these you would want to implement technically um, for different problems. What we have found, for instance, is that for chemistry problems, it's uh, nice to have particle conversion, convers uh, conversion um, particle number uh, preservance. So then the I swap is better here, um, but that is not the same for every other algorithm, of course. So going back to the uh, single qubit control problem, so what, what I've been focusing on in my research is the um, optimal control of this system, where what is one of the main sources of error is that while addressing this uh, ground state transition here, you have uh, non-zero components that also remove excitations from the computational subspace of the qubit down here to, for instance, the second excited state or even higher states. And uh, there's a well-known solution here, um, which has been worked out in this paper in 2009 already, which is completely uh, established in all labs doing superconducting qubits, with it, which is this drag solution, where now instead of having a single component, so the main component would here, if you want to, like as we have seen, or if you want to implement a gate here, would be this red Gaussian envelope. Now you use both components to implement your operation to get rid of some of the uh, spurious Hamiltonian terms that you implement within your drive. And two um, prominent terms, for instance, is a unwanted Y, uh, so an unwanted derivative component of the uh, X component that you have put to the system. And this drives um, terms of the Hamiltonian that you, would, you didn't intend to inter uh, implement. But you can see that you can use the Y component that has so far not been uh, used to kind of compensate this derivative term. And then you get exactly this shape here. And if you, uh, if you tune it correctly in terms of amplitude, um, you can get rid of these two unwanted contributions to your drive Hamiltonian. So that's something that uh, helps a lot. And this is kind of a good example for what we call optimal control. Because now we have derived a pulse shape analytically which has a couple more parameters than the initial Gaussian that we started out with. So now we have a parameter set S here, which we have found using kind of numerical or analytical optimal control. And what then in the experiment we have to do is kind of an ad hoc tune up of all of the parameters that are now defined in this gate set here, uh, in the parameter set here. And this is also what I have been focusing on. So we are trying to do a uh, efficient tune up of these parameters on the experimental system which tend to be not cheap. Uh, the larger vision here is kind of that during this ad hoc tune-up, you find a lot of um, solutions for the parameter set S, where you put now actual values for all of the parameters, and a related fidelity to the pulse that you then implement by the choice of parameters. And now what we are trying to do, we, we generate now a large set of parameter uh, choices and a large set of corresponding fidelities which can be used to feed a model learning algorithm that tries to uh, further your understanding of the system. So if you, for, for instance, assumed a Hamiltonian that had just a two qubit subspace, now you would notice that that is not enough to describe what we have seen in experiment, and now you might want to include the third level or might want to uh, change the way you uh, interpret it to third level. And so we're hoping that by doing a extensive tune-up here on more complicated shapes, that we can learn also a bit about the underlying system that we are investigating. And then finally, of course, as you have uh, understood your system better, you are able to do this first step also more elaborate, because now you can go back and numerically find uh, parameter sets that might solve problems that you have not seen before or not considered before. Um, so that's kind of the larger vision here, but uh, what I've been focusing on is the experimental tuner part, and that uh, I want to also go a bit deeper into. So because now uh, if we look at the actual parameter sets 
that we have to tune up an experiment it tends to get quite expensive right quite fast so if you just uh, look at the analytical components here you have an amplitude you have a width of your Gaussian and you have a scaling uh, of your uh, optimal control solution here and of course the center frequency of your pulse that's four parameters pretty easy to tune up but you turns out you are still very far from the limits that you could reach especially if you now go even faster in your control um, and so the kind of opposite end of the spectrum from a analytic pulse shape is that you uh, the, the, the native representation of the control electronics is a piecewise constant representation in time so you know that you generate voltage samples for a given amount of time and that then samples your pulse in time and what we allow now in our optimi optimization in the experimental system is that the all of the amplitudes of these individual time components here can be adapted by a, by a search algorithm for a new and uh, better pulse shape in the end. But of course, that turns a four-dimensional search problem into a, about 20 to 50-dimensional search problem, so it tends to be pretty expensive. But it's ultimately kind of the most uh, versatile implementation of control. It doesn't need to, it's not to say that this is the best. So something like Fourier components has shown to be also very powerful, and you get a vastly reduced parameter set. Um, so to do this uh, effectively in the experiment, what we do is a kind of multidimensional parameter search where we found that this CMA optimizer here, which stands for uh, covariance matrix adaptation, um, works pretty decently. And here you see how it kind of works in two dimensions. Is uh, you, you spawn an initial guess around a kind of your, your initial guess of parameters, and you spawn a cloud of points around that, um, and so then this algorithm kind of uh, calculates the covariance between these parameters and also a gradient estimation and tries to move you towards the perceived minimum of this. And the hope is that then after some iterations you converge to your actual minimum of the search space. Now of course we, don't, uh, we are not dealing with a two dimensional space here but now it could be yeah, 20 to 50 dimensions. Um, and each of these points then represents one choice of parameters in your set. So now, of course, we need to kind of conflate this into a single cost function. And what we use here is something uh, that is um, developed from randomized benchmarking. So ran and the way randomized benchmarking works is that you generate arbitrary and random cir circuits from your native gate set. And you um, generate them in a way that they uh, do not change the initial qubit state. So you want to go all over the block sphere and then return to where you started in the end. Um, the nice thing is that all of these uh, gates that you can use to generate a circuit is kind of a uh, concatenation of different versions of your one pulse shape, where you just change the phases in between. As we have seen in the beginning, the, with that you can implement any gate. So even though you randomize a lot of different circuits here, you are still just uh, testing a singular pulse shape, which is now defined by this para parameter set that I introduced. And then what you get is something that decays versus the number of gates you choose to put in your randomized circuit, which is the typical randomized benchmarking signature. And the way we can make this a bit cheaper is that we just test now at a constant length of, uh, of um, sequences, which then, of course, lets you not extract the actual fidelity of any individual gates anymore, but you get a measure that scales monotonously with the fidelity, and that's exactly what you would want from a cost function if you were to optimize. So you can see how this then evolves right here. So what I plot here is kind of the, uh, a, the, the analytical pulse shape and the parameter space of that and the evolution of this optimizer in this, in this uh, parameter space. And you can see from starting out, which is shown in blue, you kind of converge to, a, to, the, to the minimum here, what, what the optimizer thinks at least is the minimum. And you can also kind of observe that some of the parameters are kind of strongly correlated, which makes it hard if you would tune up all of them at, the, at, a, at a single point in time and then iterate between these. I mean, with three, it's not a lot of iteration, but now if you have 20 codependent parameters, you are basically never finding anything. Um, so that's how it kind of looks like if it works. And um, now, of course, if we go to larger parameter sets, it will become very expensive. So we had to think about the, uh, the time consumption of all of the different steps here. And it turns out that there's three major parts, which is kind of 
processing, which means compiling and turning your uh, sequences into something machine executable, uh, loading these files to a to the to the micro electronics is another diff, uh, huge part. Um, and what turned out to be the most expensive part is the actual measurement. So you would, in the end, like to measure each of the uh, points that you would test in a given iteration about a thousand times to get sufficient statistics. Um, and you would uh, have about 30 to 50 points in one iteration. And to do randomized benchmarking, you need to do about 30 to 50 different randomizations of your circuit length. So then you measure for quite a while. And kind of I, I try to show that here. Uh, the, the, the relation between these, these times is shown in these bars here, where now the measurement takes a uh, majority of time. And for one of these measurements, for so like in one iteration of the optimizer, um, this can be the, like the, the processing part can be on the order of seconds already. So now you're measuring for a couple of minutes until you can go into the next um, iteration of the optimization algorithm. And we have tried a bunch of things to alleviate this. And what, what uh, kind of is the major limiting part of the measurement is that you have to wait for your qubit to decay after you have done your quantum computation, um, which, of course, is a, is a decay that we try to get as slow as possible, because that kind of also defines the, 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 the useful quantum properties. So you, this is kind of what defines 99% of the measurement, actually. So we have tried two different things here. One is to reset the qubit, which we do by transferring the excitation, if it were to be in the excited state, to the readout resonator, which decays much faster. And with that, we can uh, squish this time by about a factor of 10 before we have to wait for the resonator itself to also empty itself. Um, what turned out to work even better is uh, it's something called restless measurements, where you omit any kind of reset now, and you use the uh, intrinsic kind of uh, projection properties of the readout um, implementation, which means that the state that you read in your measurement will also be the state that the qubit is projected into, and it will always be in the basis, which is here the sigma z basis. So it, uh, it projects the qubit either in the ground or the excited state. And since you measured it, you also know which state you'll end it up in. And now you can completely in post-processing kind of uh, invert your system if you ended up in the excited state instead of the ground state um, and can use both starting points to get the same measure in the end. And with that, we can go to the limit of 100 kilohertz, uh, which is about 100 times faster than the standard implementation, which ha really helps out. And now you can see the, the, the measurement part here is very non-existent, basically. So that, that is a huge gain, and now we can do actually this optimization in this higher dimensional space, and you can see how it looks like here. We just see the cost function here now because I can't plot it, of course. And you can see that it kind of converges, and even with these measures, it kind of takes still 8 to 20 hours to find a new solution here. But uh, it behaves vastly better, as you can see then also up here. So we have done this now for a couple of different pulse lengths, and typically you expect that for very short pulses, so here we go to up, uh, down to four nanoseconds, uh, and in blue points I show the fidelity of the drag solution. So as you go very fast with your pulses, which you would want to do to beat coherence times, um, you break down in the fidelity because now you get these problems that you have a very wide frequency addressing and you, you get these problems that I talked about. But it turns out if you do this optimization, you can kind of generate pulses that are at least to some extent immune to this and let you go a bit faster even still, even though you uh, have to optimize a bunch here. Um, and you can see also why this is happening and you can see also what kind of pulses are, are found by the optimizer, which are not intuitive anymore. Uh, we have tried a bunch of things to understand them, but uh, it's, so for instance, also the, the, the Y component here is completely uh, gone from what it resembled in the first place. Um, but you can see here, what I've shown on the right is uh, a randomized benchmarking uh, comparison between the two. And on the top, we see the uh, a measure for the leakage. So this is the remainder of the population in the computational subspace versus the number of gates that you do. And down here is the overall fidelity um, of the sequences. And you can see in red, the, the new solution finds vastly better um, uh, solutions to the pulse shape than what we would do uh, in the typical implementation. Um, right. So this is also published. You can read it here. 
and all kind of um, this is research that happened mostly still uh, with our time at IBM. Now we have revived it kind of in a new lab. And now, um, so we are trying to apply it to different things as well. And some, some of course, the obvious steps is to do, uh, yep, um, last slide, um, to do now multi-state, uh, multi-qubit gate optimizations. And one kind of, so one example here would be, uh, we have looked at a three qubit gate here which is controlled by having a tuner element that couples all of the qubits. Um, and then dependent on the frequency of your tunable element, you can get a uh, different phase contributions on the um, different three qubit states here, which is a very complicated comp control problem in the first place. Um, so it's hard to find a solution anyway. Uh, so this we are trying to tackle now also with these uh, methods here. Um, and for instance, of course, what is also interesting is kind of if we use our the mid size systems, is uh, can we do tune ups that uh, take the rest of the system into account and not just do isolated uh, operations on the qubits? Um, and you might want to find some robustness to, to, to different um, qubit operations that are happening meanwhile. So, this is two things that we want to look at with these methodologies. Yeah, and that's my last slide. So you can see the team that we are now working with at the WMI. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Questions? of having like a little set of single qubit gates which you optimize really far and then decompose everything in this. Mm -hmm. Like why is not the case that you like develop a broader single qubit gate uh, range of operations? Um, because the problem typically doesn't differ. So uh, you only have these two controls available. So it, and, and the phase is uh, an error free parameter. So um, any rotation that are on an axis that lies on the equator is anyway for free, basically. It translates error free. Um, and that gives you already two of the three dimensions, right? Um, and then it turns out also that calibration is kind of an exper experimental waste of time. So you would like to do applications, of course, and keep the calibration time as short as possible. And if you have just to uh, calibrate one gate instead of three or five or 10, uh, it, of course, helps in the end. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I have two quick questions. First, uh, when you mentioned that the phase is a free error parameter, uh, how controllable is this uh, parameter? How continuously can you change it in the experimental setup? Uh, virtually infinite, but of course there is limits. So the phase is controlled by the rotation in this IQ space. So putting a full in-phase control into the quadrature component fully the, is uh, corresponding to a 90 degree phase and any superposition between them will let you have any phase between that. Um, or just inverting the amplitude on, uh, on one component will give you a 180 degree phase in the end. And then of course this is limited by your resolution of your amplitude, uh, amplitude in the end. So and that tends, tends to be like one in 10,000 or so, and then you kind of are limited. Okay, thank you. Yes, so the, the first question is, so basically the fact that you had those steps functions, it's an experimental limitation. Yep. Okay. The second one, <coughs> you mentioned uh, this um, you know, randomized benchmarking. Okay, that's a nice procedure. It has some limitations or there are some assumptions for it. Yes. So have you tried gate set tomography, which would be a much more reliable thing, although perhaps um, a harder one? It is, so gate set tomography typically doesn't scale very well if you uh, have significant state preparation errors or readout yeah. errors. <coughs> yeah. And in the fidelity ranges that we want to go, like three nines or four nines, this will drown out any signal that we would see. So I that's, see. I think, uh -huh. the reason. And it's also not significantly cheaper. 
it no, gives it's you not cheap, but it's yeah. just uh, sort of like theoretically more based it, on yeah. reliability. Yeah. It gives you also a lot more information, but yeah. in the end what you would want in an optimizer is one single number that you can uh, optimize over, right? Okay, Yeah. thanks. All right, um, we're a couple of minutes behind schedule, so maybe we should... Yeah, if, if you can continue the discussion afterwards, I guess. Uh, I'm actually gone, but you feel free to write me an email. <laughs> so I have to go to catch my plane. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for the invitation for my talk. So it's quite a departure from the previous one, where it was on the low level. Now we're going to be looking at error correction and decoders, which is uh, looking a lot more towards the future and on a much higher level. So um, in this particular talk, I'm going to be looking at uh, using neural network decoders on uh, near-term experiments. And let's get into it. OK. So for any sort of useful algorithm, you will sort of need arrays that are 10 to the minus 9 or below. And one of the most promising ways to achieve those is with error correction, and in particular with the surface code, which is going to be what I'm focusing on in this talk. OK, I, uh, I, I don't have the pointer, but hopefully it will be clear. Um, so the surface code uh, encodes this logical information into an array of d squared data qubits. And there's an additional d squared minus 1 on silo qubits, which are measuring either x type or z type party checks. The logical operators for this code are string like operators that connect either the vertical or the horizontal boundaries on the co of the code, as you can see, for example, here for the distance tree surface code. Now, what I will be presenting is uh, results for the distance 3 surface code as well as the distance 5 surface code, which both of, uh, of which have been now implemented in an experiment, namely the one that was recently done by Google Quantum AI, which we are also going to look in more uh, depth. And we're going to look a bit towards the future to distance 7 surface codes, which should be available in the near term. Now. Since we're going to be working closely with uh, data from experiments, we're also going to be following the circuits that are used in those experiments. And when they're compiled, they actually end up measuring x, z, z, x operator instead of either all x or all z. But this is sort of like a minor detail that doesn't affect the uh, logical error. It's in any significant way. Now, the experiments we will be looking at are memory experiments, and the goal is simple keep a logical qubit alive for as long as possible. The way to do this is when you start the experiment, you want to prepare a given logical state. So you prepare your data qubits in zero. You apply some conditional X gates uh, in order to initialize a state with a certain logical operator value that you know in advance. And then these two Hadamard gates at the end uh, map that state to an eigenstate of either the X or the Z type party checks, depending on which base you do your experiment in. Following that, you're going to do n minus 1 rounds of stabilizer measurements. And the way these go are the ancillas are put in a superposition. And with a series of four layers of C-phase interactions, they map the neighboring x or z party of the data qubits uh, to the state of the ancilla, after which they are rotated back, measured, and reset. 
you will notice throughout the circuit there are a number of X gates, which for error correction and in simulation don't really matter, but in practice these are echo pulses which refocus and help with lowering the error rates. So the first of these QEC cycles is gonna actually project the prepared state to the full surface code logical state, and the others are gonna give us information about what errors happened. The experiment ends by doing a logical measurement, which begins by a rotation uh, with either of these two circuits, uh, depending on the basis you're doing it on, followed by measuring all the data qubits in the Z basis. From these data qubit measurements, you can do two things. You can extract a value for your logical measurement outcome, as well as you can infer a set of parities with which you can also use for the decoding. Now, uh, information about the errors is stored into the stabilizer measurements, and then it's up for a decoder to process them and uh, figure out what errors happen and give you back a correction for the logical measurement outcome. Now, whoops, sorry. Now, what, what you generally do is compare this corrected outcome to the state you prepared, and if they match, the experiment is success, or if not, a logical error has occurred. So, the noise we're gonna be looking at when dealing with simulation is circuit level noise, so single qubit gates followed by single qubit depolarizing channels. Uh, idling periods are also followed with depolarizing channels. Two qubit gates are followed with a two qubit depolarizing channel. Measurements are preceded with a bit flip error channel, which uh, will flip up the measurement result. And reset and preparation are followed by a bit flip channel all of which inserts an error with a probability p. Now, in addition to these depolarizing channels, which are pretty standard, we're also gonna be looking at uh, biased noise channels. Uh, I think the battery has run out. Oh, okay, okay, no, it's, it, 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 it's okay, I think. <laughs> so, we're gonna be looking at uh, uh, white bias channels, in which case, the standard depolarizing channels which have a uniform uh, probability of applying either X or Y or Z error, for example in this single qubit case, get modified such that the probability of Y error gets uh, multiplied by this bias factor. And you then have to divide by something in order to keep the total probability fixed. Now, if you take a look at the total probability of either having a Y error or an X or a Z error in this case, you will see that um, uh, for low biases, this channel pretty much exerts either X or Z errors. Um, for uh, bias of one, this channel is equivalent to the depolarizing channel. And for high biases, this channel pretty much inserts exclusively Y errors. So this is gonna map from uh, X and Z errors to Y errors, uh, which I say here. Okay, um, next let's take a look at how errors change the measured syndromes. So let's consider an X error on this middle data qubit. Uh, and let's say it's followed by a round of stabilizer measurements that is otherwise perfect. Um, and in, in this case, this X error will anti-commute with these two stabilizers and it's gonna flip them. And so uh, the general idea behind uh, many decoders and error correction is to use these changes in the measurement outcomes to detect what errors happen and correct them. Now, it might not be clear, but all the errors I presented previously will follow a similar idea with one detail, which is that uh, when the ancillas are also noisy, the measurements themselves are not reliable, and instead, subsequent measurements have to be processed in a time correlated ma manner. So what people normally look at are uh, so-called defects or detectors, which are just comparisons between measurements that should be the same. And if they're not, there's a non-trivial defect outcome. So if you're looking at defects, then it's true that any of the errors I presented previously will lead to at most two defects in either the X part or the Z part of the defects measurements. Um, so the general idea is to try to pair these two errors together which is simple for a distance tree code, but if you have a large code with many of these popping up, 
what should be paired with what isn't so clear. And so this is formalized by, for example, mean weight perfect matching by mapping these measured non-trivial defects to a graph, adding edges that are weighted according to the probability of these error chains. And then the matching returns a pairing of all defects or potentially to a boundary if there's an odd number of them that minimizes the weight or in other words, maximizes the probability. So you will get the most likely error chain that explains these observed defects. Now, I'm not gonna focus on minimum weight perfect matching and instead I'm focusing on neural network decoders, but the structure that I presented follows for many decoder implementations. They will generally take inputs as uh, the defects. They will output a logical correction and they rely on some sort of an error model to decide what's more likely compared to what else. Now, when designing these decoders, there's a certain trade-off between the accuracy they achieve and their runtime. In order for a decoder to be more accurate with its predictions, you either need more computational resources or you need to consider more in-depth error models. Uh, however, this increases the runtime, which is an issue if you want to run these decoders uh, in real time in an actual experiment. Uh, for example, minimum weight perfect matching is one of the more uh, efficient decoders, but it achieves this efficiency by approximating Y errors as independent X or Z errors, which will see affects its, its error rates. A more practical concern is that the need to have this error model is uh, impractical because one has to create a, an approximate but still accurate error model, and this is particularly an issue when thinking about errors like leakage or crosstalk, which are quite important in actual experiments. So what you would ideally want is a decoder that can learn the error model by itself from data. And this is exactly where these neural network decoders come in. So there have been many different neural network architectures proposed for these decoders. And what we will be focusing in this case are recurrent architectures. But these decoders in general have demonstrated performance that is close or above minimum weight perfect matching, in some case being close to optimal. And depending on the design, they can still be fast and scalable. So they're pretty good. And again, in this particular talk, we're gonna be focusing on applying these decoders to some actual experimental data and seeing how well they're performing. So let's take a look at the architecture, which follows pretty closely the reference on the bottom here. Um, so the inputs for our model are the defects that you would measure or obtain from the stabilizer measurements themselves and uh, the defects that you would obtain or infer from the final data qubit measurements. And we treat those separately because the defects from uh, the measurements themselves are time invariant and the decoder can take any number of rounds for those defects and the error rates are always the same. But these last defects that you obtain from the data measurements have different error rates and break this time invariance. So these two inputs are processed separately. Now, the measured defects from the stabilizer measurement are processed through two layers of LSTM uh, cells, which stand for long, short-term memory. And the way these uh, LSTMs work is they process each uh, round, each the defects at each round sequentially. They output a certain hidden state, which is then passed back to the cell, making them recurrent in nature. And they also maintain a certain uh, state within them and the combination of these two things allows them to learn correlations that are in time, both on a short time scale and a longer time scale, which is useful for decoding. Following that, we apply um, activation layer, in particular Arello, and the output of this recurrent part of the network is then split, and in one case, it is immediately processed through a feed-forward, fully connected layer that maps it to a probability of whether a logical error happened or not, and in the other case, it is concatenated with the final measured defects and then processed through a similar feed-forward network. So at the end, you have two probabilities and one clearly uses more information than the other. So why is that? Well, when we evaluate our decoders, we are always gonna be interested in the one that uses the full information, which is called the main probability. But when training the decoder, it is useful to have both because uh, this allows the decoder to be trained such that it doesn't focus too much on relying on these final uh, defects obtained from data measurements, which contain quite a lot of information about the final state if you think about it. 
Uh, in particular, the way this is implemented is that the total loss for this model is a weighted sum of the losses computed using the binary cross entropy between these predicted probabilities and the actual logical errors that happened. Uh, if the training goes correctly, this network should be able to handle an arbitrary number of cycles, which is quite convenient. Uh, we keep all the dimensions of the layers fixed, and when you're scaling up sizes, these will grow with the size distance, but not in a dramatic fashion. All right, let's take a look at some actual results in the logical performance. Um, so the way this experiment goes is you run uh, the experiment for some number of cycles, which you're varying, and you sample many shots and many initial states, and then you decode them, check for logical errors, and average those to calculate the logical probability for each cycle, which then can be converted to a fidelity. These fidelities are decaying exponentially with the number of rounds, so when plotted on a semi-log plot, they should appear as straight lines. Uh, you, can, you can also fit these uh, decays with the formula uh, given below in order to extract the logical error rate per round. Now, the data I'm showing here is for a circuit level depolarizing noise with a probability of 0.1% for a distance three surface code. And in this case, we train our neural network for, with data that goes only up to 40 rounds, which is this dashed line here. And then we test it uh, going up to 300 rounds. And as you can see, the error rates are constant going all the way up to 300 rounds, showing that it did generalize well in time. Furthermore, by, by extracting the error rates, we can see that the neural network performs about 20% better than the mean weight performance matching decoder. Um, and it's useful to understand why that is the case. So to get more insight into that, we're gonna take the same decoder, so we don't do any further training, and we're gonna just test it on data with changing uh, bias towards wires. Now, in this plot below, the point where the bias is one corresponds to uh, the depolarizing channel that we were just looking above. And as you can see, when increasing the bias, the performance improvement using the neural network is increasing proportionally. While if you decrease the bias, it goes down to the point where minimum weight perfect matching actually becomes better. So the key takeaway point here is that the reason why these decoders perform better is that they're able to learn the correlations between the uh, X and the Z parts of the defects that minimum weight perfect matching ignores, but this decoder can learn and take into account. Um, so with that performance, let's, let's check out how it will actually look on our experimental data. So we are going to be testing this out on the data available from Google's recent surface code experiment, where the main demonstration is that when they use a computationally expensive but very accurate tensor network decoder, which is an approximation for a maximum likelihood decoder, they, can, they show that the distance five surface code has a lower uh, logical error rate than the average of the four distance three patches that fit within that same layout. Or in other words, this indicates that in that case, they're below the threshold of that code for their error rates. Now, in our case, uh, the data sets they provide are not sufficiently large in order for us to train our decoders on them. So instead, we're gonna take the error models that they provide, which are approximate, uh, but still fairly accurate. And we're gonna train our decoder on simulated data, but we're gonna test it on ex uh, experimental data shown on the top and on simulated data shown at the bottom. So if we take a look at first the simulated data, what you see is that the distance five error rate is indeed lower than the average of the distance three codes. So in that case, we're below threshold. But when we apply that decoder to experimental data, what you see is that actually the distance five error rate is now uh, higher compared to the distance three. Uh, showing that we are above, and this is sort of like uh, in contrary to uh, the decoders that Google used. So we are underperforming compared to their decoder. To put these results into a bit more perspective, we can take a look at the error rates for all the decoders that Google presented, as well as our neural network decoder. And we're mostly comparing with mean weight perfect matching or with this tensor network. So we see that we are always better than mean weight perfect matching, so that's good. And when we look at the comparison with the tensor network decoder, we see that for the distance three, the error rates that we achieve and that they achieve are essentially the same. 
but then the distance five error rate is actually much higher with using our neural network decoder, and it's almost like an outlier point in this case. And so we attribute this essentially to a mismatch between the error model and the simulated data that we use for the training and the actual data that we are testing on. Because even in Google's experiment, you see that there's some mismatch between the predictions from the simulation and what they actually measure. Um, so hopefully, if you train it on actual data, this is uh, going to improve. So going back to the theory uh, land and uh, using simulation, we're going to take a bit in, uh, a look into uh, how these uh, decoders might be useful for near to medium term experiments. And so to do this, we will take uh, surface codes of distance 357, and we are going to train them uh, using uh, the circuit level depolarizing noise model with a probability of 0.1%. And then we're going to test them on either an error rate of 0.1% or 0.05%. Um, now, if you're below the threshold of the code, you expect the error rate per round to decay exponentially. So once again, on a log scale, this should be a straight line that we can fit to extract this error suppression factor. Now, on the top, I am plotting the results for minimum weight perfect matching, and on the bottom, I'm plotting the results for our neural network decoder. So by comparing the error suppression factors, what you see is that at error probabilities of 0 0.1, which are sort of close to what we currently have in experiment, but somewhat more optimistic, but should be achievable sometime soon, hopefully, that the benefit of using this this, this neural network decoder is somewhat limited. It outperforms mean weight perfect matching, but in terms of the error suppression, the difference is uh, 420 versus 371, so it's not that huge. However, when you uh, consider improving your fidelity to the operations even further, in, uh, in this case by a factor of two, you see that going for these more accurate decoders can make a huge change on the logical errors you're seeing. In particular, this leads to a factor of a two difference between the uh, error suppression factors between these decoders. And if you look at the distance 13 surface code, this is more than an order of magnitude difference in the logical error rate that you can achieve using them. So this, this should be a motivation why it's important to explore the decoder that can achieve the best possible accuracy while still being efficient enough to run in practice. So a uh, quick conclusion and some outlook. So hopefully I've shown you that these neural networks decoders can be quite neat for practical data. They don't require any error models, which makes things significantly easier. And even when trained on simulation, they can still show very good performance, for sure outperforming minimum weight perfect matching, um, and potentially being close to maximum likelihood decoders. In our case, uh, the, distance th the distance five code is underperforming, and the hope is that when I actually trained on the experimental data that you're decoding, this will improve. But one can also hope that these decoders can learn correlations that are introduced by errors such as leakage or crosstalk. Now, uh, a final thing I didn't show, but uh, we have also looked at, is that these decoders can easily be modified in order to also consider the soft information that is available when you have continuous measurement outcomes, as is pretty much always the case with actual physical qubits. Now, looking slightly beyond this near term, if you're asking whether these particular recurrent decoders can be useful for long-term computation, then the answer is unfortunately not super clear. And essentially, it is because uh, people haven't studied them uh, in depth enough on large distance codes and what exactly their runtime uh, is going to be. Uh, so that remains to be seen. Uh, and there's also this potential issue that as your error rates keep going down and your code size in increases, doing a supervised training of these networks is going to become harder and harder because there are less and less errors for the decoder to learn and less and less logical errors for which to inform the loss function. So uh, the training also is going to be more complicated than just measuring data, feeding it, and then calling it a day. So, with that, um, thank you for your attention, and let me know if there are any questions. So, okay. Okay, so thank you for thank you for your talk. 
so I have one question related to the neural network. Is the neural network trying to predict the error that occurred or the appropriate correction for the error? Yes, yeah, so it's it's sort of the same thing, but it does uh, train to predict whether the logical error occurred or not. So if you know whether a logical error happened, of course, the correction is obvious. What it doesn't do is try to predict all the errors on each of the physical data qubits. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of like in the uh, in the articles referred to as having a high-level decoder, which only cares about the logical outcome versus a low-level decoder. And I think this is a smart choice because f finding a physical correction isn't the most important thing. You generally care about the logical qubit itself. And I think that this makes designing these decoders and training them much easier. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, looking at your error models that you employed, you use this depolarizing channel, which I was wondering, and related with your conclusions, is if you use a more involved noise models, is it possible that the training might get better? So for example, using depolarizing, so instead of the uh, depolarizing, maybe defacing, something not so uh, symmetric? Um. Yes, so it uh, depends on what is exactly limiting the performance. So one option is to indeed consider a more realistic error model, such as including amplitude dumping and dephasing. And then in order to make the simulation scalable, perhaps you're going to do something like poly twirling that, which is only going to keep the stochastic poly components. So in that case, that should be a more faithful modeling of something like amplitude dumping. However, it is not clear to me that this is the issue that is impacting, for example, the performance of distance five code, because uh, this is my intuition, so I don't have any hard data to back this up, but the way I think about it is that these decoders are learning patterns, and even if the probabilities aren't exactly matched, it can still recognize these patterns, and we see this when we apply this decoder to uh, different noise models. For example, when we increase the wires, the decoder doesn't all of a sudden lose all performance, it still performs fairly decent. So I think what is most probably happening is that when you're looking at experiments, there errors like leakage and crosstalk, which increase when you scale up your code, which are then much harder to capture with error models that are still sort of scalable, so that's indeed a big issue. And if it is in, uh, amplitude, um, uh, amplitude or dephasing, as you suggested, then this might help potentially, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be a big factor, but I don't know. <laughs> so we thank Boris again. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my name's Dylan. I'm at UCL, as Javi said, um, with Segato Bose. But this work was done at Los Alamos with uh, Stefan, Balu, and Yeet, who are at Los Alamos. I'm going to be talking about limitations for uh, solving or um, turbulent or chaotic systems um, and why it might be tricky. So first I'll introduce the quantum algorithm for nonlinear um, differential equations introduced 
um, by Liu et al. Um, a couple of years ago. Um, I'll talk about the limitations of this algorithm and some results, and, and then I'll summarize. So, um, the quantum algorithm, so I guess the first question might be why would you uh, want to solve nonlinear differential equations? Well, they're, they're really uh, important uh, in physics, uh, classical physics, electrodynamics, etc. But, but there are a few analytical solutions, so we must use computers. Uh, the problem is they suffer from this curse of dimensionality. Uh, the grid and time discretization leads to this uh, ND, where D is in the exponent. Uh, and the question is, can com quantum computers help? So you can encode the high dimensional system, and you have this uh, D log N. Um, and then we know that there's a speed up for linear systems for a specific um, encoding of the problem. Um, which was this HHL algorithm. Um, and so the question is, could there be a speed up for uh, nonlinear partial differential equations? Uh, oh, I was supposed to play this. This is the chaotic, uh, or the Lorentz attractor, which is like the first chaotic system about 1963. Uh, it's a nice looking butterfly. Uh, and the answer to this question, could there be a speed up in general? It, uh, well, the answer is not in general. So if we take a um, sort of a prototypical example in fluid dynamics, which is a simple uh, one-dimensional uh, nonlinear differential equation, we have Berger's equation, which has all the ingredients. We have some time evolution. We have a nonlinearity, which is so u du, um, and we have a diffusion term, which is a second-order uh, differential for u with x, and then some some forcing. Um, and, and so we have this um, classical differential equation, and now we have to wonder what a quantum computer do. So before we, before we start, we say that linear systems can be solved with exponential speed up, but we can't expect the same from, uh, so we can't expect a quantum computer to have the same uh, speed up for nonlinear sy uh, non system because quantum mechanics is linear. Um, and so the question becomes, can we encode uh, this differential equation into a linear system? So that's this AX equals B. And uh, the answer is found, uh, or an uh, algorithm was found by uh, this uh, Lou paper. It's called the quantum Kármán linearization method. And I'll quickly talk about how we map um, this nonlinear differential equation to a linear system. So the first step is discretization. So uh, this is obvious, the x and t are continuous variables, but for a linear system, it, it should be finite. And so we can spatially discretize the system, and we have a discrete vector of grid points, and we use finite difference method for the gradients. So if you see the, uh, the uh, derivative term becomes a difference between neighboring terms divided by the spatial di uh, discretization. Um, in the end, we have some general form of this equation. So we have uh, this du by tt has some F2 matrix multiplied by u tensor u. This is your nonlinearity, so F2 is uh, encodes this nonlinearity. F1 encodes a linear term, and F, F0 encodes a time uh, dependent term, which, which, in, which is the forcing, or comes from the forcing. Um, we then require some linearization technique because this uh, U tensor U term, this nonlinearity, um, is not well encoded, uh, or it does not appear in our. Um, final uh, linear system equation. So Kármán linearization, uh, I'll go into more detail, but we transform a finite differential, a uh, finite dimensional nonlinear system into an infinite dimensional uh, linear system. And finally, uh, we want to solve it for time steps. Uh, time is, uh, again, a continuous variable. So we have to pick some small discrete time step and um, we solve for all of these time steps uh, simultaneously uh, in the quantum algorithm. 
the reason for that is if you were to do a small time step and then have the answer, so measure it, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to carry on um, evolving that system because you can't clone a quantum state. So you can't measure and store. So we solve them all simultaneously, which makes for a large matrix, but that's the advantage of the quantum computer because we have this exponential Hilbert space. And so finally, we end up with this AX equals B form, and, and then we get to use uh, HHL. So what are the limitations? So the key, um, the key point where the linear, uh, with the limitation would occur is in the linearization. So turning this nonlinear system into a linear one. And so I'll just quickly explain Kalman linearization. We have this, uh, this form of the equation we saw on the previous slide um, with this u tensor u term, which is the nonlinearity. But now we're going to elevate every uh, tensor product of u terms into their own variable and track their changes over time. Uh, this this uh, encoding gives us an infinite, uh, infinite set of additional variables, which are all these u tensor u, u tensor u tensor u terms. And uh, so if we call this y, we, we can now uh, we now have a linear equation, but it's infinite dimensional, and the key point is that the u tensor u uh, term is its own variable, and the u tensor u tensor u, for example. So we've turned this infinite system into a, uh, we've turned this finite nonlinear system into an infinite linear one. Uh, if the nonlinearity is not too great, um, which is not uh, easy to characterize, but we could truncate the linear equation up to some n. And so this, uh, so the system will be much larger because these u tensor u terms become increasingly uh, bigger than just u on its own dimensionally. However, we have some finite linear system and um, the error on this truncation was bounded um, for in, so strictly in, a, in certain cases. So one is that the eigenvalues of F1 are all negative. So F1 is this linear term. So the overall behavior of this equation is called dissipative. And you have this Reynolds-like number. So in fluid dynamics, the Reynolds number is the ratio in some sense, of the nonlinearity to the linearity. And this R, if it is less than one, so we have sufficiently small nonlinearity, which is measured by this uh, norm of F2 over uh, F1 with the initial, um, the initial condition as UN. If that is less than uh, one, then um, the error is bounded for arbitrary time. And, you, and th then this means that this algorithm is efficient for this specific set of nonlinear systems. Um, so I just mentioned there's actually two more. So I, I, I said this is only dissipative solutions and for sufficiently small nonlinearity, we actually have two more limitations. We require that the solution norm uh, is less than the initial for all time. Um, in some ways, this was bounded, uh, this was relaxed slightly, but uh, so you could say that there has to be a maximum UT at some time, which you know in advance. And then you have to say, and then you have to require that the solution does not decay exponentially to zero, which would be the case for dissipative solutions in general, um, but isn't the case if you have some forcing term. So the forcing term can prevent uh, exponential decay to zero. So it becomes a quite a restrictive uh, set of requirements on, on the, uh, the nonlinear differential equations which can be solved. Um, so that was for R less than one. So what about for R greater than one, where we have some, uh, so this measure of nonlinearity to linearity 
suggest that the nonlinearity may be too large. Um, in Lua Tau, they constructed a PDE such that for r greater than or equal to root 2, there cannot be an efficient uh, quantum algorithm, which means there cannot be a general quantum algorithm which is efficient for all r greater than or equal to 2. And the proof of this relies on this state discrimination task. So if we have this black box which prepares psi or phi, and the overlap is large, so 1 minus a small finite epsilon, then there is a minimum number of queries required to separate them. This is from the Hellstrom bound. And the number of queries uh, goes like 1 over epsilon, so epsilon being small. However, you could construct a PDE where the solutions are encoded with psi and phi. So the solutions start very close together. And if you were able to simulate it, you would see that you could separate the states in a time where the queries were poly uh, or went like one uh, log, one over epsilon. So this means the algorithm cannot be efficiently simulated because the time required to simulate the log one over epsilon would have to be exponential in order to maintain the minimum number of queries in the state discrimination task. Um, so we proved uh, for this, uh, we've constructed a coupled PDE such that r greater than or equal to 1 um, was actually not possible. So in that sense, this algorithm is now worst case tight. So there cannot be a general algorithm which, which uh, parameterizes the region of success and region of failure with r, which has a larger... Uh, which has fewer limitations than these, essentially. Um, obviously, you could find another parameter, not R, where you could potentially find a different region. But as characterized by R, uh, there cannot be a general algorithm which goes beyond this one. Um, we wanted to find a limitation for all PDEs. So rather than finding a worst case, we want to say, what about a set of PDEs for which there are no, um, there's, it's not possible to have a, a efficient quantum algorithm. And so the first place to look um, would be uh, chaos or turbulence, which are complicated nonlinear systems. And you can uh, characterize chaos or turbulence um, by a Lyapunov exponent, which essentially measures the rate of separation between nearby trajectories. So in some chaotic region, these nearby tra trajectories can um, exp exponentially quickly diverge from each other. And so we proved uh, an efficient quantum algorithm is not possible for positive Lyapunov exponents in the case that the solution norms grow sub-exponentially. But if you remember, we required that F1 be negative. Um, so the the fact that the solutions grow sub-exponentially sort of encompasses uh, all of those uh, cases anyway. Um, and then uh, I won't go through the details of this proof, um, but the paper should be on archive on Monday or Tuesday. So um, just to give an example of the type of system which can and cannot be uh, efficiently simulated, we construct this uh, chaotic system. Um, and it has a stable fixed point at UK, but the fixed point can exhibit chaos. So if I play, so, so we have one initial condition, which we see is chaotic. And we have another initial condition which decays smoothly. And so we can now prove that because the Lyapunov exponent for this region is uh, positive, uh, there cannot be an efficient uh, quantum algorithm for this differential equation. And we could say, what about in... Oh, uh, so this is actually just a plot of the Lyapunov exponent. So you can see uh, this 
uh, this is the y-axis is the separation of two uh, points uh, within this region, and uh, the x-axis is time. And you can see that uh, over a period of time, so we have a exponential. So the y-axis is um, logarithmic. We have an exponential separation uh, over several orders of magnitude, which is the um, condition for chaos. So the question now comes to uh, what about this smoothly decaying solution? Well, we have to see, we have to check the R value. And if R were less than one, it would, we would, it would be proven that you could um, efficiently simulate this solution on a quantum computer. But actually, the R value is extremely high, like 40,000. Uh, so you, we can't prove it in that way. But we can numerically suggest that it's possible because the error is bounded for arbitrary time. So if we simulate this, we have a uh, bounded error. Uh, it doesn't really matter how long you carry on for. This, this solution decays so, so smoothly, um, almost uh, like a linear uh, um, solution to a linear differential equation, that you would have an exponential. Um, uh, or uh, let's say you could have a quantum algorithm which was efficient. However, um, as this point suggests, this R might not be a great distinction between whether there can be an efficient um, algorithm or not. So I'll come on to my summary. Um, I guess the key takeaway is that only a very small class of nonlinear PDEs, small, but it could be very important, but only a small class can, be, be a, can efficiently be solved. Um, these require dispositive solutions, uh, low nonlinearity, um, and uh, ne negative Lapinov exponent, um, as we've shown that the positive Lapinov exponent cannot be. But this would only be a necessary condition, not sufficient. So there are plenty, we found plenty of examples with negative Lapinov exponents for which there would not be an uh, efficient quantum algorithm, um, or wouldn't necessarily be. Especially, so this Kalman linearization technique would not work. That's the key point. It would have to be a, um, a different algorithm. And so the question which we sort of brought up at the start, and I'll come back to, is why nonlinear PDEs might not be efficiently solved. Um, well, if uh, this effective linearization breaks down, we have this unbounded error. So the problem is uh, quantum mechanics is linear, and uh, this state discrimination task uh, would be solved too quickly. Uh, some open questions. Um, we could say, um, given that we know some solutions which could be solved, uh, some PDEs which could be solved efficiently, we could say, what, what are they? Um, and uh, are they useful? Um, and if there are stronger bounds on which regimes are possible. So this R turns out not to be a great uh, characterizer of whether you have a efficient um, solution or not, given that we found R greater than one to often be, uh, uh, to be able to be solved uh, efficiently. Um, so we could, there's all of the uh, work on this so far has sort of tended to think about long-term solutions, but you could ask about simulating nonlinear PDEs for a very short time. So simulating something for a short time, often only the linear or some linearization around the solution is important. So you could have a, an advantage just for short times. And, uh, and then this is all, um, so far this is all talked about sort of an exponential advantage in the sense that the best classical algorithms take exponential time. And we're saying that there wouldn't be, so there's not an efficient algorithm uh, classically, and we're saying there's not an efficient algorithm quantumly. But you could have a polynomial advantage within that uh, regime. Uh, and that's, that's everything. Thanks. So questions? Yeah. 
thank you for the talk. It was very interesting to listen to. Um, okay, so then do you think, I'm just asking for your opinion, uh, do you think there would be a good application of quantum computing in terms of um, like drift diffusion equations? I'm asking because, for example, in the semiconductor industry, they're used all around and they take a really long time to solve, even they're just, just uh, normal linear PDEs. Um, so, uh, in the some future down the line, where you have this fault tolerant computer which can do HHL, there are still caveats, right? So, you have to encode this classical data into a quantum computer. Um, and so, I, I don't think it's quite clear yet um, whether you could have advantage, but say you did have it classically encoded, or say you had it quantumly encoded, the classical data, uh, and it's a linear differential equation, um, there should be an advantage. The other problem, though, is that uh, I guess in some ways uh, this fault-tolerant quantum computer in the future will be really good at uh, difficult computations which, have s which don't have too many inputs. I mean, but if you have these huge, huge vectors, to require huge amounts of uh, logical qubits. There's some, some difficulty there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, I, I'll definitely read your paper with interest. Uh, when you mention effective linearization, are you meaning uh, the, the system being effectively linear or are you talking about this Carleman linearization? Because um, uh, essentially, uh, well, you gave the example of burgers, say, and I'm concerned because burgers can have, uh, can have, for instance, finite time blowups. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of, but it is within the, the class you were mentioning of with F1 negative. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit confused about how that, that works. And the other question, if I may, um, obviously, the interesting cases are the cases where you have solitonic behavior uh, because really? you have the diffusive element and then you also have some, some concentrations, you have solitons. And with, uh, short times for solitons would be interesting as well. So any, any hints about both those things? Uh, so for the first question, um, burgers when R is less than one is very, uh, uh, I don't want to say boring, but <laughs> There's, there's no like issues there. So it's only when R is greater than one which you start wondering whether uh, something, um, what breaks down. And so for example, when R is around 44, so much greater than one still, uh, the Kalman linearization still has bounded error for arbitrary time. But of course you can push the parameters in burgers until that's not the case. But there is no proof, I mean, there is no uh, justification for using this algorithm in that case because it's outside this regime. Um, and the second, uh, sorry, Tony, uh, I'm not sure actually what, uh, I mean, this is about short time. Short time for Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if the, um, I mean, if if you if you want to solve an equation which, on paper, the linearized form of it will give you some some insight into the problem, then sure. But if you want to solve something where that linearized form won't give you any insight, then you don't have insight. So, I think um, it becomes like a general heuristic, I guess, for whether or not there would be an application there. Okay. Uh, first, thanks for your talk. I, one question I have to ask is, have you considered instead of uh, linearize your partial differential equations to use copies? Because I remember that there is an article that when they use uh, they take the nonlinearity of the, for example, the Navier-Stokes equation, 
and depending on which the order of the nonlinearity that you want to keep is how many copies you you can you need for for that yeah so it's um it's a similar approach to the uh, I, I mean okay I'll, I'll answer it on its own the number of copies that re would be required would grow exponentially so the point is if if you had like a let's say um I have row, some row, and I want to apply a nonlinear transformation to that row in a circuit. I can't do it with just row. So let's say I have two copies of row. I apply one nonlinear transformation, and I get out one useful uh, output state, which is the nonlinear transformation of row. So I have one row prime for two rows coming in. But now, if I want to do something to this row prime, so another nonlinear transformation, I need two row primes. So I need four initial rows. And that, that scaling, I mean, that's uh, unavoidable because each element in that circuit is uh, linear. Okay, next question. Um, I, the, the proof of the, um, of the um, uh, efficiency, so with the, the state discrimination, um, you are using uh, the fact that you can construct a PDE uh, that can separate it in polylog in one over epsilon. Uh, my question is, can you give an, 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 an uh, intuition of how to construct it? Um, uh, so, well, we only had to construct one. Uh, but So the intuition was you need, a tr um, let's say you have a, a couple differential equation where there's, there needs to be a transition uh, or say uh, where one part will end up blowing up. In fact, it will blow up for a little bit and then uh, find a steady state. And the other, the other part will say be flat or, uh, or decay a little bit. Uh, and the way that you get that uh, kind of blow up is when the solution has this uh, changes from having an exponent with positive or negative, uh, well, positive or negative exponent. Um, why, I, I mean, if, if you let R be anything, it's quite easy to find. The difficulty was making it for R is greater than one. Um, I can just write down the equation for you and we can talk about it. But I don't think I have a great intuition for why, uh, or right now, why, why it worked. And, uh, the last question, very, very simple. Uh, in the case, so you are, um, so you, your work, uh, not only your work, but it's about um, uh, when you can truncate um, the Kalman linearization uh, and keeping this error control, under control. But and then apply uh, HHL. But in order for HHL to work, they have to fulfill another condition. Uh, this uh, is, is they are already implicit in somehow uh, in your result that you can apply afterwards and it's going to work. HHL. Yeah. So the complexity will include uh, HHL's uh, criteria as well. But I think uh, um, so. Some conditions are. Uh, satisfied quite easily. Because of this common linearization technique, the matrices are sparse. Um, and uh, the effect on condition number, I can't remember, but it does appear in the complexity in probably a similar way to HHL. So I, I think you can't, uh, yeah, you can't avoid these, that complexity as well. It, it doesn't naturally, um, it's not naturally so satisfied, I think. Okay, so we thank speaker again.
So thanks a lot for coming back for this last presentational session, but of course we should not forget about the poster session later on. And actually it's a, it's a very nice occasion that uh, I can introduce Jonas Fuxa here because uh, he's from Freie Universität Berlin uh, from the group of Jens Eisert and I went there after Bilbao. So it's a, it's a very much, uh, pr uh, it's a nice occasion and uh, you will talk about uh, precise Hamiltonian identification. Thanks a lot. All right, uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction and also for inviting me to speak here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. So I'm in Ashuksa, I'm, in, uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, group of Jens Eisert at the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, and this is a work on Hamiltonian learning in the quantum uh, analog regime. So it's a joint work with these wonderful people. Uh, Dominic and Ingo are former PhD students of Jens, uh, now in uh, Maryland and Abu Dhabi, respectively. And it's a joint work also with Google uh, AI, represented here by Pedram, who took all the experimental data that we'll be presenting. OK. so. Uh, Let's first talk about the setting in which we are talking. So we're trying to learn Hamiltonians in the analog regime. And in this regime, we assume that we have a quantum device uh, which has some natural Hamiltonian that maybe we can influence by some uh, physical parameters. And maybe we have some idea of what it is, but um, we don't know exactly. And it has n qubits. And OK. So for us, a Hamiltonian learning algorithm has two main parts. First part is the quantum part, and then there is a classical post-processing part. In the quantum part, what we want to devise are three things. We want to get a set of uh, initial states, a set of evolution times, and a set of measurements of observables. Oh my god. Right. And that gives us data that are labeled by indices um, that label elements of each of these sets. Uh, so it's like a time series of matrices. And then, given this data, uh, we want to devise a classical post-processing uh, task that learns H from some ansatz class, uh, given this data. So that's the setting. It's not the most general setting, I guess, but uh, for us, this is what, what we mean by uh, Hamiltonian learning in the analog regime. Right. So why is this a useful setting? So imagine that you have uh, some quantum device, such as this, this chip, uh, the Google Sycamore chip. Oh, yep, uh, the Google Sycamore chip. And you want to design this chip. So if you want to design uh, this chip to use something useful, like uh, do impl uh, implement some gates and stuff like that, you want to understand very well how this chip works and what it's actually doing. So there is some natural Hamiltonian of this chip that comes from the physics of uh, the things that you're actually using to build it. So in this case, superconducting uh, circuits. And you, wanna, you have some physical parameters that uh, control the natural Hamiltonian. And you, want, you may want to know how exactly your experimental parameters control uh, this natural Hamiltonian so that you can do uh, things like implement high fidelity gates and do useful stuff. Um, and the second thing why you, uh, learning Hamiltonian can be useful is if you want to use this chip to do something practical, like quantum simulation. This is maybe like more long-term uh, goal. The first goal is very like current and very um, um, like important right now, but maybe quantum simulation is a bit further off. Uh, but there, uh, Hamiltonian le learning is crucial because you want to see how close your actual implemented Hamiltonian is to the one that you want to implement. And maybe you want to have a way to mitigate errors, like for example, um, your Hamiltonian can have some sp state preparation and measurement errors, and uh, methods like Hamiltonian learning uh, that we devised can give you some way of correcting for those in your results. Right. So in this project, we're focusing on a, a particular de device, which is the Google Sycamore chip. So this chip is a superconducting chip consisting of a 2D array of transmon qubits that are coupled in a square lattice via tunable couplers. And the natural Hamiltonian of such a system is this um, spinless Bose-Hubbard, where we have an unharmonic oscillator that comes from the transmon uh, qubit, and then this coupling part. Uh, this Hamiltonian comes from the rotating wave approximation, and um, 
It's not exact, but in the transmon regime, this is pretty close to what's actually happening. So this is our physically motivated ansatz uh, for what, what is actually implemented on the chip. And uh, now we want to devise a Hamiltonian learning algorithm in a sense that, that I just mentioned on the previous slides that has some requirements. So first of all, we would like to identify the, uh, the parameters of this Hamiltonian precisely. So we want to learn mu, eta, and j. Uh, we want our method to be realizable on the Google chip, uh, Sycamore chip right now so that we can send it to Fedham and uh, he can do the experiments and then we can actually learn the Hamiltonian right now. Uh, furthermore, we want this method to be scalable so that maybe we can learn the whole chip at once or at least large chunks of it. So that's another requirement. And finally, we want the method to be robust against noise and sources of errors that are relevant in this setting. And in particular, in this setting, what, what is extremely important are the state preparation and measurement errors. So these are errors that come from the initial part, initializing the initial state, and then from the measurement that cannot be implemented exactly. And those uh, turn out to be the main sources of error in these types of systems. And uh, this set of requirements leads to kind of a unique space for this project, because there are many Hamiltonian learning algorithms that all do slightly different things. But these three requirements in particular, scalability, spam robustness, and practicality, uh, they kind of give rise to at least somewhat uh, unique environment. There are some other works that tackle this, but um, none in the way that we do, at least to our knowledge. So uh, maybe to, to like give some perspective, let's uh, mention some other well-known uh, techniques of Hamiltonian learning and see how they're different. So there is this gold standard technique uh, called process tomography that's trying to learn the full Hamiltonian uh, matrix, uh, which is a process uh, that's inherently non-scalable because, of course, the Hamiltonian uh, is exponentially large in the system size. Then with the spam robustness, uh, there's a whole host of techniques uh, that I call the short time methods that require a very short time evolution and then uh, expansion of the um, evolution matrix uh, due to the uh, short, short, short time. But those are inherently non, not spam robust because your state preparation and measurement errors, if those are important, if you only evolve for a short time, they will completely swamp anything that you have in your signal. So for this particular application uh, for a superconducting circuit, right now those are not very practical. And then uh, we want it to be like NISC friendly, so we don't want to use any thermal states or eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and we also don't want to use fault tolerant quantum computation. Right. So uh, the main idea behind our method is this observation that the spinless Bose Hubbard is particle number preserving, so we can write it um, in this block diagonal form. And then the idea is that we would like to learn these blocks hierarchically, start in the uh, zero and one particle sectors, and then go beyond these and learn the interactions as well. Uh, and if the expansion and the approximation that I uh, had on the previous slide is exact, then actually this procedure terminates in the two particle sector. So, uh, okay. So that's the idea. And in this talk, I will talk about the first part of this procedure, uh, which is learning the one and zero particle sectors. Uh, we have some uh, ideas for learning the, the, the interactions as well, but those we haven't pursued yet, or the project is not finished yet. Right, but, but the main point is that we want to uh, satisfy the requirements that I mentioned previously. Okay, so because we are only learning uh, the Hamiltonian parameters in this uh, zero and one particle sectors, we get an effective Hamiltonian, uh, which doesn't have the interaction term. So even though we are learning parameters of the of the actual Hamiltonian, of the full Hamiltonian, uh, J and mu, uh, we effectively only observe the non-interactive Bose-Hubbard if we are in this sector. So that's an important point, that we are learning the, the parameters of the full Bose-Hubbard that we can then use in our subsequent uh, learning of the interactions as well. We, like We now have good knowledge about the system. Um, but it's effectively free, so it's much easier to work with. Right. So. Remember that this was our picture for the quantum part um, of the Hamiltonian learning procedure. So let's now walk through uh, each of these three uh, key components. So the first component is the initial states. So we prepare these states that are equal superposition of the vacuum state and of a single uh, excited state, which is on um, all of the sites. Then we evolve for these equally separated times. And 
importantly, we uh, like the, the this L uh, times T is uh, quite a long time evolution for the given parameters in the in the um, in the problem. So that means we we're not in this short term uh, short time regime. We're in this long time regime where the full uh, dynamics uh, is uh, visible. And what we measure is the expectation value of the lowering operator. So this, of course, is not a Hermitian operator, but we can measure its Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part, and then combine those expectation values to obtain this. And this gives rise uh, to data that are labeled by the initial state, by the observer, uh, observer, observed um, expectation value, and also the time. So it's, again, this matrix time series. And because we're in this effectively free regime, we can evaluate it exactly, and we expect uh, the evolution to depend um, as this matrix exponential on H, which is the parameter matrix of the on-site potentials and the hoppings. So it's a one-banded uh, matrix. Right. So let's now walk through the experimental details of this procedure. So how to actually do this thing? Uh, let's go to the low-level uh, setting. So uh, the, the, uh, on the chip, we choose a batch of qubits. In this example, we choose three qubits. Uh, that are connected by these couplers, and all of these components have their idling frequency. That's, that's their natural frequency on which they are um, when we don't have uh, anything going on on the chip. And then uh, we apply the pi by 2 pulse to one of these qubits to create our excitation. That actually exactly implements our uh, required initial state. Then we ramp up the parameters of these qubits to their target value. Uh, because we have some bo uh, free Bose Hubbard that we want that we want to implement, we have some target Hamiltonian. Then we let it evolve for the given time. Then we ramp down again, and then we measure the x y uh, Pauli, um, which is equivalent to the um, uh, to the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part of the lowering operator in the qubit uh, picture. Because we are working with single particle states, so thinking of that as qubits is uh, precise. Okay, so we also work in the rotating frame uh, of the qubits, and the rendezvous frequency is 6.5 gigahertz. That will be a sort of important later. And the Hamiltonians that we implement are of the order of 10 megahertz. So th there is an important difference uh, in the scale here. Okay. So now let's talk about the spam errors that appear. So the problematic part, so this ho whole thing is very uh, simple and very nice and very easy, <laughs> but the problematic parts are this these rampings. So those are uh, two periods where we have very limited, con limited experimental control. So the experimenters can sort of um, set the time scale for these rampings, but what exactly happens is quite hard to predict, and the frequencies can oscillate quite wildly. So th th this is, this is, these are two periods over which we have very little control. So that means that our model uh, from before is not very accurate. And we need to, we need to uh, consider this more robust model that includes these spam, uh, spam errors. And the way we represent them is via two matrices that we assume are invertible, because if they weren't invertible, we're essentially lost. Um, but these matrices represent the initial, S uh, represents the state preparation error, and M represents the measurement error at the end. And um, the only thing that we are assuming by writing down this model is that during these ramping phases, we don't exit the one and zero particle sectors. So that's an important assumption, but it turns out that it's a good one. Like we can check it uh, from our data, and uh, it turns out that it's a good assumption. And now let's uh, talk about the second part. So that, that's the classical post-processing part. Now we have this um, time series of um, matrices, and we want to identify the uh, coefficient matrix of the Hamiltonian given this data. So we assume this, this, uh, the, the, the spam model, and we want to learn this symmetric H parameter matrix of the free part of the Hamiltonian. Right. So because it's a symmetric matrix, uh, we can write it in its eigen decomposition like this, and that's um, like the key insight of our method. So the zeroth step of our classical post-processing is to remove the initial map. Uh, second, we learn the eigenvalues. Uh, third, we reconstruct the eigenspaces of H, and then we mitigate part of the systematic error coming from the final map. And finally, we can uh, give full tomographic estimate of the initial map, S. 
right? And now let's go through each of these steps in more detail. So uh, the way we remove the initial map from the data is the following. So we take the full time series and we multiply it by the pseudo inverse of one of these entries. And what that, hap uh, what that does is that it gives us a new time series that actually doesn't depend on S at all. Uh, notice that here it's important that both M and S are uh, invertible, otherwise this wouldn't be true. And um, of course there is noise present in this matrix, uh, in this matrix so it's not wise to uh, over-represent that matrix in our data, so that's why we concatenate many of these time series for different choices of K0. And that gives us this Y dot S, uh, which is now the time series that has uh, the initial ramp removed. Okay, so the second part of the procedure uh, learns the eigenvalues of this H. And you may say that that's very easy, it's just a Fourier problem. Uh, however, uh, Fourier analysis of this matrix time, seri time series is not a good idea. First of all, we have the Shannon sampling theorem, so that limits our uh, accuracy. And second of all, we have um, actually n by n uh, time series here, because it's a matrix uh, time series. So we would have to then um, extract the frequencies from each of these time series and then somehow combine them. And if these frequencies are close together, it's very hard to, to do that and very hard to identify which correspond to which. So that's not the best idea. So instead, we uh, developed this um, brand new algorithm that we call Tensor Esprit, uh, which solves the following problem. So if we have a matrix A and we have, have its time series given by this equation, uh, it extracts the eigenvalues of A with the only requirement that C and D are invertible. So the, the, the spectrum of A can be degenerate, it can be, um, it can be a matrix that's even non-diagonalizable, it will always work. And it has some other key properties, so it's super resolving in a sense that it can handle degenerate spectra, so in this sense it's like infinite super resolution, but it, that's I guess not the best way to think about it, <laughs> and it's overselling a bit, <laughs> but, uh, but it's kind of true. And it's also a denoising algorithm, so it's uh, robust against incoherent noise entering the time series. It's also fully spam robust, which manifests itself in the fact that the C and D matrices only need to be invertible, but it's completely robust against their presence. And um, the reason why I call it Esprit and, uh, is that we base it on this Esprit algorithm, which is an algorithm from signal processing uh, that's also a super resolving algorithm that's used to find directions of arrival of electromagnetic signals on antenna arrays. So it's, yeah. Uh, and the tools that Tensor Esprit is using is uh, this thing that we call the Hankel Tensor, and it's SVD denoising, like rank reduction of this tensor, and also the pseudo inverse. Okay, um, and it's actually an algorithm that we will write a paper on later on. Uh, and if you have interesting uh, use cases for uh, this kind of thing, we would definitely be interested because we're still looking for more um, use cases. This is a very specific example. But uh, in our case, it gives us very good estimates of uh, lambda. Okay, so given this estimate of the eigenvalues, we now turn to uh, reconstruct the eigenspaces. And to do that, we formulate the problem as a least squares problem over the orthogonal group. It's not very important what, we do, what these uh, capital Y, A, and Pi are, uh, but it's just a simple um, reshaping of these different objects uh, to get this problem into this form of the least squares um, optimization over the orthogonal group. Uh, and if we do that, in the case when M is the identity, we do recover the eigenvector, eigenvectors of H as columns of the, uh, of the resultant orthogonal matrix. Um, and to solve this problem, we use conjugate gradient descent over the orthogonal group, and we can also impose the connectivity of the chip by including a regularization term. But that is a bit of a problematic step because it makes the optimization landscape much more rugged and it can lead to unstable optimization, but it is more accurate in many cases. So it's, it's a good idea to do that. And that gives us estimates of the eigenvectors, which in turn gives us an estimate of H. But you may now ask what happens if M is non, not the identity, which is of course what is actually happening in uh, real life. So that's uh, the most painful part <laughs> of this project. And so let's investigate what happens for non-trivial M. So remember that this is our effective Hamiltonian, it's the hopping Bose Hubbard, and uh, this is the H matrix that it gives like, rise to. It has this one-banded uh, structure. Okay, so 
As I mentioned before, the rendezvous frequency of the qubits is of the order of six uh, gig, uh, gigahertz. However, the, f the, the uh, Hamiltonians that we're implementing are only about 10 megahertz. And that means that the on-diagonal uh, qubits, the qubits, have much further to go during their ramping phases than the couplings. The couplings only need to um, ramp up to these like 20 megahertz, say, but these qubits, they really have to go um, a distance of the order of a gigahertz. So that means that the off-diagonal terms will essentially immediately ramp to their target values, but the on-diagonal terms are the problematic ones. And that means that M will be a nearly diagonal matrix. And furthermore, we assume it uh, to be we expect it to be almost a uh, unitary matrix, which means that this is a good um, assumption for this map. And given this assumption, we can actually uh, derive what, what its effect will be on the resulting uh, estimate of the H matrix, and it's this modulation of the off-diagonal terms by the cosine of the differences of these phases. All right. Okay, so this is just repeating what I just said. So if, if we assume this, uh, that's the result. And now, uh, that allows us uh, to mitigate part of the systematic error. So, so suppose that we have a good estimate of the uh, Hamiltonian that's actually implemented. And that's, in our case, we do have that because the experimentalists have a target that they're trying to simulate, and we are trying to benchmark whether they actually hit the target. And we are assuming that they don't miss this target completely by, by a whole sign. So that means that we have a good estimate H0, and uh, assuming that they're uh, not missing it completely, we can remove the sign part of the systematic error by the following problem. So we, we find a matrix, ma uh, matrix D, which is just a diagonal orthogonal matrix, which means that it's a matrix with plus minus ones on the diagonal. And we find a matrix uh, D hat M, such that the uh, error with respect to the expected matrix with the, with the assumption, uh, or with the estimate, uh, is minimized. And if we do that, we can mitigate the sign, sign part of the systematic error. Okay, okay, right. Okay, and finally, given th that uh, these things, we can estimate uh, the initial map. And to do that, we just use this formula. Okay. All right, so the, um, now we have removed the sign part of the systematic error, but there is still the remaining part of the systematic error. And we need to evaluate it in order for our method to be useful, because we need uh, to know how accurate it is. And to do that, we need a model of the final ramp. And the simplest thing we can think of is a linear ramping model, where each of the uh, elements is ramped with the same speed v uh, to the target value. And th there is actually some evidence that this is uh, nearly what's happening. Because if we plot, uh, so the, the, the on the x-axis we have different uh, Hamiltonians with varying uh, ramp distances, and this is the, dis the, the deviation of the initial map estimate from the identity. And we see that it follows the similar trend. So that kind of shows us that the linear uh, model is kind of what's happening. And uh, that leaves us uh, with a free parameter, the ramping speed. And the ramping speed uh, we find from implementing a zero Hamiltonian. So we ramp each qubit to the rendezvous frequency, and then um, uh, because it's diagonal uh, Hamiltonian, that means that these S and M commute with the Hamiltonian, and we can bring them here. And that means that our S hat estimate gives us the phase accumulated during the phasing periods. And that gives us uh, a way of extracting it from the data. So we choose five qubit batches on which we impl implement the zero Hamiltonian. And it turns out there is a different scaling behavior for qubits with have, which have the maximum ramping distance and the rest of the qubits. So that's, that gives us two ways of extract, extracting the speeds. And miraculously, it actually gives us a consistent speed of 710 megahertz per nanosecond. And that further uh, builds trust in our method, in, uh, in the model. Okay, so let's now talk through the results. So we implement the Hofstad butterfly um, Hamiltonian, which has this pseudo-random uh, on-site potential and uh, constant hopping. And you can see that the, that the frequencies, which are these yellow dots, are implemented down to um, half, half a megahertz. And the full Hamiltonian is uh, recovered down to about two megahertz. Um, and we also can draw these nice uh, maps of how, how well the, qubit is, um, the, the chip is doing. So this is the Hamiltonian deviation. It's, it's an average over different five qubit batches. And this is the difference of the uh, initial map estimate from the identity. OK, so let's see how we did. So we identified mu and h to megahertz precision. So I give us a yellow check mark for the first part. Of course, eta is still missing. 
Um, it, we actually did implement this on real hardware, so it's experimentally realized. Uh, we experimentally go all, uh, just to 12 qubits, but that's mostly due to political reasons. Uh, numerically, we can go all the way to 100. <laughs> and uh, it is uh, state preparation or measurement robust, because, and we can actually give full tomographic estimate of either the state probation or the measurement map, uh, but we also have a, s a systematic error estimate for the remaining error. So I also give us a yellow check mark. <laughs> and uh, there are some key lessons that we learned during this project. First of all, implementing ev even a very simple Hamiltonian learning protocol, like the quantum part is ex extremely simple, it still was a very non-trivial data processing task. So the data processing work on this project has been very difficult, even though it was so simple. Uh, furthermore, it required uh, very good communication between the theorists and the experimentalists, which we kind of heard the hard way. And uh, it required the theorists to really understand uh, what's happening physically during the experiment. We also learned some lessons about the uh, Sycamore chip, so it can implement the bose hubbard quite accurately, uh, very well, but the spammer bus, uh, spammers are really the main limitation of this. And with that, I would like to thank you and refer you to this uh, work um, by my collaborators that we are currently expanding, and hopefully you'll see it uh, in the near future. So that's all. Thanks a lot for this great talk. So are there any questions? Yes. Um, I have a couple of dumb questions. So first of all, why is this ramping up st step necessary? Like, I, I mean, naively, why can't you just excite when the chip is already like in the working stage or I don't know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's a <laughs> very good question. Uh, that's quite hard to answer for me. <laughs> so I'm on the theory side, so this is not uh, my area. But from what I understand, uh, the the uh, control that we have over the qubits when they are ramped to other than the natural frequency is very small, and then the errors would be even larger on the state preparation uh, thing. So we really have to do it in these regimes, because so the point is that here we are not really benchmarking the natural Hamiltonian. We are benchmarking a Hamiltonian that we wanted to implement. That's just close to the natural Hamiltonian. It has the same form. It has the same functional form. Um, but right, so 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 the qubits are uh, when they are ramped to these to these um, other values, they're not in their natural state. So that's why we can't really control them. I guess that's the best answer I can give. But there there's probably a lot of experimental details that I'm omitting here. And the other thing is, I saw this precisely this ramping up is the thing you you worry the most. So I in this case, incoherence is not like the times are short enough, or how th does it work? Yeah, so uh, superconducting qubits are actually very good on the coherence front, but it's uh, exactly state preparation measurement errors that are the dominant source of errors for, for these kinds of things. So uh, coherence, um, so actually, so in the spam model that we're assuming, this one, uh, because we're assuming that M and S don't have to be unitary, that means that we can also lose signal. So that's, that's like, um, even though we're working with pure state, sort of, we're um, like following the the highest Schmidt rank state all the time. So even if there is some loss of, of coherence uh, during our experiment, we would just um, uh, follow the dominant subspace. And yeah, so, so then that's kind of... Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions? So actually connected to your questions about these ramping up stages, I mean, the fact that you made S and M such that uh, they don't excite anything in the in the two particles that are only in the zero and one. It's sort of like I mean it's not the same thing. It's consistent with you know this heuristic uh, state preparation and uh, <coughs> and the uh, measurement uh, models that I mean. Uh, for example, the fact that if you excite a state like look you look you look at the one state, then it's much bigger probability that it was the zero than if you have zero and then you get the one, right? It's mm -hmm. a li little bit related to this type of question, isn't mm -hmm. it? Right. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at those heuristic um, models which treat these uh, state preparation and, uh, and measurement errors, you see these type of uh, arguments. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I suppose. I th yeah, I don't know much about those, so I'm not sure if I can give a good answer. But I guess, so like one thing I can say maybe is mm -hmm. that we can really check whether this is the case or not by taking the trace of the data and then we can see how much signal we lose. Right, right, right. So that's and, one and of the things. And the fact that you take M to be diagonal, like mm -hmm. a diagonal unitary, mm -hmm. uh, is I guess also consistent with, with the fact, well I'm not sure not how consistent it is, but it's sort of like that there are no measurement crosstalk errors yes. in some way. Right. Exactly. So I that seems like the um, biggest approximation that we're making uh -huh. in our procedure, and also it's the biggest source of systematic errors. So uh -huh. this is a very crucial thing that we are actually still trying to figure, figure out. It's one of the reasons why the paper is still not out. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, there's one thing to say. So if we write down this model, uh, there is some redundancy, there is gauge freedom in this model. So uh, you can imagine inserting sure. either um, orthogonal matrix here and here and here that just like effectively changes the basis of the Hamiltonian and it changes an MNS. And you can also insert any in, uh, matrix that is diagonal in the eigenbasis of H, so it commutes with H and it's inverse here. And using this gauge freedom, even though this is quite a strong assumption, we can remove part of this assumption by absorbing all these things to the S. And because we get a tomographic estimate of S, uh, right, and uh, we actually get rid of those. Uh, so that's one thing. And another thing is that um, there could be some smart things to do um, that would, uh, so we have some ideas on uh, actually doing tomography also of M, because like do, using just this method, there's always this gauge freedom that you have and you just can never go past that. And you don't care about MNS, you really care about the H, right? So that's, that's a bit of a problem of this approach, but maybe we could insert some other experiments in the middle that would tell us something about these maps and then we could use that information from these other experiments to get a better uh, estimate and to even get MNS, uh, like estimate of... Like estimate remove of the both. gauge freedom? Exactly, yeah. kind of, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and like part of that is maybe like the regularization that we're doing, uh, Im imposing the one uh, the the one banded uh, structure of H. That's one of the things that removes part of the gauge freedom. But but there are also other methods that we have in mind. So like the the thing about this project is it, it's it's uh, running for a long time, and uh, the experiments have been taken quite a long time ago. So we're kind of adapting the post processing to the experiments that have already be do been done, and also to what has already been done before. So uh, we have some new ideas, but we would need new data, and that's always a bit of a problem. So th th there is a lot that can be done with this project still, um, and it hopefully will be done in the future. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and except if there is some very important and urgent question that somebody wants to ask, which I'm not seeing, then we move on. Thanks a lot again. Obviously, no got her PhD yes or defended her PhD yesterday. So we are looking forward to this. Uh, the first you. talk after as a doctor. Yes, yes, it is. I tried to escape so many times with different excuses, but apparently I cannot run away from the workshop. So yes. Um, yes, they pulled me back in. So. <laughs> So hello everyone, my name is Ana Martin and I am a former PhD student <laughs> <laughs> at the University of the Basque Country and now I am a proper unemployed doctor. So <laughs> thanks all for being here with me. Um, so I am going to let you know my work uh, on the topic of digital analog quantum computing and algorithm. This talk was prepared for having a duration of 
an hour long, so maybe I appreciate if you tell me more or less how many time I have left or something like that. I try to make this enjoyable, but short. <laughs> so, okay, it's there, it's true. So I am going to start uh, by motivating a little bit the topic of digital analog quantum computing. Half of the people here already know what this is about because they have heard my rehearsal several times, but for those that haven't been in this talk yet, I will motivate the subject and I will explain briefly what digital analog quantum computing is. And then once I have convinced you that this is a nice idea, I will show you how we can use this technique to make Hamiltonian simulations, which in the end translates to uh, uh, algorithm implementations. Then we are, I am going to show you how we can use the work uh, that have been previously done on digital analog simulations to make uh, algorithm implementation. And depending on the time, I will show you different algorithm. I will try to show you Fourier transform, phase estimation, and maybe HHL, one of the best known here today. And then I, will, uh, I want to show you the impact that this digital analog quantum computation paradigm has had among different scientific, different researchers group. So outside our frontiers in our offices, and I think it's, it's really interesting the work that have been developed on this field. Okay, so first of, first of all, I will be repeating this word a lot, computational paradigm, paradigm, paradigm. So what I, am, what I mean by this is that I am just referring to the criteria that is behind the implementation of a certain quantum algorithm. So attending, at the, attending to the building blocks that we are using to create entanglement, superposition, or, or change the state of the qubits, I will be referring to digital quantum computation or digital analog quantum computation. The most extended paradigm is the digital quantum computation one, which uses single qubit gates to change the state of a qubit, and two qubit gates to create entanglement and superposition. And now we live in this uh, NISC era in which our devices are not uh, fully error corrected. So we are facing, so digital computational paradigm face uh, a sensible uh, ex uh, experimental noise. And this noise is mainly due to the two qubit uh, implementation, to the two qubit, two qubit gate implementations. I don't think that you can see this, but this is a picture I took from one of the IBM quantum processors, and here we can see that the error rate of the single qubit gates are um, several order of magnitude uh, smaller than the error rate that the two qubit gates present, and that means that these two qubit gates are a really important source of noises when we are trying to implement. Okay. Oh no, too far. Okay, thanks. Well, we are trying to implement long depth quantum circuit. And this happens because uh, the error that this two, the implementation of these two qubit gates um, arise, this is an error that it's accumulative. So along the entire process, the more two qubit gates that we have, the, the bigger the error is going to be and that translates directly in, an, in a decrease of the fidelity that we are going to expect. For example, this is an n qubit implementation of a quantum Fourier transform, and we can see that the amount of two qubit gates is uh, um, it's really big, so this represents a problem when we want to implement a useful algorithm that has a depth that is noticeable. And why this two qubit error noises uh, are appearing, well, if we, think, if we think of our quantum processor as a quantum system, which is what it, what it is, and the qubits that compose it it's, uh, are the, quant the particles that are in the system, there is always going to be an inherent interaction among the particles of this system in which the, the, the qubits are going to interact. And when we apply a two qubit gates, what, we're what we are doing is to keep the interaction among the two qubit gates involved um, switch on while trying to attenuate as possible the interaction that it has with the rest of the qubits of the system. And if this attenuation is not well performed, that translates into the experimental errors that we can see accumulating during the entire process. There are quantum control techniques that, of course, can diminish these two qubit gates error rate, but these techniques are not scalable, and when we, want, and when we are dealing with a big quantum system, we face the same experimental constraint. So the idea is that we are in a technology in which we are facing experimental errors, no matter how, 
So uh, we, the question that we want to answer is, which paradigm can offer me a better performance for my algorithms? It seems that in, for the digital quantum computational paradigm, my goal would be either to improve the implementation of the two qubit gates or, as we do with many things in life, avoid them. <laughs> so let's go back to the picture of the uh, quantum processor as a quantum system. And a way to avoid these two qubit gates is to use as the entangling block the interaction that is going to appear no matter what between the qubits of the system. And that is the idea uh, behind digital analog quantum computing. So the AQC takes advantage of the natural interaction that is appearing <laughs> in, in between the, the qubits of the system. And as building blocks for quantum algorithm implementation, it uses single qubit gates applied, by, applied on single qubits by digital pulses. <laughs> An analog block of controllable evolution of controllable in time evolution of the of the system under the, in, the interaction Hamiltonian. So in a nutshell, the AQC is a universal quantum computational paradigm that merges both the flexibility of digital quantum computation with the robustness of analog simulations. So now we can go into details on how to use this paradigm to make uh, Hamiltonian simulations. And to do this, we are going to use two key ingredients. So we are going to use first the ability of evolving according to the natural interaction Hamiltonian during a certain time, t. And we know that by incorporating local rotations on the qubits, we can create an evolved Hamiltonian in the, in the form that I am showing, the H prime. Also, whenever we want to simulate a Hamiltonian with non-commuting term, terms, we are going to use Trotter decomposition which introduced an error of, uh, order, of, yeah, of order square in time, but by using advanced decomposition, a symmetrized Schroeder decomposition, we can decrease this error. I think that the best way to see how these uh, techniques work is by using an example. And for that, I'm going to show you a simple example that it's representative on how, of how these techniques work, but it's easy enough so we can follow all the calculations and do it in an appropriate amount of time. So we're going to simulate an inhomogeneous all-to-all two body eyes in Hamiltonian. As, and as resources, we are going to use single qubit gates, which will be rotations around the x-axis, and uh, the evolution under the uh, interaction Hamiltonian, which we are going to use our homogeneous eyes in Hamiltonian. The single qubit gates will constitute the digital blocks, and the evolution under the interaction Hamiltonian will be the analog blocks. Of course, uh, quantum processors present different um, Hamiltonians for the different interaction that appears, but we are going to use these ones just uh, for pedagogical reasons. So once again, the goal is to, sim to simulate an inhomogeneous all-to-all two-body eyes in Hamiltonian that looks that way. And for this example, this particular example, we are going to use a quantum processor built by three qubits with homogeneous coupling constant. So the Hamiltonian that represents the system is this one. Set set interaction among qubits one, two, uh, two, three, and one, three. Okay, the way we are going to proceed is the following. We will apply single qubit rotations on the qubit one and two. Then we are going to turn on the interaction among the qubits of the system and let the system evolve during a certain time. T1. We are going to turn off that interaction, and once again, we will apply single qubit rotations on, sing on qubits one and two. And what I am doing by sandwiching this, sandwiching this analog evolution between single qubit rotations is changing the, <laughs> changing the terms of the system Hamiltonian. So if I perform similar operation but applying single qubit rotations on qubit one and three, or on qubits two and three, you can see that in front of every two qubit game, uh, two qubit terms, I, well, there was appearing an interaction at um, a constant that was multiplying each uh, two two body term. So if I put together the three the three operations, the local, the complete unitary evolution of of this operation is this one. So I get, I get to simulate this Hamiltonian, and you can see now the linear combination that is appearing in every two-body term. Since the goal, the Hamiltonian that we wanted 
to simulate was this one, the connection between the one that we achieved and the one that we wanted to simulate is ACC to, ACC to C. So the linear combination that appears in front of every two body terms, which is the, a linear combination of the time of the evolutions under the analog Hamiltonian, directly relates to the inhomogeneous coupling constant of the, of the Hamiltonian that we wanted to simulate. So in the end, the entire problem reduces to find an appropriate map between the simulation time multiplied by the inhomogeneous coupling constant that we want to sim of the Hamiltonian that we want to simulate and the coupling constant of our quantum processor multiplied by the time of each analog block. And we achieve this map by slicing the, the evolution under the resource Hamiltonian into odd of order n square analog blocks of different durations sandwiched by local rotations. In this case, uh, um, rotations around the x-axis. N refers to the number of qubits. I think that I didn't mention it. And in the end, uh, the finding the duration of the analog blocks, this vector t, is just a matrix inversion problem in which the matrix M is a signed matrix of, of dimension N by N. And this is a non-singular matrix for all N inside the integers, except for four qubits, which that only means that for, four, for the case of four qubits, we need to perform different, different uh, single qubit gates uh, rotations. So we, always, so we can always compute a solution of this problem. As I mentioned, this was just an easy example, but these techniques can be extended to several scenarios. For example, we can also simulate an embodied Hamiltonian. Of course, the rotations are going to be a little bit more elaborate and the procedure will be much longer, but the idea is always the same. Sandwich at the analog evolution by local qubit rotations before and after the interaction. So what I have just described uh, now, uh, in which the interaction is turned on and off between the digital pulses, is what is known as stepwise DQC. And in this case, if we, if we don't face any experimental noise, so if, if we are in a noiseless scenario, the unitary evolution that we achieve by doing this, this operation could be equivalent to the one that we would obtain but uh, if we follow the digital quantum computational paradigm, so nothing would change. In a more realistic scenario, when we are facing some noises, then we would expect to have the same or even worse results than, than the one achieved by the digital paradigm. And this is because turning on and off the interaction between the digital pulses might be also a noisy, a noisy operation. One reason might be that the Turn the, the turn on and off of the interaction is not a square function. It's rather, of course, it has this curve. So the time that you are evolving your system evolve might not be as controllable as we would like to. But there is a solution to that. And the solution is to turn on the interaction at the beginning of the process and keep the interaction on until the very end of it. And that is what it's called bank the AQC. In this case, the single qubit rotation are applied on top of that interaction, and that means that during the time that the single qubit rotation are being applied, we are evolving, we are, yes, we are evolving uh, under the Hamiltonians of both the interaction and the single qubit rotation. So we are introducing a coherent error whenever we when we apply this approach of digital analog quantum computing. This translates into the following. The entire e operation that I am performing uh, with bank DAQC without uh, taking into account the experimental error is never going to be the same as the one that we would achieve by stepwise DAQC or digital quantum computing. But in a more realistic scenario, facing some noises, if the single qubit gates are applied fast enough, so in a time delta t, which is much smaller than the time that the evolution is taking, is taking place, we can apply the sudden appro approximation and we ex expect to have, a, um, and we expect this error to scale much better than the experimental noises that we face using the two qubit gates or uh, when we apply the turn on, on and off of the interaction. And to, in order to test if this indeed happens in the realistic scenario, we've, we did both things. So we proposed quantum algorithms developed by this uh, the AQC paradigm, and also we designed the noise model in which we were, going to, we were going to compare the performance of the algorithms under both paradigms, digital 
and digital analog. We took into account several noise sources that were, um, that were uh, common between both paradigms. Some of them, there are some that are exclusive, and I will go over there in just a moment. So we took into account first single qubit gate error, and we modeled it as, um, um, as some noise in the magnetic field that the single qubit gates is, is, exp uh, is achieving. So we include this variable in the, in the phase of the, of the evolution of the single qubit gate. For the two qubit gates, we include a phase noise um, in order to take into account the unnatural, so to speak, operation that the two qubit gate is. And this, uh, this kind of error only appear when we implement uh, the algorithm using the digital paradigm, of course. And for the digital analog paradigm, the error that will appear in, in, in that case will be the error that the analog block is introducing. So we introduce a noise in the time of the application of the analog blocks that might take into account that this is not a square function and also that, might, that there might be some fluctuations in the entanglement of the system. Common to both paradigms uh, are the bit flip noise that can, the, the bit flip that can appear and, and we use this, we implement these noises by using quantum channel formalism and we include, sorry, a bit flip channel, we include the measurement chan channel and also an amplitude damping channel. So we try to model the, the noise of the quantum processors as accurate as possible as what it's really happening. So with this, we are ready to test our first uh, quantum algorithm. The first one that we proposed was the quantum Fourier transform. And we decided to, uh, to begin with this algorithm because it's a key component of um, several quantum subroutines. So even though this, might, this by itself might not represent an advantage per se, it enables several operations that are interesting to all of us. Oh, can you go one back? Thank you. <laughs> So uh, the, the way to proceed was the following. First, well, the quantum circuit of the quantum Fourier transform is uh, well studied. So uh, our first uh, task was to express the entire operation as a unitary transformation, and then try to study the Hamiltonian of this unitary in terms of digital analog techniques. So we wanted to study if the Hamiltonian um, was easy, so to speak, to implement using these techniques. And we did so, and we find out that the entangling part, the two qubit gates, can be modeled by an inhomogeneous all-to-all-to-body Ising Hamiltonian, which is exactly the same as I used uh, for, as an example in previous slide. So we could uh, make the digital analog implementation of the quantum Fourier transform uh, directly from previous results, and so we did. We quantum Fourier transform, uh, we apply the quantum Fourier transform to a family of state, which is that one, and as a figure of merit, we use the quantum fidelity. Perfect. And uh, let me guide you through the results that we achieved. I'm going to first, uh, I'm going to start by the end. So I'm going to start uh, for the case of six qubits. And I think this is representative because we have seen that the more qubits involved in the quantum Fourier transform, the deeper our, our quantum algorithm is and the worst results are expected. So for the case of six qubits, the the digital quantum computational paradigm achieve this fidelity, <laughs> then the stepwise digital analog achieve the one that is presented there. I, okay, but the best fidelity is achieved by the bank DAQC. So we saw, we see here that indeed our suspicions were right, and the bank DAQC paradigm is much more resilient uh, for noises under a growing number of qubit. This picture repeats for the other cases. For example, for the five qubit case, the best fidelity is once again achieved by the bank DAQC method. And for three qubits, once again, the best fidelity is for the bank DAQC method. So these good results let us think in a, on, on, the use, use of, on the use of the digital analog paradigm to make uh, implementation of algorithms that involve um, more and more steps, and we go a, far, a step further, and we study the quantum phase estimation. I think that I am also almost at the end of my talk, so I just mentioned that we study the implementation of the phase estimation, 
there are a bunch of things that were super interesting, but maybe I can show you in a different place. Yes? But I want to go almost to the end, to the, yes, yes. So, for the phase estimation, I actually, we, we follow a different strategy. And to implement this algorithm, instead of studying the Hamiltonian of the entire, of the entire algorithm, we wanted to, to, to do a more systematic strategy. So what we did was to we wanted to translate each step of the digital implementation into digital analog um, terms. So for that, we first had to decompose the entire algorithm into a universal set of gate, and then the goal was to translate it uh, to digital analog. So we only had to translate the CNOT gate. Of course, this uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't get the optimal digital analog implementation of an algorithm, but it certainly gives us a taste on what to expect as, as a lower bound uh, of, of this digital analog paradigm. And we did this for the quantum phase estimation to a concrete example. And we, what we found out is that, as expected, the bank DIQC protocol, well, I, I don't have time to go to very detailed explanation, so I, I guess that you will have to trust me in a way, or maybe you can ask me more details later. But we saw that the bank DIQC recovers the ideal result that we were expecting, and uh, and kind of uh, gave us better results that, than the digital paradigm. And what is remarkable from these results is that non, uh, the, the suboptimal way to implement the phase estimation under digital analog techniques still is, is, is still able to recover the ideal case. So we, it led us wondering how well the results will be when we tailor the, the algorithm for being an optimal DAQC implementation. As a lot of you might know, if we put together phase estimation, well, if, if we use phase estimation for implementing an algorithm, that algorithm might be the HHL. HHL is a really interesting algorithm. I think it has been widely discussed today. And we also propose a digital analog implementation on this one that I won't be explaining right now because I think that I'm almost out of time. But if you're interested, I, I can show you some results. Also, we propose a complete digital implementation for the, for the algorithm, and I am referring to the middle step, the ancilla quantum encoding, in which you encode in one ancillary qubit the inverse of the eigenvalues of the problem matrix. So just to show you the final result, we begin by proposing as Long, a, a large amount of multi-control multi gates, which of course is unfeasible for current devices, but we try to use uh, previous results from Moton and, and collaborators and decompose it into single and two-qubit gates. And we managed to decompose our exponential number of multi-control gates into a, an exponential number of single-qubit gates and CNOT gates. So the, the first step, which was achieving a complete, total, fully quantum implementation of the HHL, was finally achieved. And then I have a digital analog implementation that maybe I can show you later if you're interested. I mean, you can also show it now. After all, it has to be a qubit No, no. <laughs> no, it's OK. OK. So <laughs> for the digital analog implementation, we change, we yeah, we changed the CNOT gates into control phase gates since its digital analog implementation can be easily, easily studied. So in the end, oh, just one back, okay. So in the end, the, analog, the digital analog version includes exponential number of analog blocks and exponential number of single qubit gates. But this exponent, it, I think it's interesting to know that it depends on the size of the problem matrix A, so it's still it's manageable depending on the example that we are working on. Also regarding the HHL and due to its uh, experimental uh, demanding resources that it faced, we thought on a way of overcome these issues by making a co-design quantum processor in which it, this would be a good solution, especially for the digital uh, implementation. So building the quantum processor tailored for this specific algorithm might result into avoiding uh, the 
the swapping gates that one needs to perform in order to get the connections that one requires. So this is um, a collaborative way uh, work with IQM. This is uh, internationally patent. And regarding the DAQC, as long as, the, as all of the qubits of the system can interact among each other, this quantum processor will work uh, as, as good as, as, as any. And with this, I, 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 I reached the end of my talk, so we can all go to the poster session. But uh, just to make it uh, clear, the digital analog quantum computational paradigm, it's indeed a universal paradigm that can help us in this noise, intermediate scale noisy era that we are living. And I, it, I, it's, a, it's a remarkable alternative to implement long depth quantum circuit using current available uh, technology. If you have more doubts, I can. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, of course. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask, so I know that IQM recently stepped down from analog quantum computing. Is there any other company that like uh, is planning to do this uh, experimentally? Or, and, or, or maybe do you know anything about why they stepped down? Why do you think? I, as far as I know, IQM is interested in this one, in, in making a digital analog quantum computer, but I, I know, I think that's the only one I know. Oh, I, okay, I th okay. Do you have any other privileged knowledge? <laughs> well, yes, it's true, but uh, it, they are not building like, okay. <laughs> the group of Jiang Wei Pan, uh, they use uh, digital analog techniques f uh, as a, well, they perform a, whole uh, quantum operation in a 61 qubit quantum processor. And as part of that operation, they include uh, this. Oh, yes, they include a quantum neural network, uh, whose tag was uh, distinguished the nature between two qubits. And this neural network uh, was a digital analog vari variational quantum circuit. So in superconducting circuits, quantum processor digital analog might still be performed. So no matter if there is no machine yet available, but experimentally, it has been possible to perform these, these tasks. Okay, thanks. Further questions? So I have a question which is very much related to this question. Now you mentioned some companies in, that are uh, working on superconducting devices, but I have a more general question. For which type of uh, architectures would it work, or would it be a very suitable one? For example, for tra would trapped ions be also yes. another, or, or which other? Uh, yes, as long as you have access to the risk, to the Hamiltonian, to the dynamic of the quantum processor that you are using, digital analog is uh, can be performed on desk on on that platform. So of course, ion uh, trap ions. Definitely a nice platform since you can you have single qubit addressing and there is the interaction between the ions that you can more or less control and you know the Hamiltonian. So as long as you have that information, uh, digital analog can be performed. So it's not um, it's not only for superconducting circuits, but it's rather to any other kind of quantum platform. Yes. Further questions. Okay, so thanks a lot <laughs> Thank for, you. for this presentation. <laughs> and uh, before going to the poster section, I mean, I think we should also thank Mikkel for the organization and the full Bilbao team, so thank you. <laughs> it was very nice uh, workshop, thank you. And all the, and everyone, all the speakers. <laughs> okay, uh, so, Poster session. <laughs>